Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So without more to do, the first session is Tim's story. And Tim, I wanted to do a, an announcement, but he tells me he's just an ordinary bog standard guy from London. So without more ado, I'll introduce you to, I won't, he'll introduce himself. So this is Tim from London. It's all yours, Tim. Uh, thanks. My name's Tim, and I'm an alcoholic. The applause may be a little premature. Um, Tim, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've forgotten one little thing. Can, pe- can you just... Test for Pascal. How is the sound at the back? Oh. Say something. <laughs> so can you hear me all right? No. A bit louder. Up. Speak more into the mic. So if I speak like, is that all right? Can you hear me now? Oh, it's... it's... <laughs> I won't make any reference. Hold on. Uh, uh. <laughs> We have micro group. We have an expert here. Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? I hear a slight echo, so this is probably a good thing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to Geneva. Thank you for inviting me here. And I've got a couple of friends with me as well. So I'm not on my own in the city, in the big bad city of Geneva. Um... And well done for getting up on a Saturday morning and coming to this. Um, I'm an alcoholic, and so it's amazing to me that I'm anywhere today, let alone Geneva. I came into AA for the first time in the early 1990s, and most of the people that I met around that time are not anywhere anymore. Uh, So the fact that I'm alive is amazing to me. Uh, and alcoholism in my family those of us who are alcoholics tend to die young my brother was in his 20s when alcoholism killed him I'm in my 40s now so I've got you know a good few years uh, that I by odds I shouldn't have really and they say a very very high proportion of alcoholics die drunk I don't know what the proportion Portion is technically. I'm not here as a scientist, or I'm not here to report statistics. But I'm aware. I'm very aware that I was going to say lucky that I'm alive. I'm not sure how much luck has to do with it. But then again, I'm not in charge of the universe, so who knows really? Um, why am I? Why am I still alive? Um, being an alcoholic as I am after all these years. I suppose that's the point of what my story is, is why I'm still here. Um, I'm not still here because I'm a good person. I'm not still here because I'm clever. I'm not still here because I'm nice. I'm still here because Alcoholics Anonymous works. Um, It really does, but it doesn't work because I walked in through the doors and sat down and listened, although that was surely necessary if I hadn't walked in, if I hadn't sat down, if I hadn't listened, I wouldn't be here. I'm still here. My sobriety date is the 24th of July, 1993, so I'm I'm something over 20 years sober now. Uh, I believe the reason I'm still here is because I broke, I gave up. I realized that my way of living did not work on any level. And I was willing to say to people who I trusted, just tell me what to do, show me what to do, show me how to live differently than the way I've been living. And I knew that my way of living had failed. I knew my way of living failed before I ever drank. I remember at the age of 11 or 12, Realizing that the universe had nothing to offer that I was remotely interested in, I turned my face to the wall and said to the universe, go away, I'm, I just leave me alone. I just want to wait until the whole thing is over. I remember making the mistake of 
mentioning how depressed I was to my family, and um, my mother said, oh, well, we're all depressed. Just, we'll just have to get used to it. Um, now, I might add that my mother is French, which may explain something <laughs> of this response. My father was English and cheerful. And here's an interesting thing. I have the example from a very early age of my mother's negative neurotic thinking, God bless her. And I saw the effect of this, which was anger and frustration and enormous tension. It wasn't a relaxed household I grew up in. If my father made the mistake of coming back from the supermarket with the wrong type of milk or the wrong type of grapes, there would be hell to pay. I have this example. And then I have the example of my father who was cheerful, relaxed, happy-go-lucky. He'd had his difficulties, but for, for whatever reason, in whatever way, he'd gotten over them. And he just took life as it, it came. Um, he didn't worry about things on the principle that worrying didn't help. He got on with people. He made himself useful. Now, I have these two examples and from an early age, you'd have thought I would have observed which way of living worked best and I would have copied it, but I didn't have the power to do that. I grew up as an identical copy of my mother, baffled by my father. I had the information there. Information is not my problem. Lack of power to change, lack of power to become what I need to become was my problem. Um... Alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol's wonderful. It really is. I don't know if any of you have ever drank, but when alcohol <laughs> first entered my system, I thought, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Now, I may have to have a job and spend time in the so-called real world, but this, this is the real world. The other real world is not the real world. It's a place where you have to pretend a lot. But in this little bubble of alcohol, um, everything is shiny, everything glitters, and everything is slightly fuzzy. Um, the first time I got properly drunk, I was in Germany. I was hard, as it may be, to believe, in a military band, and we were on tour in Germany. A British military band on tour in Germany. You don't get many of those. Um, and we were being hosted in Frankfurt. And uh, there's something in Frankfurt. I don't know if any of you have been to Frankfurt, but there's something at the time which was called the Apfelwein Express. And the Apfelwein Express was a, a, a tourist tram which ran around the centre of Frankfurt, and under, there were these wooden benches, and under the benches were these crates of cider, uh, the Apfelheim. And now, this is interesting to me at any rate, when I walked into the tram, and I stepped onto the tram, I saw that I was 14, I saw these crates of cider, and I looked at the people around me, and I did a very rapid calculation. If you're an alcoholic, you get used to doing very rapid calculations. And I was worried that there wouldn't be enough for me. I'd never been drunk before, but I instinctively knew that this was going to be an issue. <laughs> Is there going to be enough for me? And I drank and drank and drank, and I looked at the people around me, and no one else was drinking the way I drank. And... Inside the tram, to me, everything was glittery. Uh, Frankfurt was whizzing past outside. It was December. Um, it was warm inside the tram, so the, the windows misted up. So this so-called tourist tram of Frankfurt, you couldn't actually see anything of Frankfurt. It was just this mist, and you had to rub the windows to see what was out there. The, the real world was now slightly murky. I couldn't see it. All I was aware of was the warm glow inside me, and it was as though the air was full of Christmas lights. This is what alcohol did for me. And 
I mean, it's, you know, uh, 28 years later, is that, can that be right? It's 28 years later, and I remember that more clearly than anything in my childhood up to that point. This tells you something about the powerful effect of alcohol on someone like me. Um, people talk a lot about what alcohol does to them, and that's surely important, but what is important as well is to recognize what alcohol did for me. It instantly changed my perception of reality and turned the universe into a place temporarily that I didn't mind being too much. Um, when I was around 17 or 18, um, the headmaster of my school, I, I was sent to see the headmaster for something good, actually, that I'd done. And he said that um, when I first arrived at that school at the age of 14, I was like a little old man. But something had happened to me in the previous, I was 18, I think, at this point. Something had happened to me in the previous few months which had meant that I had flowered and become essentially who I was meant to be. And I had indeed flowered and become who I was meant to be. And the funny thing that had happened in those previous six months was I'd become a daily drinker. I had gin and vodka and blue curacao hidden everywhere. Uh, it was a boarding school. Uh, hidden everywhere. Uh, I, I constructed hidden cabinets to uh, house my alcohol. My supply was secure, I was safe, and every night I would get as drunk as possible. Um, it allowed me to operate in a world which was now safe because there was somewhere I could run away from, or run away to from the world. I had a, a hidey hole, I, I had an escape route, I had an escape hatch. Now, this would be fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. And a lot of people operate in the world dependent on one glass, two glasses, 18 glasses of wine. Um, depending on your constitution, that may work for you. But I've got a couple of problems. Um, and my problems were not the arrests. My problems were not waking up so ill that I couldn't function that day. You hear a lot of dramatic stories in AA, and when I first came to AA, um, I'd say three quarters of the room were men over 50. And I was a bloke of sorts at the age of 21, and my story did not match the story of people who were... I, I had not lost a marriage or a house or a job, because I'd never had a marriage, a house or a job. I couldn't identify with lots of the external stories. Um, but I had a couple of problems with my drinking, and as soon as I identified these, I could identify an AA. And I have to say, for a long time in AA, I felt as though I was a fraud, because I thought I had to identify with the external stories, the biographical stories, the disasters. Um, my two problems are these. When I have a drink, I don't know when I'm going to stop. Now, that doesn't just mean during the course of that evening. I mean, that's a fairly easy story to tell. There were times when I would meet someone for a drink at five or six in the evening, thinking, now, I really don't particularly want to go out on the town tonight. I don't, I, I don't want to go to, to a pub. I just want to have a few drinks, have a quiet time, go home, get stuff done, get up early tomorrow. There's an awful lot of pressure. And you, you get home at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, this is a fairly easy story to tell. This is a fairly common story to tell. And I won't labour that particular one. If, if you've had extensive experience of aiming to have a few drinks or a quiet night with friends and it turns into a frenzy and um, you drink to blackout, then this is a good sign that you're in the right place. But in 1991, I was sober for three months. I'd had a catastrophic time drinking. I, it was clear to me that even my drinking turned at the age of 18 pretty badly. Um, and I discovered I could no longer get to the place I needed to get to drunk. I would get physically drunk. But uh, I'd become crazed and crazy 
and even more desperate drunk than I was when I was sober. And where do you go then? You're a, the place you escaped to has become even more frightening than the place you've escaped from. And I decided I would go and stop drinking. And for three months, I was living in Finland at this point. Uh, for three months, I didn't drink, and I did my best to enjoy the <laughs> Finnish summer. Um, but I was... Uh, I was having an awful time, frankly. I, I was even more insane sober over this period than I was when I was growing up. I would um, sit in the middle of a very busy road near to, a very fast road near to where I lived, and uh, the cars would swerve around me because I wanted to die, but I didn't want it to be my fault. I wanted to create an accident so I wouldn't be blamed. Um, but I was sober. And I didn't want to drink because I had a terrible memory of what the last few months, when I was 18, 19, I had a terrible memory of what those last few months were like, the uh, desperation, the inappropriate behavior, uh, the, the sexually inappropriate behavior. Um, and I thought, this is awful, but a drink won't help. And I can't get things done. <laughs> when I'm drinking at all, I can't get things done. I'm too ill during the day. Um, and I was sober for three months, and I was desperately asking for help from all sorts of people. I didn't know who to ask help from. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know how to ask ask for help. Um, and people tried to help me, and they didn't help. Helping professionals tried to help me, but they couldn't help. Um, and I got back to London, and... The first thing that I did was I got excited. I got excited at the prospect of drinking it. And my mind was filled with the same thoughts that they were, it was filled with when I was 14, 15, 16, 17. Where all I could think of was the joy and the excitement and the exhilaration and the promise and the possibility associated with having a drink. And I arrived in London, I met some new friends, and I started drinking, and something in my mind clicked after, I think it was a bottle of Chinzana. I, something in my mind clicked after the first bottle of Chinzano, and this desire to at least make something of myself in the world and live some kind of sober life left me after the first drink and didn't come back for, an, for another nine months. And this would keep happening for every summer. I'd get to um, May or June, and the, the weight of the awful experience of drinking over the previous nine months would hit me all at once, and I'd say, I can't do this anymore, I'm done, and I would stop drinking. But when I started again, the resolve of the three months that I was sober would go instantly. This is the effect of one drink. I can be absolutely convinced that I must stay sober, committed to staying sober, sure at a cellular level that being sober, although difficult, although crazy making, was the right way to proceed. I have one drink and this plan is wiped from my mind. It's like a data disk being wiped and it's replaced with a new plan, which is I'm going to essentially live in the drunk world. I may need to spend some time every day in the sober world to get some money in order to sustain my drunk life, but it switches. And I don't get to choose when it switches back. At one point, I started drinking again. It was a year and a half before it switched back, and I said I want to be sober again. And I know today, if I stop what I'm doing in AA, if I have a drink, I don't know if the gift of grace to want to be sober would come back, and if so, how long it would take. I had some slips in AA after I came to AA, and in some of these cases, I came back the next day. In other cases, I didn't. In 1995, my best friend in AA drank, and it's 2014, and he's still drunk. Other people I saw drink and, and were dead the same day, or dead within weeks. So my two problems, the two problems which constitute my alcoholism, are number one, when I have a drink, I don't know if I'm ever going to stop. Number two, if you leave me sober for long enough, left to my own devices, all I see is the glow and the excitement and the joy 
and the exhilaration and the world of possibilities around a bottle of gin, a bottle of chinzano, a bottle of sherry. It doesn't matter what it is. And the rest of the world gets blocked out. And all I can think about is that is where I want to live. And no memory will stop me. No argument will stop me. No goodness will stop me. I have to do it. And the reason I'm still sober, I believe, is because the underlying problem has been solved. I was tense my whole life before I ever drank. And there was something terribly wrong, but I didn't have the words for it. And I was sitting on the... I've admittedly been by Lake Geneva helps, but I was sitting on the, on the wall out there thinking there is nothing wrong. So just before the meeting, there is nothing wrong now. There is nothing, there has never been anything wrong. There's been a barrage of thoughts in my mind at certain times telling me that everything is wrong, everyone is wrong, the world is screwed, there is no hope. But there was never anything wrong, I was never harmed. Now how I got from there to here, I can't look back and, and I don't understand why intellectually why I was so unhappy as a child. I don't understand intellectually why I was so unhappy, I should add, for many years sober, though that's not compulsory. We'll get on to that. But a change has happened, and there's a, a, a marvellous line in the big book where it, we talk about, it says, what has happened to us. And sometimes when people who've got a good program in AA will convey that program, they'll tell you all the marvellous things that they did and how wonderful things are now. And, yeah, I've done, I've had to do those things. There's a lot of action in AA. There's a, there's a lot that has been required. But that is not what has kept me here. That is not what has solved the underlying problem. The thing that has solved the underlying problem is the grace of a power greater than me, working initially through everybody else in AA and then, in, and then working through me to keep me here. I need to take some action to activate my faith. Uh, as a, a woman I met in Austin, Texas said a number of years ago, I only met her very briefly, but the memory of her is seared in my mind. You, you need to take action to activate your faith. God isn't going to slide a hot dog under your door. So yes, I've needed to take a lot of action in AA, but AA has essentially carried me for the last 20 years. If I meet the conditions, AA will carry me. And the only condition I needed to make when I was very new was I needed to follow the first instruction. When I phoned AA, a woman said, there is a meeting near you tonight. This was February 1993. And something in me was broken and said, I'm going to follow the instruction. So I sat in my bed for the next nine hours until it was time to go to the meeting. Uh, and I went to the meeting and I said, is this, I, I, I must have fumbled what I was saying. I must have been incoherent because there was enormous confusion when I arrived. Um, they tried to send me initially to an Alateen meeting down the road. So I, I looked around 16, 17. I hadn't been eating very much and I was sort of small and frail. Um, Eventually they worked out I was indeed in the right place and they gave me half a cup of tea and they sat me in the middle of the room and I felt a curious sensation which I was safe. What I had to do was follow the instruction, go to the meeting, follow the next instruction, take this cup of tea, sit there. And I took the cup of tea and sit there and didn't argue. I just waited for the meeting to happen to me. And that's been the story of the rest of the steps. Um, I didn't stop drinking straight away because, I mean, I have to say, I was surrounded by people in AA who were good people when I first got to AA. And there were people who were working the steps, there were people who had a program, there were people who were sponsoring, there were people who had a spiritual life, there were people who were praying, meditating and making amends and doing all of these things. Now, the trouble is, there were lots of other people too who were great and kind and lovely. But 
when there are two people in the room who are working the steps and 19 who are not and come to AM talking about their day and blah, blah, blah. How would you know that the two people, the two crazy people working the steps are the ones you need to listen to? They're in the minority. You're going to go, you're going to go with the majority. You're going to go with the consensus. And the consensus, what I was told as a majority, the majority of the time was don't drink and go to meetings and you'll be fine. And I didn't drink. And I went to meetings. And then I drank. And I wasn't fine. And you see, I can't consistently follow the instruction, don't drink. So I don't tell people, don't drink. I'll tell people, if you comply with certain conditions, you'll be given the grace not to drink. Um, the first night I went to AA, I went home at the end of the meeting and I poured a bottle of gin down the sink. I'd never poured away a drop of alcohol in my life. I was given the power to do something which was be, would have been beyond my mind to conceive of. Now, initially, the shock of being surrounded by all this power in AA, that was enough. But there is something so powerful inside me. This is There are two powerful forces in the universe. One is a power greater than myself, God, working through people in AA, now working through me. The other power is a destructive force within me. And that was in charge of my life. And as soon as I came to AA, that power was still growing. And that grew and grew and grew until a voice inside said to me, you need relief. I know where the relief is. And the relief came in St. Peter's book in March uh, 1993 from a bottle of Hungarian brandy, which I knew as soon as I drank it was the wrong thing to do, but I had to carry on. In July 1993, after an incident which involved a traffic accident, some policemen, I won't go into the details, um, something in me broke even further. And my story is a story of breaking. Something in me broke further, and for some reason, you see, when I break, I hear different things. I hear things I haven't heard before. I see people I haven't seen before, and a voice reaches me from them that hasn't reached me before. And a woman called Maureen, who was 19 years sober at the time, is still sober today. Maureen said, did you know you were dying? And I thought this was very impertinent, because people said, people had been saying to me for months, did you know you're so lucky? You're so lucky coming to AA, so young, and you're going to be all right. And I didn't feel lucky, and... When you're lying in the middle of the road and there is a car heading towards you at high speed, you are not okay. The people that said you're going to be okay were not were speaking from the heart, but they weren't speaking accurately. She said you're dying. And I knew she was being accurate. And that cut through all the sentiment. And... I found a man who dug, who was not bothered remotely what people thought. He was just happy and cheerful in rooms of AA, which were sometimes not very happy and not very cheerful. And I was amazed. I was amazed at this. There was a lightness and there was a buoyancy about him. And I said, what do I have to do? And now he gave me instructions over the following year which were good and helpful. And I completed, I ran through the steps very quickly. I, I didn't have a, a strong concept of power greater than myself. The type of AA that I went to at this time was very much just follow the instructions would be absolutely fine. And the funny thing was, I did and it worked. I didn't have any real concept of a higher power. I remember it three or four months sober having a bad day and I was stuck in the middle of nowhere, no mobile phones, no internet. And um, I opened the big book hoping <laughs> this might help and there was a chapter, We Agnostics, I had a vague idea of how great in myself might help and I read the chapter and it infuriated me and I threw it across the room. But I was following the practical instructions I was given and I was staying sober and boy, was I doing better than the people around me who weren't, who were drinking and some of them were dying. So I knew the instructions helped. 
and my sponsor, my current sponsor, 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 says a lot of steps two and three are about taking actions you don't believe in because the people who are giving them are doing better than you. Doug was doing better than me. He was bright, he was successful, he was funny, he was relaxed, he had a bunch of friends, he had an amazing life. He was doing better than me, so I just did what I was told. And I did a step four and five, which, you know, by my standards now was shoddy, but I told the truth, it was the best I could do, and I told the truth, and when I told the truth in step five, I realized at gut level, is this all, I was unhappy because of this, this material, on literally five pieces of paper. It was a terrible step forward. It was, the, it was an honest effort, and I told the truth, and it worked. And I made some, some, I made some amends, and they were, you know, based on how I make amends now, they were shoddy amends, they were, they were rotten amends. I wouldn't give you tuppence for how I made them, but I made them. And you know what happened? I stayed sober. Um, I had some effort at steps 10 and 11. I found meditation very difficult. I tried to go to meditation classes. I tried to read meditation books, uh, but I couldn't do it. Uh, I didn't develop a spiritual life because I think the big reason was um, when you look at meditation in a dictionary now, it points you eastwards, points you towards Buddhism, it points you towards mindfulness, it points you towards specific postures, relaxing tapes, all these wonderful things. I'm not knocking these things, I think they're wonderful. You take an alcoholic who is mid-treatment and ask them to sit in a room, alone, cross-legged, with no external interference, and you ask them to quiet their mind. I became suicidal within seconds. I could not follow these instructions for long enough to get the benefit because the noise in my head was too loud. So I didn't really follow a spiritual path. I followed a purely practical path. And I did sponsor people. I did a lot of service in my first five or six years. But something was happening and I didn't know it was happening. My ego which was so broken, which was broken sufficiently when I came into AA to follow instructions, was growing back. And you know you've got an ego when you have a plan. And my plan was to <coughs> make it, as we say in English. I was going to make it in the world. Now alcohol wasn't in the way. The world was my oyster. I could do what I wanted. And my idea of making it was, I need to get a career. I need to get a career in which I move fast, I progress rapidly, I rise up the level, I get money, I get power, I get prestige, I get security, so they can't get me. If you've got a concept of they, who are the ones who are going to get you, you might be ready for this program. I wanted to make myself safe. I thought I need a relationship, I need someone to look after me, who is going to stay with me, come what may. I need a mortgage, I need a pension, I need a big house in the suburb, in the suburbs, where I'm safe from poverty, and from want, and from fear. And I'm going to construct this, how am I going to do it? I need a position in AA, I need a good social set, I need to look good. I don't know why I thought I needed to look good physically. Uh, clothes. And I had a plan. And the thing is, when you're sober, and you've been given half a program, and you're surrounded by people in AA who are very competent and very capable, you will be taught exceptionally well how to win at the game of life in the world's terms. And at eight years sober, I was the finance director of a dot-com in London. Uh, I was earning a lot of money. I had a big house in the suburbs. I had a boyfriend who I've been with for many years who was in AA. We were very happy. We were very secure. I have the mortgage, I have the pension, I have an amazing set of friends from a social point of view. Um, they were wonderful, they were exciting, they were thrilling, they were 
a friend you could boast to your other friends about. That was the point of friends. It wasn't whether you enjoyed being with them, it's how impressive they were to your other friends. And if you left me alone for long enough to be aware of what was going on really underneath, I became suicidal and asked, give me something to do, give me something to distract. And I broke down rather spectacularly and became ill physically. And I went to AA and said, what do I do? I went to the people around me and said, what do I do? And they said, go to lots of meetings, get lots of service. And I've been doing lots of service. I've been going to lots of meetings. And I tried, but I didn't find the solution I was looking for. So I left AA. I don't know if any of you have left AA, <laughs> but I did, and I didn't drink. But I became, over the course of two years, a recluse. And I became stranger and stranger and more and more frightened until I was forced back to AA because I didn't know where I didn't know where else to go. It had failed, but I didn't know where else to go. And over the course of the next five years, which was a very painful five years in some ways, um, I found some people. I found some people not in my local groups. I found some people over the internet. I found some tapes. And I listened to these tapes. And I found tapes of people that talked about the doctor's opinion, what really made an alcoholic an alcoholic. And it wasn't the dramatic drinking story with the two features I talked about earlier. And then I found lots of Al-Anon tapes. And these explained my reaction to all of the alcoholics around me in AA. It explained my reaction to my parents. It explained why I was so affected by everybody around me. I then fortunately found tapes of people that talked about the promises in the big book. They talked about freedom from fear. They talked about living in a new and wonderful world, whatever their present circumstances. Now, I had read the big book a number of times by this point, and I agreed enormously with some of it. Uh, Bill W. in the chapter uh, where he tells his story talks about uh, the Bible, where some bits, the, some bits he agrees with hugely. The morality was impossibly good. In other parts were impossibly bad, and that was my attitude to the big book. There were some very good practical things, but there were some bits which were just poetic license. It was just Bill trying to sell something. And I would go to big book meetings and tell people, don't, don't take, take it with a pinch of salt. Don't believe everything you read in this book. What I, what I heard these people saying was that if you haven't met the conditions for the promises to come true, don't be surprised if the promises haven't come true. Um, there are seven points in the big book where it describes if you do this action, you will get drunk. If you don't do this action, uh, you will get drunk. And I looked at whether I was complying with these conditions. Now, I wasn't getting drunk, but I was close to it in many ways. In many ways, my life externally was very good. I was certainly doing better than lots of my friends, but there was a deep unease which hadn't been solved. 15 years sober. I was happy in some ways, but not functioning at a profound level. But I knew there was something deeply wrong. And I had to ask myself, am I fostering resentment? Am I harboring resentment? And yes, there was a lot of bitterness in my life towards my parents, towards my siblings, for instance. Secrets, oh boy, were there secrets. There were things I couldn't tell my AA group. There were things I hadn't told anyone. Um... Were the creditors I hadn't faced? Yes, I'd built up amends over the previous 14 years since my first round of amends. Amends I hadn't made. Things I'd stolen sober. Which I hadn't given back. Um, were there other amends I hadn't made? Absolutely. There were amends that I hadn't made the first time round. I'd been given license not to make them. There people in there. Well-meaning people said, you don't need to go back to exes. You don't need to go back to former partners. You don't need to go back to people who have harmed you, if you've harmed them, you have to make amends unless they've harmed you, in which case they are. Now, these people meant well, but I knew there was guilt, there was shame associated with these. 
Was I giving up much of my free time to help other people? Not really. I wasn't meeting the conditions for the promises. I decided that I was going to test what the big book said scientifically. And the only way to test it was to take every action described in it and see what happens. And let's see whether these promises are real, whether they're a pile of rubbish. And over the course of three months, I did exactly what it said, word for word. I made every last amend that I could find. I had a list of, I came up amazingly with a list of 78 people. I, was, I couldn't believe that that list was there until I looked for it. I didn't find it. The roof of my head blew off, and I realized I'd been living my whole life under a blanket, and I hadn't been experiencing real life. I, I'd been experiencing this gray monotony, and I thought that was real life, but it wasn't. Over the last five years, my life has blossomed in an unbelievable way. And it happened because I met the conditions, and the conditions are not difficult. They're about an honest effort, but they're about an honest effort combined with a desire to complete what was started. I didn't complete what was started the first time. And I've been shown, I've fortunately over the last five years been exposed to people who have shown me how to pray and meditate in a way that works for people who are crazy. <laughs> a way to pray and meditate for people whose head is full of noise. I've been shown ways of helping people simply by showing other people what helped me. Um, the gaps have been filled in. And what I'm looking forward to doing in conjunction with Laura for the rest of the day is to show you what was shown to me, to show you how to fill in the gaps so that hopefully you'll get the experience of AA that I've had over the last five years and not the experience I had in the first 15. I've had my 14 years. I'm going to stop now. So thank you for listening. All right, everybody. Could you all take a seat? So, we're going to open up this first session. We'd like to open up with a set-aside prayer. You can join me if you like, if you know it. Um, uh, Ju thank you, Judy. I just wrote it down because I forgot to print it out and bring it. So, God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, my illness, the steps, recovery, and above all, you, God, for an open mind and new experience. May I see the truth. Amen. So we're going to start with our session. I'll let you explain. Hi, my name's Laura, and I'm a real alcoholic. Hi, Laura. Great to see everybody here this morning. It's something, you know, when you take time out from your busy lives to come to uh, an event like this. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I'm told very often that I don't speak up enough, which I find strange because when I first moved to the UK, I found that wherever I went, I was louder. I'm not American. I'm Canadian, but I was louder than everyone else. <laughs> Maybe it's my years in the UK that whatever. All right, so step one, does everyone in this room know what's wrong with them? <laughs> you know, for me, I had, I had to discover what was wrong with me, and hello? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought you were blowing kisses to me. <laughs> Do I know you? <laughs> it took me a long time to discover what was wrong with me. <clears throat> and I'll try not to tell my story because I'm going to need to speak closer. Telling it later on. Thank you. Is there anyone here who is unsure about what it means to be alcoholic? Well, there's a lot of, in I, I found a lot of answers in the big book, but as uh, Tim said earlier, I had to listen to alcoholics first. You know, and the same thing happens to me that happened to Tim. My drinking story is much longer. In the end, I, I drank for 32 years. 
And I know I was an alcoholic before I put, picked up the first drink in here, you know. My alcoholism is between my two ears. And my very first drink changed my life. But um, I know today, and it says here, in Chapter 3, I don't know if you brought your books or you wish to refer to your books, because this is kind of a workshop sort of thing. Yeah. It says on, on, on page 30, well, let's go, you know, the step. It's not hanging up here. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And then there's this long dash. It's a pause. <laughs> that our lives had become unmanageable. And someone who had only about four or five months dry time more than I did explained to me that she was a little bit of an English major and a grammar person. She said that long dash is like a full stop. She said step one is in two parts. It's two sentences. You know. And the first part was I was powerless over alcohol. Now I never, in my head, powerless didn't really work for me because I came to AA convinced that it was about finding willpower. I was convinced that I didn't have any. And I was convinced that all of you had stopped drinking by willpower and that somehow you were magically endowed with this power that I didn't have. I was very lost and very deluded. You know. And it took a long time to, for me to discover that many in the rooms did not get sober by trying. Then I heard that people had been struck sober. <laughs> and I didn't really, well, I, start, I had to learn to believe them, and I wished that that would happen to me. But I didn't, I still didn't understand what was wrong with me. And I did not believe in magic. <laughs> I did not believe in magic. But see, I was a person who went through my life from that first drink pretty much unconsciously. You know, I had a lot of um, bad experiences with alcohol, but I never turned around and looked at, looked inside. I was always looking outside. I blame my drinking, my excesses on outside events. But sitting in AA consistently for about three months, I started to learn a few things. <clears throat> and slowly I started to concede to my innermost self. That's, that's the line on page 30. We learned we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step of recovery. And of course, I've heard many times that step one is the only one you need to get 100%. <laughs> well, I didn't get it 100% the first time. I spent five years infrequently trying to stop drinking and coming to AA meetings and being told not to pick up the first drink. <laughs> I didn't even want to stop drinking, but there I'm leaking into my story. <clears throat> so what is powerless over alcohol to me? I was lucky I had some, I, I finally got a big book sponsor, and um, they made it, and there were some people in the group that were following this method, and they made it really simple. And they pointed to me, pointed out to me, that the doctor's opinion, the first chapter, which is not called chapter one, and it's numbered in Roman numerals, which I'm sure makes a lot of us skip this extra information. But the doctor, this little doctor, back in the 1930s, who treated so many alcoholics, he, he knew, he had a theory in his head that somehow we were allergic to alcohol. But of course, again, I thought I knew better than the AAs. How could I be allergic to alcohol? I could drink tons of stuff. <laughs> Until this woman with about four months dry time and had been going to these big book meetings, she pointed out some of the lines. <clears throat> and she talked to me about this craving. And there's one here on 28. So if you want to know the Roman for 28, 
It's XXVIII. <clears throat> and the doctor says, we believe. So he, wasn't, he was working with some other medical professionals. We believe, as so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. But the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperature. <laughs> the phenomenon of craving. It took me a long time to understand that. You know, my tent was mush after 32 years of drinking. You know? Phenomenon of craving. But I was got to the group. They told me, this is a physical sensation. It's not the word, it's not, that doctor uses the word craving to me, in my mind, my experience. The doctor uses the word craving in a different way than we use it, they use it out there. <laughs> the flatlanders. Come on. Like pregnant, pregnant women crave ice cream and pickles or whatever, you know. That's a strong desire. That's a head thing. That's a mental thing, right? This craving is different. And I really had to roll it over, over in my head because apart from be, being convinced that this was a question of human willpower, <laughs> I had been convinced that I, for a long time, that I drank too much because I was greedy. <laughs> I didn't understand. This craving is what happens to me as soon as I touch a drink. You know, it could be a sip, it could be a half a glass, certainly the first glass. And so for some people it takes two or three. But that finally explained to me why the first drink got me drunk. <laughs> It finally explained to me why every time I had, I had to, every time I took a drink or part of a drink, I would have to finish the bottle and possibly go get another one <laughs> and possibly go get another one. It finally explained that there was a physical reason where it says on page 30, we learned that um, we're bodily and mentally different from other people. You know, I could never really admit that I was different from other people. That explained why I had always over drank. Drunk. That's a tough word for me. <laughs> I can't think of any time in my life where I really drank absolutely normal. Normally. I always over drank. You know, I didn't make a mess all the time, but I knew in my innermost self that usually I had one too many, <laughs> you know. But that explained it. And the, th the effect for, of that for me was so liberating. Because I thought it had been my fault that I drank so much. I thought I was a greedy person. And I, I had been in other areas. But, you know, that made me feel ashamed and less than and when I'm ashamed, I don't reach out for help. I don't want to ask questions. I don't, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I, or I was wearing a really big mask. I want to be as good as everyone else. So I didn't, ask, you know, I didn't want to show this shame. But when I, when I understood, I finally understood why I was powerless over alcohol because of this craving. When I drank it, when I drank it, because of this craving. This craving is is my the manifestation of an allergy. That's how my allergy shows up. I don't get sick. I want more. <laughs> but, you know, it's as simple as that. But when it took away the shame, I thought, you know, aha, I'm on to something. <laughs> But no, I thought I was in the right place. And I thought that, that this group, which is a big book group in Cannes, France, um, could help me. That's the physical side of step one. Have I, do, you think, do you have anything to say about the physical? The physical craving? Maybe. Tim, I'll call it. 
I'm letting Laura do the heavy lifting here. And I'll do a bit of decoration after each item. Um, I didn't know that I had a physical craving. First of all, whenever I had a drink, it felt like I was deciding to drink. Uh, when I've had three quarters of a bottle of gin, it feels like I'm deciding to have another gin. Because something in my mind says, let's have another gin. So I do. So I had trouble with the concept of powerlessness. And there's a marvellous line in the doctor's opinion. Uh, it, it did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental defectives. And it's terribly important, this, because when I was um, drinking, around, especially around the age of 19, 20, 21, I was very maladjusted to life. I was certainly running from reality. Uh, and my mind, at the end, did not work properly. Uh, when I read something, I would get to the end of the paragraph and not remember what was at the beginning of the paragraph. Now, at ten years sober, I asked myself, how do I know that I didn't drink crazy amounts just because I was crazy and young and inexperienced and foolish and I hated life so I was running away from it and I'd had so much drink that it had addled my mind and it wasn't working properly. Now that I'm 10 years sober, I have a, at least externally, a good life and my mind works properly and reality I can kind of deal with and, you know, I'm not as happy as I could be, but I know a lot of people who are unhappier and I recognize that I mustn't drink too much. How do I know that I couldn't drink normally now. How do I know that I couldn't drink reasonable amounts? And what this book says is, well, ask yourself effectively what it's doing. It says, ask yourself, well, is there any other explanation other than that's just what your body does that works? Now, option number one, maladjusted to life. So, yeah, I did drink buckets of this stuff when I was very unhappy. But I remember a holiday when I was 19. I was traveling around Europe with someone who I was very fond of. We were going around for six or seven weeks. And I remember sitting uh, in a campsite overlooking Florence. And I had, we had some boxes of wine. And I, I, we'd had an amazing, it was Florence. I'd had an amazing day. I'd had a lovely time. And I had the first box of wine, we had the first box of wine between us, and I, I got to the zone, I got to the point where there was a click inside me, and I relaxed, and everything was fine, and I wanted to be here forever, perfectly happy. I had the knowledge and the experience by this point that I mustn't overshoot, I mustn't drink too much, I mustn't tip over, and I had the second box of wine. I was already where I needed to be. I didn't notice any physical effect from the second box. It's not like I needed to be drunker. I was perfectly happy, and I still drank too much. I can't blame how much I drank on being unhappy, because when I was happy, I still did it. When my, I can't blame how much I drank on being um, in full flight from reality, because when I was in a reality I was happy with, I still did it. I wanted to remain in that perfect zone. And all I had to do was not drink the next box of wine. One extra glass over the next two hours will be enough to keep me topped up. But no, I have to have the extra box of wine. I go into this dark place. We end up in the most awful argument yet again. And, you know, at the beginning of my drinking, my mind still did function. And I knew after the first couple of times that I drink too much. If only I could stick to the first half of the evening, I would be fine. I wasn't addled by alcohol at this point, but I was absolutely unable to follow my conviction after the first experience that I must, I must limit it somehow. There is no way I can limit it. An allergy in the 1930s meant an abnormal reaction. In other words, a reaction different from the majority. And the majority of people do not suffer from this. I drank too much every single time 
I drank, regardless of circumstances, regardless of emotional state. And this is why I'm convinced that if I had a drink today, I would drink the same way. I was looking in here for the page reference, but uh, yeah, to, to use the, a good word, ask, ask, ask myself, ask myself, ask yourselves. <laughs> Have you asked yourself enough what happens when you drink? <clears throat> but there's an indication of a test in here. I think it's in here. So the Marty Man test. It's about the controlled drinking experiment. Bottom 31. Is it on 31? Yeah, it is. 31, 32. And Marty Mann was one of the first women alcoholics in AA. And uh, that's 21. And, um, I heard this after about this after I got sober. I don't think I ever really tried it myself, although not seriously. Although in effect, I tried it many, 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 many times. Where I'd be going out for an evening, and I had the vague idea that if I drank too much, I would get in trouble, or if it was a business function with my husband, or other. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to embarrass myself or him. And I would go into these occasions thinking, oh, I'll just have one, two, three, you know, I won't step over that line. And I really believed it was a question of choice, but that's sort of the second half. Well, no, it's a question of choice of how much I will drink. And uh, this is the test. And I, I know, I know what would happen to me, but it's at the bottom of 31. <clears throat> so if you have any doubts, about whether you have the allergy, which is one part of the illness. <clears throat> we do not like to pronounce any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over into the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly. Try it more than once. It will not take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. And it may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. So this means going in consciously, <laughs> consciously, to try to control your drinking once you've stopped. Well, I never did that consciously because I found out about this after I got sober. But when I think about this, when I think about do the mental exercise in my head, what would happen if I went up to a bar and ordered just one drink? I have no wish to do that. <laughs> but going through it, I know what would happen. But it also gives me this little disgusting feeling, not nausea quite, you know, in the pit of my stomach. And I have a friend who, said, it's, who says, you yeah, know, I think of this as like going up to the bar and asking, give me a craving. <laughs> Say, give me a beer, a glass of wine. Give me a glass of craving. <laughs> I thought, I think that's kind of cute. You know? But yes, I was deluded, and that's another thing you pointed out, Tim. I was deluded for a long time <laughs> about the fact that I chose to drink the next drink. You know, I chose to drink so much. But that was the whole delusion of me being in control of everything, you know. My very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they told me I had an illness. <laughs> they told me about the allergy, but as I said, I wouldn't believe them. And because one part of my illness is a, is a huge amount of pride, I was afraid to, to ask people um, what the allergy meant what the allergy meant. But it's, it's fully explained in this book. And, however, I couldn't go through this book on my own. 
because I have an illness of perception, and so I needed to read it alongside another another alcoholic, or several, <laughs> that uh, actually understood the message in this book. Okay, to, to me, the craving uh, does explain a lot of things for which I could not otherwise account. And I think the craving also explains, you know, I promised myself, when I was in my da -da -da, late 20s, I guess late 20s, early, no, early to mid 20s, um, you know, I was in my first job, and then I met, you know, the man that was going to be my husband, and I was in a crowd of young people, and of course we were with a lot of other drinkers, you know, work hard, play hard. Uh, out in the mountains, I was in western Canada, and at that point, uh, in the summer times, we do canoe trips, you know, and camping outdoors. And a lot of the people, as I said, were heavy drinkers. And I was shocked to see, because my illness hadn't progressed so much, I was shocked to see some of the people spiking their morning coffee so they could get a start to the day. You know? And at that point, you know, 25, 26 years old, I said to them, I'll never go there. Oh, how could they do that, you know? And at that point, <laughs> that's the way I felt. But fast forward about 20 years, and I became a morning drinker. And that's, that also, I believe, was because of the craving. I, could, I didn't decide. I thought I was deciding to pick up that morning drink. But instinctively, the only thing that would quell that craving was the drink. So instinctively, I, I started, to, it didn't start from one day to the next. My drinking started earlier and earlier and earlier in the day. You know, on earlier and earlier and earlier in the week. You know, at the, in the beginning, once I discovered alcohol, I, I pretty much never passed up an opportunity to drink it, although I didn't stoop to stealing it out of my parents' liquor cabinet. I was 15 years old. But every time there came an opportunity to drink with friends, I was there. But that usually happened like once a month. Once a month. <laughs> maybe, maybe less. <clears throat> then, as I uh, did my studies, and uh, I suppose moved away from authoritarian figures, and then had the money, my first job, I thought the normal thing to do was to go to work, every day, and come home and have a drink to relax. But that's what I'd watch my, pa my parents do. I thought that was just normal, but I didn't realize that. You know, I didn't realize when my drinking had progressed from just on the weekends to every day, you know. But I watch it, I've watched it a lot in other people now that I know what's wrong with me, and I can see them. Um, my favorite example is my mother. And I visit her once in a while. She's over in Canada. <clears throat> and she doesn't appear to have the craving, but she's definitely dependent on that afternoon drink. And, of course, when I'm around, I make her nervous. <laughs> so when I first get there, she hasn't started to drink until, you know, just, you know, cocktail hour, let's call it. But after I've been there for a few days, for some reason, she's used to living alone. She likes it that way. Duh. Um... Oh uh, yeah, I make her nervous, whatever, the situation, and she will start to drink like an hour earlier, or an hour earlier. And if something comes between her and her set time of drinking, like the year the battery in the car died at, after the Christmas Eve church service, it was very tense. It was very tense, you know. And recently she said to me, she's almost eight years old, and she's in pretty good health. But she said to me, I can't get sick. I can't get sick. And maybe I'm reading a lot into it, but I know she's very, very afraid of being under the care of someone else who can see her drinking, you know. But she, she can't get sick because she can't go to hospital because they don't serve cocktails in the hospital, you know. But that's because of the craving. The craving makes me want, you know. It makes me want to drink. 
this is why I know if I start again, if I take that one drink, well, apart from it not being in me, I also know now, I also believe now that it won't be me, the real me that takes the drink. It will be my illness. But that's another, we'll talk about that later, possibly. But if I take a drink, first of all, I don't know how much I'll drink after that drink, in, as you said, in that instance, in that drinking episode. But I've also watched people, and they think it might only be, you know, I'll go out of AA for one night or for the weekend, and then I'll come back. <laughs> you know, it's a special occasion. I'll go out for one, one weekend and come back. And I've watched enough people to see, and it says in this book, too, it says that uh, the alcoholic... I used to know the page numbers really well. We know that the alcoholic, as long as he stays away from the alcohol, um, reacts pretty much like, like normal men. I don't believe that part, but let's just take it for granted. Bottom of 22. That's it, yes, before 24. Okay, thanks. So, bottom of page 22. So, is there a question? No, I was, uh, and that's let him drink for a day and he becomes antisocial. Oh, no, that's not the one I meant, but. Yeah, that's the difference. Bottom of page 22, it says, we know, we know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. I'm not really sure what that means, but the important part is we are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in the bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. You know, once I... Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to come in on the, on the obsession. So I, I think that's a, a good point to, to segue into the obsession side, because uh, looking back at my drinking, I'm very clear that I must never have another drink is that I may never come back. Therefore, and this is what the book immediately goes on to say, therefore my main problem is my mind stone-cold sober, which would, in inverted commas, make a decision to have a drink. Uh, the only person that would put alcohol inside me, uh, that would put the first drink inside me, is me. Therefore, I am the problem. I've got to make sure that my mind does not say yes to the first drink. So my real problem is not what happens when I drink. My real problem is my mind stone cold sober. Now, I talked about when I was drinking, when I'd had a drink, it always felt like I had the second drink, the fourth drink, the 14th drink as the result of a decision because that's how it feels. And it was like that with every first drink I ever took. It felt like I have just decided to have the first drink. There we go. Now, a decision, I've been taught, is a commitment to action based on a sound analysis of the facts. That is what the decision in step three will be, a commitment to action based on a sound analysis of the facts. Now, my analysis of the facts when I was stone cold sober was never sound. But also, sometimes there was no analysis. So my question then is, if I was not committing myself to a drink based on a sound analysis of the facts, what was I doing? What I was doing was yielding to an impulse beyond my mental control, which is totally different. And if you're an Al-Anon, you'll discover yourself yielding to impulses beyond your mental control as well when you decide to tell them one more time how to live. Because this time, if you explain it carefully enough, they'll obey, finally. 
and they'll get sober or they'll get or they'll do what you want them to do and the impulse is coming up inside you and you just have to do what it says there is no arguing with it and in the in the big book the reason i love the big book is it gives you 20 pages between the top of 23 and the top of 44 21 pages to be strict where it looks at the mind of the alcoholic stone cold sober and the first one is on page 23 when you've got the man with the hammer who hits himself over the head with the hammer because it will dull the pain he thinks now someone said to me why did you drink do you think and I said depression loneliness anxiety and he said did your drinking improve those three conditions over the long term? And the answer was no. I was more depressed, more lonely, more anxious at the end of my drinking than at the beginning. This is called fallacious reasoning. Um, this is the man with the hammer. The next man is uh, on 20. I'm afraid it's all men. Um, but imagine, if you can, what it must be like being one of these alcoholic men. 26, 27, there is a man who's, who goes to see Jung, of all people, probably just up the road from here. Um, go and visit the site, say a little prayer. Um, and it's great, because this is a man who has religion, whose mind is sorted out, yet there is an impulse within him stronger than his mind, which takes him to a drink. Uh, the next one is on page 32. This is the man of 30 who has the belief he's given up alcohol before. So he, if he starts again after 25 years, it's perfectly... But he, if it's bad, he'll just stop again. But he's unable to. He believes he has power. And then we have Jim... Um, some people say, this is Jim on page 35, we haven't got time to go through the whole story of Jim, but essentially he's made a start in recovery, but he hasn't completed the AA program. And uh, Jim is a little bit neurotic, but nowhere near as neurotic as I was when I was new, and perhaps nowhere near as neurotic as some of you are. Now, Jim's doing reasonably well, but suddenly... The thought crosses his mind that a drink would be a good idea. And he believes that if he mixes alcohol with milk, he'll be safe. This is untrue, but it appears to him to be true. And it talks about this a couple of pages earlier as a peculiar mental twist, a twist in reality. If my sobriety depends on my perception of reality remaining untwisted for the rest of my life, good luck. Because I have a twisted perception of reality in all sorts of other respects. So he has a twisted perception of reality and he gets drunk. Um, you look at the next man, the, the, the jaywalker on page uh, 37. Um, just like the man with the hammer. The man with the hammer has this impulse that he desperately wants the pain to go and so he takes the drink and even though it will make it worse all he can see is this this relief five minutes away and the jaywalker is the same there'll be terrible consequences if he keeps running across the road in front of traffic but all he can see is the, the temporary thrill and this is the peculiar lack of, the awful lack of perspective it talks about, I think, in Bill's story, where the thing which is right in front of your face seems so much more important, so much bigger than the thing over there, the consequences. And so the, the jaywalkers, just like the man with the hammer, the thrill I'm going to get now outweighs the consequences I'm going to get tomorrow or next year. And then you've got Fred, who is the most baffling person, and that is on page 39. Now, he doesn't even take the AA program. He believes that self-knowledge is going to be enough. And he has an amazing life, and he has an amazing day, and he still drinks. There is something deeply wrong with him below the level of consciousness. And with him, it talks about a mental blank spot. So the information doesn't even show up of what happens when he has a drink. A desire to drink hits him and he follows the desire to drink. The AA program works as far as I'm concerned. 
because my mind is no longer in control. I'm in touch with forces within me which are stronger than the impulse to drink. When I stand on the edge of a train platform and the train is coming in, I instinctively pull back from the edge of the platform. Not as a mental process, it's instinctive. It's self-preservation. There is something about alcoholism where that self-preservation instinct gets turned off and the other instinct for relief is in charge. And that instinct for relief, the, the, the underlying spiritual condition, if I don't give it relief, it will give itself relief. It will find a way to give itself relief, even if that relief would ultimately kill me. And that is alcoholism. And Sister B.M., who is an amazing speaker, um, she would say, my head would kill me if it didn't need me for transportation. <laughs> now, the truth is that my head will kill me even though it needs, needs me for transportation. That's the tragic truth of alcoholism. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Yeah, that's one of the first surprising things I heard in AA that was that my head would kill me, and I didn't think I did. I, you know, I had trusted my head for a very long time, and I really did believe that I was in control until I learned otherwise. Thank God, by grace, by grace. Yeah. So now we now we're getting into the mental side of the illness. So there's two parts to my illness: physical and mental. Has everyone got the physical part? It should be easy enough. I really, I really am, you know, as they say, allergic. I cannot. I have two problems. I have, I've lost the power of control of my dream. And I've lost the power of choice. And on page 30, they talk about loss of the power of control. I'm just trying to review the, the, the allergy part, the physical part. I'm bodily different from my fellows. I've lost the power of control. I do realize now that I never had the power of control. Sometimes it looks like um, my drinking was under control, but that was usually from outside sources. <laughs> like there wasn't enough available on the table, in the room, in the building. <laughs> I didn't have enough money. But I never had the power of control, as I said. I always overdrink. Here it is on page 30. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. And no real alcoholic ever recovers control. I tend to think about, about that in relation to the physical allergy. My body that tells me to drink more than I need. But this mental one, it's this, the mental twist, the mental twist. <laughs> Very scary. And, and Tim has touched on, uh, how much time do we have for this session? It's how, how long do we have? Well, we had, do we have an hour? Or, I think we've, or have we flogged it? So we've got another, another five, ten minutes. Five minutes, okay. I just didn't want to. To me, now that I understand what's wrong with me, the mental part is so important. When I finally became willing to try to do something about my problem because I thought I could do something about it, and the AAs told me it was an illness, I started seeking medical help. Of course, it's well known nowadays that if you're have a problem with drugs or alcohol, you go to rehab, right? In the end, I went I went into a medical facility to get um, detoxed, let's say, dried out. And I was convinced that once I was dried out, I wouldn't have to drink again. I was convinced that once I was dried out... Ask? Five minutes of questions. Okay. I was convinced that once I was dried out, I wouldn't have to drink again. Somehow in, inside me, I thought, you know, it was, you know, drinking the day before, maybe drink the day after. I was not clear on this. I really knew nothing about alcoholism. 
or anything, but <laughs> for that matter. But yeah, I went into those facilities. And to my consternation, every time I got out, I drank again. But as I said before, I was totally unconscious of what was happening to me. And I was almost past the point of caring. Um, until I got serious about AA, and that was really just by the grace, and started going to meetings. And um, I was about three months dry, and we had a big book workshop meeting. And I heard on this CD, it was based, it's based around some CD, recorded workshops. And a fellow called Joe H. was telling, telling a part of his story and how he was working with his sponsor. And his sponsor asked him to list down all the crazy things he had done while he was drinking. And I thought that's what it was all about. That's what I thought getting honest was about. <laughs> this is how little I knew. And so he made a list of all the nutty things he'd done when he was drinking. And he'd been in prison nine times and all this stuff. I thought that's what it was all about. That's why he stopped drinking. And his sponsor said, that's all very impressive, but you know the craziest thing you ever did in your drinking? Was well, stone cold sober, you walked out of that prison and straight into a bar. And that really touched me, because in fact, that's what I had done. Stone cold sober, coming out of those medical facilities, stone cold sober, dry, as I, dry, walked out of, after 30, 30 days, after eight days, after however many days, I drank again. And I started waking up and hearing in the rooms, if I'm a real alcoholic, I will drink again. And then I started, to, you know, I started exploring what is the alcoholic mind, which is explained in chapter three, this strange mental twist that precedes the first drink. And my my mind will tell me lies, just to repeat. Um, and that's what keeps me in AA, to keep my head on straight. Um, not that other people can always fix my head, but um, I think we have five minutes for questions now. Yes. So, so I'll repeat the question back if someone has a question about anything to do with powerlessness on manageability, step one. Hi, Ross. And I love what you have to say about uncontrolling people. Because that one is, is tricky at the start. This idea that if I just explain something carefully, sorry. Um, can we unhook this? I'll repeat the question. Well, you, you want to hear the answer? <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, so my my question really was it was about looking at the looking at the disease the disease and the reaction that we have towards alcohol and other compulsive, obsessive areas of our lives that we can So the question is about the impulse which gets us to take the first whatever and how step one can be applied to other areas. I've had to apply step one to all sorts of other areas. A friend of mine says if you have uh, the misfortune to have one addiction with any luck at all you can have five or six. Um, and if you if you have the fortune to stay sober for some time, you may discover all sorts of behavior patterns, even stone cold sober, which will give you enough of a buzz to give you some relief. So it's exactly the same mechanism, as far as I'm concerned, as with alcohol. Uh, when I start... Do I carry on whatever it is, even though it is not in my best interests? And even once I know it's not in my best interests to have the first gamble, to have the first cake, to have the first white sugar, to have the first uh, sexual encounter, whatever it is, does knowledge stop me? 
Or do I make apparently the same mistake again and again and again, knowing even with the track running in your mind, this is a terrible idea, I shouldn't be doing this, why am I doing this, I ought to be able to stop, perhaps I ought to call my sponsor, but oh, I've done it. <laughs> now, if you've ever done that with anything, or whether it's e even the matter of trying to control the lives of the people around you, the question is, uh, there is something that you have not got relief from inside. And I believe there's only one problem. Um, there is, our, our solution involves conscious contact with ourselves, with God and with others. And so our problem is conscious disconnection from ourselves, from God and from others. And the alcoholic or addicted mind will do anything to give you a temporary sense of connection. Until the underlying disconnection is solved, then it's going to pop up everywhere. That's my experience. Hi, my name's Julia. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you guys very much. <clears throat> I'd love it if you could just play the paragraph in italics on page 24, because I've been told this is the death sentence. And a lot of people I know write trigger lists, and I'd like you to comment on what trigger lists and at certain times mean, and can we actually predict when we're going to drink again or not with the obsession? And my experience is that okay, suddenly he told me the lie, you can drink two tonight, and I believed it, and that kept on for five years till I nearly died. The same thing. I can't, I could not see the truth in the thoughts, and, and um, the obsession is so scary to me. And I've been told this is the death sentence. Shall I just read the paragraph first so we're all clear? The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable, comma, at certain times, comma, to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago, we are without defence against the first thing. And I'll, I'll just say briefly my take on this. If we are unable to remember at certain times what drink will do, it means there are times we can remember. And this is why it's so tricky. Uh, day after day, week after week, month after month, you successfully run the tape forward of what would happen if you drink and you don't have a drink and you think, it's fine, I've got it under control. And then suddenly... You fall between the commas, as my sponsor calls it. You have one of the at certain times, and you have a day when you can't remember, and nothing seems to be able to remind you, and you're drunk, or you're in the casino, or you've had the 14th cake. Um, and you can never tell. Those days don't look any different than any other days. You can't tell when they're going to be. Do you have anything on that? Not a lot. All I can say is that I came to AA and I had already lost the power of choice and drink. And they told me, don't ju just don't drink one day at a time. Don't pick up the first drink. It's the first drink that gets you drunk. But I had long since crossed this line. And uh, this is very important to me because, again, once I understood this, it took away the shame. Because when I'm ashamed, I don't ask questions. I don't like to see. I don't like to show people how dumb or stupid or how I don't get it. But once I got this, I understood that this, I really was powerless. I had lost the power of choice. And again, it's almost like, it's a, my drinking, and it was easy, kind of, well, it took a long time, but after 32 years of drinking, I just made a decision, um, I just understood that I had trained myself into this well, it's a compulsive action, but it was almost like an instinct. It was never a well-thought-out decision to pick up. It was, it, but it wasn't a habit either. It had become part of my survival instincts was to pick up a drink. Okay. There was a lady here. Yeah. What would you suggest between that? I should call my sponsor and oh, I did it. <laughs> Um, so the question is, when the impulse starts to arise, what do you do? Unfortunately, this is the bad news, it's too late. 
a couple of weeks earlier when someone said, you might want to write your step four. That's the point at which the action can be taken. When someone says, you might want to make two or three amends a day rather than one a fortnight. That, when, you can, when you're given the instruction, go and take it now and run back to them saying, I've just taken the instruction, where's the next one? If you do that, the impulse will either not arise or when it arises, it will go back down again. But once an impulse beyond my mental control is there, it's too late, so you need to get it earlier. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. We, we, the first session was on what is the problem, and I think we've heard what the problem is now. Um, there isn't a, a, an actual break, but I would suggest everybody stand up, stretch, and in three minutes we start in the next session, which is a 45-minute session before lunch. You can start to smell lunch. Um, and it is what is the solution, which is actually what we're here for. Thank you. I think we'll start off now. Uh, I think my voice may get people to sit down. Um, so by the time by the time I've got step one, the position I'm in is that I get up in the morning and I don't know if I'm going to drink that day, even though I'm going to AA meetings. And if I drink, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come back to AA tomorrow. And I've started to see at this point other people drink and try to come back and not be able to. So everything it says in the book suddenly starts to become crystal clear. This is reality. This is not a theory, as it says later on in the book. Um, however, what I see around me is all sorts of people who are two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years, 40 years uh, sober, who seem to have found a solution to this problem. Now, when I came to AA, I was very much impressed by these remarkable scrolls that you would have on the wall which listed the steps and the traditions. I had no idea they really had anything to do with AA when I first got here. I thought, we're in church basements, there was something to do with the church. And certainly in London, I imagine Switzerland is very similar. Unlike the country in which AA was invented, uh, we're not a religious lot in London, far from it. Uh, there is a lot of hostility towards religion. There is a lot of scepticism about anything spiritual whatsoever. I, I certainly was brought up uh, an atheist. I, I was militantly so. And so when I came to step two, and as I've come to step two repeatedly and in, in increasing depth over the years... In some ways, I've had to sidestep the God question because in a position of someone who has no contact with a power greater than oneself, how could one conceive of what that power might be? I, I, if you've never been to a country, someone's description of it is going to be totally inadequate. You have to go and experience the country to really know what anyone means. Uh, if someone describes alcohol to you and you've never drunk, how would you, you... You couldn't just describe it adequately. You'd have to go and drink to understand it. And I believe it's the same with a power greater than myself. I'd have to experience it to understand it. So step two is not about getting a concept of a power greater than myself first and then taking step two somehow. It's about taking step two, trusting that the process itself will reveal to me the truth of what that power greater than myself is. Which is why we agnostics, uh, which is the chapter of the big book chiefly concerned with step two, although it mentions God and talks about God quite explicitly, the main thrust of its argument is not about God at all. It's about the other people in AA. It's about setting aside everything you think you know about a power greater than yourself, not being deterred by anything you taught as you were growing up, any thoughts or considerations or arguments that have filled your mind. One disregards those, and it, it, it talks about we're sticklers for facts and results. And the facts and the results are these. When I looked around me in AA, there were some people who were dying, there were some people who were frightfully miserable, and then there were some people who seemed to have found a solution not just to 
the fact that they were drinking too much, they were drinking alcoholically, but had solved other problems too. People who uh, were functional in relationships, people who could be in relationships with others, even other people who are very damaged and very distressed and not be damaged and distressed themselves. I mean, that's a major solution. Uh, people who could, as a friend of mine puts it, show up for work and work while they're at work. These are two separate skills. People have solutions. So my question in step two is not, is there a God, where's God, what is God? My question is, these people around me in AA, do I believe them when they say they found a solution? When they talk about how dysfunctional they were, about how they could not help but have the first drink, do I identify with them? If I am now as messed up as they once were, and yet they found a solution, possibly could this work for me as well? That's really what step two is about. Uh, one brief set of ideas about step two. Um, I can see, I could see, when I was new in AA, other people who were new as well, picking up all of the tools laid at their feet, and they were starting to get well, they were starting to pull away from me. It's like when you're running in a race and there are people who are just running ahead of you and you don't know where the energy is coming from. I could see people around me doing things I wasn't doing and they were getting better. They seemed to have an energy and a momentum in their lives and they weren't slipping, <laughs> importantly. I could see the effect of a power working in people's lives. I was already experiencing that in that I, I could go to a meeting and people would talk absolute rubbish for an hour and a half and I would feel miraculously better and I wouldn't know why. And it's not because people were imparting great wisdom which cast my life in a whole new light. No, there was an energy operating in that room. I felt safe, I felt connected, I felt a little less like dying at the end than I had at the beginning. I could feel a power greater than myself operating in my life. I could see very clearly through the actions of other people that... Um, people that prayed, people that meditated, people that took steps four through nine, people that helped others, people that showed up, made tea, did service, seem to access this power. And it's simply a matter of logic. If I can see power operating in people's lives, if I can feel power operating in my life, if I can identify what actions activate that power, the power is real. And there is a source. Now, what that source is, I don't need to know any more than I need to know physics to operate a light switch. So, step two is terribly simple. Step three, I had to recognize, someone said to me once, are you happy? And I said, no. And they said, how long have you tried to find a way to be happy? And I said, my whole life. And they said, when did you think your plan was going to kick in? It hasn't kicked in yet. And my life was about sex, money, power, prestige, comfort, thrills, and appearance. I'll repeat the list. Sex, money, power, prestige, comfort, thrills, and appearance. My life was lived on this basis, and it did not bring happiness. It brought fear that my plan wouldn't work, frustration when it didn't. Disappointment when everything went my way and I still felt empty and lost. And then despair that anything would ever work. But I have no other choice. Step three gives me another choice. Which is very simply at the top of page 63. My concern is to stay close to God and perform his work well. Which is going to mean telling the truth. Listening to other people tell the truth. Talking to God staying quiet for long enough to listen to God talking through me, uh, through my mind, through things I read, through other people, uh, insisting on seeing God in everything, in every experience, insisting on seeing God in every person, even though God may be obscured by all sorts of other stuff, and being grateful. And performing his work well is very simple. Take the other steps. Engage in lots of fellowship, engage in lots of service. And lots of things become none of my business. My business had been chiefly, what do you think about me? 
I would spend my whole life thinking about what other people think about me, speculating, trying to manipulate it. I would spend a lot of time worrying about my identity, who am I, I don't know who I am, listing all the ways in which other people were mistreating me, thinking about my wants, thinking about my needs. To take step three is to make a decision that these are no longer my business, what you think of me is no longer my business, what I think of me is no longer my business, how you act is no longer my business. Uh, what I want is no longer my business. What I need is no longer my business. If I stay glo- co- close to God and perform his work well, I will get everything I need, not just to be okay, but to be sensational. That's been my experience. But the only thing which will bring that about is steps four through nine. I can't click my fingers and find myself back in Kansas. Uh, that's all I've got on steps two and three. I'll hand over to Laura. Thank you. So my experience with steps two and three, <laughs> long and drawn out, but I'm just trying to make a summary. And uh, as Tim mentioned, there's a lot of help in this book. There's a lot of help from, available from other alcoholics. And I wrestled a lot with the God idea. Luckily, a couple of things happened in the early days. I wasn't exactly a militant atheist, but I just had no con- connection with something greater than myself. I, you know, I was confirmed in the Anglican Church when I was 12, but that was had not been a spiritual experience. And you know, I found a lot of, as you say in the big book, I found a lot of the people um, going to church were, you know, I judged them as hypocritical, but I, because I thought they were just there to show off their new clothes. But uh, those those were false ideas inherited from someone else. But once I got step one, see, to me, step two and three fall out, kind of out of step two anyway. <laughs> My willingness to believe in a power greater than myself came out of the desperation I felt when step one finally came. Because step one tells me I'm between a rock and a hard place. I got a body that can't drink. If it does, it could end in death, and it had started to believe me. But I have a head that at certain times will tell me that I can't drink or need to drink or whatever, you know, really between this rock and a hard place that I was feeling very fragile. Up to then, because I didn't know what my illness was, uh, I had been feeling, not, if not talk, talking, a little bit hopeful. But one thing that happened to me in the early days is I, I, I really started listening to people and I realized they used words in different ways. And one day this thought came into my head. It wasn't my own thought. And I think it's a famous expression. I should have looked it up before I got here. But, and it was, the word is not the thing. Like, words are only symbols. And so I applied this to the God of, God word because it was kind of bothering me. And then my friend, with four months dry, more dry time than I had, she tried to get me to conceive, you know, she tried to help me work around this conception of God. She said, you can have God any way you like it. Make a list of all the things you want from your God. And that didn't sit right with me either, you know, because I thought, no, 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 no. It's not up to me to say what God is even though, but, so that happened to me, and then, one Sunday morning in a meeting, I was still very new, and it was a living sober meeting, which never really helped me, but I went to the meetings because, for lack of anything else to do, and to get out of the house where things were crazy, and um, a guy with a lot of years of sobriety who had tried to be kind and helpful to me in those five previous years of coming to me was drunk. He shared in the meeting, he was, he was frustrated by the militant atheists and the naysayers, you know, against the spiritual side of the program. And he happens to be quite religious, but that didn't matter at that point because I was thirsty for an answer. And he just, he almost shrugged his shoulders in the meeting. A very mild-mannered guy, you know. And uh, he said, God is just life. God is just love. And when he said God is just life, that helped me. And the love I couldn't quite connect to yet because I was so 
separated and sick. But the life, God is just like he made it so simple for me, you know. You know, I was able, able to get over a hump there. But if we read step two, it says, Come to believe that power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And every time we talk about step two in meetings around where I am, we end up talking about God. <laughs> or this higher power, or our universal spirit, which, you know, Bill gives us many choices in chapter four, we agnostic. But I do remember, I also have, well, it's not an AA publication, but it's a thing called the Little Red Book, which I don't use a lot. But in the Little Red Book, it says step two is about mental illness. It's about insanity. So I feel I should mention that today because most of the hospitals and clinics I went to, I went to in France where I live, but I did go back home to Canada once for a proper modeled that after the Betty Ford Clinic's rehab in a, in a mental health center outside of Toronto. And there I remember vaguely that they were talking about insanity. And at that time, that was in 2002, there was no way I would believe that I was an insane, insane person. <laughs> you know. And uh, the, the cliche sort of phrase, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I couldn't get that. But mainly it was my pride and my arrogance because I could not admit that that I was doing that, you know. But this thing about, it is about mental insanity as I started out. If I have got step one and I see that my mind, even, even vaguely, because for me it seemed impossible, but I had to believe it was possible because we had some, we had get a lot of visitors in the south of France, and people would come and share about their relapses, and about going out again, you know, from AA. And, uh, that started to, to make me understand that, just because I was sober, <laughs> because I was sober, I may not stay sober, I, I got the gift of desperation, which funnily enough, the initials are G-O-D. We call it um, good orderly direction, gift of desperation. Of course, I was doing all this mind stuff around God, but you know what I had forgotten? I didn't get myself sober. I went to AA after five years of infrequently going there drunk and thinking it was all a bit of a joke that I was an alcoholic. It was only by the grace that I started going regularly going every day, and really kind of, I don't know, oh, you changed me enough that I could start listening. And after about almost 90 days, not quite, I woke up one morning, and after years, I don't have, know how many years, of waking up with my first thought was to replenish the supply I had. Drunk the night before, this day I woke up and something was different. And I didn't feel like drinking. You know? And I've forgotten that when I was doing all this intellectual work around God because I knew that a power greater than myself had lifted the desire to drink. And I have to remind that because I can get all intellectual about step two. But it's really simple, you know? And uh, it can be really simple, especially the first part. As I said, I was blessed with some good mentors and... Um, I tried to choose my own sponsors in the beginning, and uh, it didn't work out really at all. And I got to this big book group, and they were encouraging us two women, we were two women, to find a sponsor. And they were on a bit of a spiritual hilltop at the time. But and we'd say, well, how about this one? Should we ask this one? Should we ask this woman? Because we knew the women had to stick with the women. And these, these people in my group are, well, we're not quite sure she does it by the big book. We're not quite sure. So eventually, one night, they decided to sponsor us. And so, you know, I said, well, I'm pretty sure I've got a good handle on step one. And then I lied without knowing it. I said, um, steps two and three, I think I've been fighting with them for a few years. And you know what they did? They took me by the hand over to the wall where the steps were hanging. And they said, don't 
get hung up about steps two and three. And then he showed me step 12, which actually, which I had been staring at on and off for years. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, and then it hit me. I didn't have to have God <laughs> in step two. I didn't have to have that connection in step three. You know? And, uh, they said step three. They kind of even skipped that step two. And I'm just reading my experience. I guess I should get it off that. Um, step three was a decision to do the rest of the steps. You know, but there's a very clear outline here about how to take step three. And it's from, it's the bit after how it works, up to the step three prayer on page 63. It's very clear. It even says, if we're convinced of the ABCs on page 60, that I'm alcoholic, cannot manage my own life, if I'm convinced that I cannot stay sober on my own power, you know, I'm convinced I need to search for a higher power, I'm at step three, which is that I des decide to turn my will and my life over to God if I understand him, or you don't even understand him. <laughs> just what do I mean by that, and just what do I do? You know, it gives a very good outline, which doesn't in fact tell me what, well, there's one paragraph that tells me what to do. But it gives me a very good outline on what my life looks like run on my best thinking. And I have come to understand that my, my best thinking had gotten me into AA and my life in a mess. Only through the shares of many other alcoholics. You know, and I had started to learn that the problem was me. That was a huge shift in my consciousness. It's from all your shares. You know, because prior to that, I thought the problem was everybody else. <laughs> That's why I was an alcoholic. But I had started to, to learn about that. And actually, Julia asked a question at me in the last session about triggers. I had come to understand that all my triggers were inside me. And that I was the one somewhere that was pushing my own button. Vaguely, vaguely, it's all very vague. You know, I didn't really get that in step, four, step four. Step three, I had to make a decision to uh, stop stop doing it my way, basically. Stop doing it my way and do it this way. And my, you know, I really didn't have any other, I didn't have a better way of doing it. And as I said, I was in a very strong group, and they seemed to have found a solution. And it was a question of trust. You know, and by then I was, I don't know, eight or nine months dry, and I had started to learn to trust the AAs because I did realize that I actually knew nothing about getting sober or staying sober. And, you know, it was something to hang on to, even though I was dry. So step three is a decision. They told me, this is a decision to do the rest of the steps and see if you can get connected to your own higher power. I thought, well, that sounds good. But here, here it just says on the bottom of 62, and I feel this is where the, this is the actual instruction. Please, step three is the, the decision before the prayer. A lot of people think it's just, I take step three by take, doing a prayer, but on the bottom of 62, it says, this is the how and why of it. How I do step three and why. First of all, I have to quit playing God, running on cell phone. Why it doesn't work. And that made step three a lot easier for me too. Is that, uh, I didn't have to know what God was. I just had to know that, uh, my life, run on my best thinking, didn't work. And that I had to find a better way to live. I'll stop there. So step four. People get very frightened of step four. There are only three things I'm concerned about in step four. How I think, how I feel, how I act. Now, I was there, so I already know. My day is already full of what I think, how I feel, and how I act. It's not like you're going to discover anything that isn't there already in front of your face the whole time. It's just a matter of writing down what is already there in front of your face. 
Um, there are four inventories in step four. Um, three are explicit uh, in uh, the chapter how it works. The fourth one is implied on the top of uh, uh, page 76 where it talks about in step eight, we made a list of the people we harmed when we took inventory in step four. And that'll be, that's a, I'll take it from the back, that's a fairly simple one. It's just running through my mind, who do I feel guilty about that I've done something that's, that's hurt them or upset them? Very simple list. And the, the sex inventory is a very simple list. It's got some very straightforward questions. List the people you've had relationships with and ask, where were you selfish, where were you dishonest, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and again, that's fairly straightforward, very repetitive. The two gold mine inventories are the resentment inventory and the fear inventory. And the resentment inventory starts from the bottom of 64. And if you're an alcoholic like me, you're very, very aware of how you feel. You're not very aware of how anyone else feels, but you're very aware of how you feel. Uh, and if anyone asks you, boy, will you tell them <laughs> at huge length. Um, the reason the resentment inventory is genius is because it starts with how you feel and it gives you nine words which pretty much cover everything I've ever felt, uh, certainly up until coming into AA. It's a, it talks about resentment, anger, hurt, threatened, sore, burned up, injuries, grudge, where we interfered with. These are nine ways in. So my starting point in the resentment inventory is all of those things, wherever I'm hurt or upset or blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for who, who's to blame, which is marvelous. You start off with where you are. It's not very spiritual, apparently, but it really is. Uh, I make a list of all the people and situations that are to blame for why I'm so unhappy. Then I state very clearly, no essays, why? What did they do? What did they not do? What did they say? What did they not say? And then I'm looking for what area of self is affected. Does it affect their, what they think about me? Is what they have, has what they have done changed their perception of me? Uh, I'm always worried about what other people think. And if something affects my pride, it's because I think they're, you know, I want them to think I'm amazing and talented and exceptional. They think I'm a schmuck. Pride. Self-esteem, when I fail at something, when I can't meet my own ambitions. Personal relations, if I have a plan for you and you don't follow the plan, it's affecting my personal relations. Ambitions and security are, are pretty clear. If something is getting in my way of all of my dreams, if something is getting in the way of my basic needs, in order to be okay. And I get to write this out, I just get to tell the truth. The person, what they did wrong and which area it affects. And then the real work begins with a sponsor. And we get to look at what the truth is. And the truth is I've never seen reality as it is. What I will do, I will pick out tiny little fragments of reality. And then I will build on top of that all sorts of speculation. You know you're engaged in speculation if you think about the future or the contents of other, other people's minds. <laughs> That's called speculation. None of us are mind readers. None of us are prophetic. Interpretation. If you have tried to work out what someone else's actions mean, what did she really mean when she said that? What did she really mean when she did that? Interpretation. Generalization. She always, well, perhaps she did it once, perhaps she did it twice. With the help of a sponsor, I peeled away the interpretation, the generalization, the speculation to what the truth of the situation was. And then my sponsor got me to show, to look at what was behind, what was behind their action. When, even when people are behaving badly, when I behave badly, I'm acting out of fear. When I steal, it's because I don't think there is enough for me, so I need to take what is there. When I'm mean to people, I feel that my self-esteem is threatened, and I need to put you down so that I feel okay. When other people behave badly, they're acting out of fear, and I got to ask myself, what have I ever had the fear that might be prompting their activity? And when I can identify with other people, it's very difficult to judge them. 
if I'm going to get comfortable with the world, I need to look at all of the demands that I'm placing on the world. And I thought the world was doing all of these terrible things to me. What it was doing was failing to meet my expectations and failing to meet my demands. If I can stop demanding, if I can stop expecting, there is nothing there to hurt. And I don't know. I don't know I have demands and expectations until I suddenly realize you're not behaving right and I need to point it out. So step four is the catalog, ultimately, of how I am making... I'm putting you in charge of my emotions by running with a set of demands and expectations I ha I I'm not even aware of. I don't tell you they're even there. I just know I'm suddenly upset. And what this means is that you're in charge of how I feel. How you act di dictates how I feel. And I wanted to be free. And I needed to forgive everybody for everything. And the only way to do that was to recognize that they are not harming me. They're harming my plans. And my plans never worked anyway. So I went through my life upset that my plan, which doesn't work, wasn't coming off. And I was blaming you. And I look at the times that all my plan did come off and I still wasn't happy. I still wasn't satisfied. I still wanted more and nothing was ever enough. And the insanity of having plans which don't work and being upset because other people won't fulfill them. And the prayer, the real work of step four is the prayer on the top of 67 when I say this is a sick man or this is a sick woman. Or this person is just be it. They're just doing what they're doing. Running through the world frightened, trying to get their own way. Just like me, how can I be helpful? God save me from being angry because I'm the one in trouble. Thy will be done. The fear inventory. Um, I'm only ever frightened because I don't think I'm going to get my own way. Very simple. The solution to fear, it says on page 68, uh, we're in the world to play the role that God gives us. I can't find the line, so that's a paraphrase. There we go. We're in the world to play the role here, role here signs just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? Um, when my life is based on my plans, sex, money, power, prestige, comfort, thrills and appearance, those things are not under my control. They're dependent on you behaving a certain way for me to get those things. And I'm going to be frightened. This is why self-reliance fails me. Because my plans can never come off when they do their disappoint. The solution is to have a plan for life which resides inside me. And what I can say, and this is the solution to fear in any situation, I've got to deal with God. I say to God, you're going to look after me because I can't do it. Instead, I'm going to say to you, what's my role in this situation? Give me three adjectives to work with. So I go into a situation, what do I have to, what did I have to be this morning? I have to be truthful. I have to be concise. I have to be cheerful. No one wants a message from a misery. <laughs> this, is, this is what my job was today. And I say to God, will you look after me if I try and spend the day being truthful, concise and cheerful? Now, the first time you try this, it's a bit, bit shaky because you, 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 you've never put your weight on it before. Once you've spent a few, di even a few minutes of doing that, you start to see this is working. Has anything bad happened to me today? No. Is anything bad happening to me right now? No. The bad things are not right now. They're my mental worlds I go into where I'm desperately worried about the future. That's where the badness lies. It doesn't lie in the reality around me. To get out of fear, I need to get out of those mental worlds and come back to right now, God, help me be truthful, help me be cheerful, and help me be concise. And with that last adjective in mind, I'm going to hand over to Laura. Yeah, step four. Tim covered it pretty well. My experience with step four, yes, is uh, I had been uh, taught to be afraid of step four and that I was going to discover all these unknown things about myself. But as it says on page 64 in the introduction to step four, it, it compares step four to a commercial inventory. I love this paragraph because it 
it gets me into um, a little bit of an objective mind frame. Because up to then, my life had been all about me and very subjective. And I couldn't stand back from it. And it actually was, I had learned a little kind bit thanks to uh, al -Anon. I had gone to a few al meetings in the early days. And every Monday they did a thing on detachment. So little by little I had to learn to step back from my own life. But step four is the greatest godsend. I can't separate it from these 12 steps because they're an integral package. But step four for me, who I started pointing the finger out there as soon as my younger brother was born. <laughs> when I was two, I started blaming others. Maybe for that. This was such an eye opener. This changed my life, of course, with the step five. I just step four and five together. And I think all the inventories are important. But they start with the easy one, which is resentment. And I had been told in Vienna that I was a very angry person. And I didn't believe them. <laughs> but I was an angry person. I grew up in an angry household, alcoholic household. I was an angry person. And uh And step four was so easy, but I had to complicate it for a little while. You know, I sat down with my sponsor. We went quickly through step three. And uh, he just wrote out the form. He basically wrote out a format in a notebook. It was a notebook. Keep all the pages together. If I give alcoholics pages of sheets of paper, they mix them all up. I even, get, I even wrote out. Anyway, I did this once to a person. She ripped them out of the book and then mixed them all up. So that the resentment was mixed with the sex and, and yeah. but we use a notebook and uh, it's great. But I follow this example and I tried to complicate it because I was listening in a gray group to um, Joe H and there was a workbook with that study and he had a little more advanced, complicated method of doing step four. And I've never, still never done it that way, but I set out to try because I knew, I knew sort of, or I was sure in here that step four was the key and I had to do it third. And so because of this overcomplicating things, my sponsor was waiting, waiting, waiting. How are you coming on step four? And after a few weeks, she said, why don't you just bring in what you have and we'll have a look at it. And of course, I had this list in the... Anyway, it was, and he said, oh, I, I don't even remember how many people on it I had, maybe 40. It's not that many. But all the people who were close to me, really, and the, some people I, like my divorce lawyer and things in, in the recent past. And he said, are you resentful against every single one of these people in here? And I said, no. Who are they? Well, there's a lot in my family. You're resentful against everyone in your family? I said, no. Well, what are they doing there? And I said, well, I'm getting ready for step nine. <laughs> Trying to be the star student. He goes, this isn't about step nine. This is step four. So he brought me back to reality. And uh, he said, listen, just do the top ten resentments. He said, you know when your last drink was. You don't know when your next drink is. And resentment is the number one offender. And I knew that because my last thing had been on the basis of resentment or slightly. So I chose ten people and did three resentments against each one, I think. But I'd had I'd had um a little God shot before that. I was actually on my way to get the instructions for step four from my sponsor. Five minute walk down to the cafe where we were meeting. I had this rolling over in my head because I'd heard over years in an A, what was my part in it? What was my part? And God said to me, God, whatever, this voice said to me, what was my part in the situation? Or what was my part in the resentment? And in that moment, I knew the resentment was 100% mine. 
just like those triggers, which I picked up. But that, you know, that didn't come from me. And this was before. And so I got real curious as to know where this resentment, what part of me this resentment was coming from. But, but in that moment, I had started to own my own anger. Because up to then, I thought it was this uncontrollable emotion that, you know, came out, or resentment. You hear about them in AA, and they, you pick them up. You go through life and you pick up resentment. You know, but in that moment, I knew they came, they arise out of ourselves, just like it says in the book. But anyway, so it was very simple. I was told to keep the, um, the cause here, what people had done, hadn't done, to, I had a maximum of 19 words, which is so good. No novel, no storytelling, because like Tim, I can, I can write you a film about what happened. And I can attach different resentments together, and then attach them to other people. It is how we keep it, you know. Very simple and very clear. And the four step resentment part, that's so important. At first, I had a hard time with thinking other people were sick because I felt it was condescending because I felt so sick myself. But then I realized it was like me. They are sick like me. And I've come to realize that, that, you know, a lot of people out there, well, everybody, has in more or less measure the same character defects I do. You know, this helped me become human, this program. Because I could admit to having the same character defects that I've pointed out in everyone else all my life. They have the same character defects I do. Whatever they do about it is their business. Mine made me drink, basically. And, uh, but this is the thing. I have to remember, when I'm the one in trouble, I have to pray for me. <laughs> God saved me from being angry. I pray for other people, but in another context. I don't just pray for the other guy to get well so that he can, he or she can stop bothering me. I hear that a lot in AA, and it's in one of the stories. Oh, well, if you have a resentment, just pray for the other person for two weeks. Maybe that works for some people, but I have to take my inventory and pray for my own character defects to be taken away. Because they're the ones that are creating resentment in the first place. You know, and uh, following instructions, following instructions, I understood. You know, after re resentment prayer, we avoid retaliation or argument, etc., etc., etc. I have to, I have to follow this instruction for the rest of my life as best as I can. But I mean, really, it's not just whilst I'm doing step four. Um, fear, definitely. My fear, my fear inventory was really short and sweet. Just the two questions, it can be done in four columns. But the two columns, what am I afraid of? Why do I have this fear? And when, when it was deconstructed, it was, what are you afraid of? And who's going to get hurt? And the answer to who's going to get hurt was always me, 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 me. And it took me right back to the very first things I heard in AA. My problem was I, self, and me. And it really underlined the the... The key before step three, selfishness, self-centeredness, is the root of my trouble. You know? And it, you know. Yeah, that was the fear inventory. That was the step four. I realized all my fears were about me. I never wrote one, one fear about anyone else, not even my daughter, that I love so much. <laughs> you know? It was all my fears were about me. It's kind of set up that way, so you can get trapped, but... Don't try to avoid it. The response will find a way of showing you that it's about you. The sex inventory, I understood. I heard this before I even did it. It wasn't about the sex. It was about the way I treated other people. That, you know, I was supposed to love or, you know, be in a special relationship. And I found out in that sex inventory, they don't even get me, give me a chance in that inventory to complain about the other guy. <laughs> it's really about how I treated them, you know, and uh, how I showed up in those places. And it was a, it was a real pleasure. So I'll stop there for overtime.
Thank you both of you. We've, we've covered this morning what is the problem and what is the solution, how it works. And this afternoon we're going into, into action, uh, two sessions, action and more action. <laughs> but we're also introduced, and um, the first session after lunch will be small group facilitated discussions. So we haven't given you much of a uh, chance to talk this morning or ask questions. Remember there's the... Um, how, what, what's it called? The ask it basket at the back. If you want more questions on anything that you've heard, put it in the ask it basket. There's a session tomorrow morning. But the small group facilitated discussions will be your chance in smaller groups to, to have more interaction, more participation. So thank you both. Um, remember there are books. Um, both of you have mentioned Al-Anon and detachment. I think we've got some uh, leaflets on detachment. Um, one, of the, one of the messages in, uh, in Al-Anon is, without help, living with an alcoholic is too much for anyone. And that would apply to recovering alcoholics. You're living with other alcoholics. So pretty, pretty much anybody could be in Al-Anon. Um, there's literature at the back there which gives the slant to the 12 steps um, from people... Um, living with or having lived with um, people suffering from alcoholism. So it's just another aspect of the 12 Steps program, fellowship. Um, lunch, thanks to Patrick and his willing helpers, uh, is now outside. And we start again at 2 o'clock with the small group. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back, everyone. My name's Tim and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tim. Well done, those of you who are still awake, still alive. Um, so, step five. Um, I've taken step five a number of times. Some people have the, had the experience that they've only needed to go through the first nine steps once, and that's fine. Uh, footnote, we all get to have different experiences in AA. Uh, no one has to explain their experience. <laughs> Just have to say what our experience is. And if your experience is different than mine, that's fine. doesn't mean someone's right and someone's wrong. It just means you have your experience, I have mine. My experience is that I've had to do step five more than once. Um... I did step five when I was um, a few months sober back in 1994. But um, I build up clutter in my mind over the course of the year. I'm going to do a bunch of things I'm not very proud of. Um, over the years, over the last 20 years, my life has got bigger and bigger and bigger. And let's go back to the first time, though. My first step five wasn't a big deal. I had, as I said earlier, I had five sheets of paper. And all I had to do, my only job in my step five, was to say what was on the pieces of paper. And there were all sorts of terrible things that had happened to me uh, in my life, which I got to talk about. There were all sorts of terrible things I've done, some of them in response to the terrible things that have been done to me, sometimes off my own bat. And what was amazing about my step five, the actual process was very simple, you just talk. What was amazing to me was that the man in front of me uh, was unimpressed by the whole thing. <laughs> He wasn't shocked. He wasn't disturbed. And you see, I told parts of my story to helping professionals. Now, when you tell your story to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist looks troubled, and they start immediately writing notes and making recommendations, you know you're in serious trouble. <laughs> so you have to start to backpedal and uh, minimize before more drastic action than you had anticipated is taken. Um, so with my behavior when I was sober, before I ever drank, and certainly with my behavior once I was drinking, 
I got perilously close to having more supervision by the authorities than I wanted. So I would find ways, as soon as I was getting anywhere near the, near the truth, of pulling back and, as I say, minimizing. Now, with this bloke, I could absolutely let go. I could tell him absolutely anything, and he would look slightly bored. He would look out of the window. He'd stop me mid-sentence to ask if I wanted another cup of tea. <laughs> and at the end of it, he said, Do you want pizza? <laughs> now, this didn't solve my problems, because we don't solve each other's problems. Um, if I ever, by the way, try to solve any of your problems, please just back away slowly. <laughs> um, don't let me near you. I told the truth and had someone else hear it without any kind of judgment. And that did a lot. It, it put my problems into perspective. Um, in step six and seven, um, I'm not a big 12 and 12 person. The 12 and 12, in case you don't know, is the affectionate name for the book, The Twelve Steps and the Twelve Traditions. And there's lot, there are lots of amazing, amazing things in there, which I just think are wonderful, and which I don't think we, we read it nearly enough. The stuff in Step 12 is gold dust. Um, but the stuff in Step 6 and 7, I've tried to, I've tried to make it help me, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, I like what's in the big book. Which is, I have my big book. I don't have it memorized, but that's fine because that's why they wrote it down so I don't have to have it memorized. <laughs> we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. As we now, are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take all of them, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. Um, already that's almost too complicated for me. The way I view step six is this. It's terribly simple. Um... This is the question in step six. Do you want to stay like this? Do you want to remain this unhappy for the rest of your life? And there are only two answers, just to make things even simpler. Yes or no. <laughs> if the answer is, no, I don't want to stay like this, then everything is up for grabs. And just to ring fence what everything means, anything I think or anything I do, those are the only two levers that can be pulled in my life. I've spent my whole life trying to pull the lever called my emotions, trying to directly affect my emotions with people, with drugs, with alcohol with circumstances, with money, with sex, thinking, if only I can get the combination right, I will change how I feel. And the truth is, if I want to change how I feel, I, my thinking needs to change and my actions need to change. Now, the funny thing is, my actions can't change unless my thinking, at some level, changes. So the only problem I ever really have is my thinking. So when I say to God, I don't want to stay like this, what I'm really saying is I'm willing to have every single attitude in me changed. I'm willing to have every single behavior pattern changed. I'm willing to have every single thinking pattern changed. Now, this seems very frightening until you realize that your thinking patterns, your attitudes, and your behavior are not you. And this is what I got out of step five. I said everything that went on, and I realized that everything I had been describing was not me. I was, all my thinking patterns have been taught to me, all my behavior patterns have been taught to me, they're not me. So I can get rid of all of those without changing who I am. Because there's nothing wrong with who I am, it's the tools I've been using which are wrong. So, and I'm perfectly happy, it talks in, we agnostics, that we're, 
We're perfectly happy to get rid of an old gadget which doesn't work and replace it with a new one. And my thinking, my attitudes and my behaviour are just old gadgets, so I don't need to hold on to them any more than I would a radio which doesn't work, or a computer which doesn't work, or a car that doesn't go into reverse. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. The other thing that I love about this, it's we let God remove from us. So I don't have to do, I don't have to make change. <laughs> Which is really, because how would you even do that? I have to be willing for the change to happen, but I don't have to make the change. What I do have left is uh, five steps. If I want my thinking to be changed, if I want my behavior to be changed, I have five other steps which will do it, which we're going to talk about a little later. But my, my step seven is effectively to say to a power greater than myself, um, show me a different path to walk down mentally and in action. And that is it. Then the other, the other five steps will flesh out the detail of what that path is. That's what I've got in those three steps. And now, Laura. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> yeah, these three steps, things started to change for me here, too. My step five wasn't as nearly as scary as I thought it would be, but uh, I showed up at my sponsor on the appointed day with my step four in my hand. I re can't remember how many pages of my hiatus wheel were filled out, but not too many. And all I did was read it. Um, I do. I I listen to step five basically the way my sponsor did with me, and that is we go over the first. We share the reading of the first few pages of this chapter into action, and then we get to uh, 75 where it says we pocket our pride and go to it. And that's what I did. And my sponsor didn't say very much. <clears throat> I tried to be as honest as possible. There was the question at the end: Had I left out any secret that I would had vowed to take to the grave? And sometimes we do that. Uh, in our group, sometimes we do that at the beginning. And I really didn't believe I'd left anything out. But my sponsor had to clarify a few things in column four. I tried to be very column four as laid out in this book, which is not even a column, but anyway. But my character defects, which are listed on page 67. Selfish, self-seeking, uh, self dishonest, fearful, and my sponsor had added one which isn't in black and white in here, but it was called Plain God. <laughs> he said, you know, if you have a resentment, especially in resentments, if you had a resentment against someone, you couldn't put your finger on what your defect was, he said, put Plain God, and we'll talk about it later. Well, that's, uh, that's that comes under the third step. <laughs> you know, it said we had to quit playing God, but at the time I didn't understand. And I found out I had been playing a God, uh, God a lot in my life. And I tried to make sure my effort at being thorough was to look for those things everywhere, and I found them everywhere. All the character defects, everywhere, you know. But he listened, and the one thing I could not bring myself to write on paper on my step four was the dishonesty. Because I couldn't see it in myself. I, you know, I've been lying to myself for so long. And my sponsor helped clarify that. Every time it called for dishonesty, I wrote down delusion. <laughs> You know, and uh, after that step five, I was able to see my own dishonesty. You know, and later on, I realized it was my own ego trying to save. I thought I had thought I'd been trying to save face with other people all my life. I've been trying to save face with myself. My own ego was trying to protect itself, which joke was on it or me because I was still attached to my ego. But step five, uh, you know, it's a little more than a confession for me. Um, to me, this program is all about humility, because I do have an illness of the ego. It's about humility, and it was by grace I got the humility to even be able to go through these the first time. You know, But step five had a lot to do with it. 
have a lot to do with it. But once I had done my step five, you know, my sponsor wasn't too impressed. My sponsor also, maybe because he was a young man, maybe he thought it, I don't know. But he was kind enough to share a bit of his own experience and let me know that he had done some of the same things, had some of the same things, you know. I don't know if it was necessary, but that's the way it happened. And I tried to do that too a little bit, but not trying to fix people, just to keep us on the same wavelength. And uh, then I was told to go home, take this book down from the shelf, because that's the last, that's the part of this instructions for step five, you go by the book, and sit quietly for an hour, which is what I did. And I felt so bad about seeing myself for what I really was, self or self-seeking, dishonest, or all that stuff. You know, I could have gone one of two ways. I didn't feel like taking a drink. But I did feel like uh, changing my life, which I had already got the idea in step three that maybe with this program my life would change. And I'd heard often enough that it's not me that's going to change my life. So I was to go home, sit for an hour, carefully considering these things. If I had left anything out of my step five to ring my sponsor right away, I didn't think I'd left anything out, so I proceeded to um, step six and seven that very evening. And it's very clear, step six, I don't want to really bore you with repetition. But it's so simple. My brand sponsor says, read the black bits. Don't read between them. Don't overcomplicate it. It really is just read what it says, the black part, not the stuff in between. You know? And I have, and I'm going to share this not to be judgmental, but I've learned just as much in meetings from things that aren't in this book or people that may not be working the program, as I have for, from people who are doing it <laughs> in a way that works for me. And I've I heard for years on and off people seemingly stuck on six and seven for years, for years. Now I know they were probably bothered. But very often I hear people on step six, uh, they're looking for their character defects. They use step six to look for their character defects, the things that they have admitted. But this says the things I have admitted are objectionable. So luckily, doing, and I'm not trying to sell this really, I know I know it worked for me. I understood through step four and mainly five, the face, face with another alcoholic with something greater than ourselves in the room, I understood that those things were objectionable. And I understood that my character defects were linked directly to whether I would drink again or not. You know, I just knew that in my gut. So step, step six. And for, for a couple of years to myself, I called this a baby step. Maybe it is a baby step. <laughs> because, of course, the Oxford group had, had uh, five or six steps, you know, half the number we have, where, where AA came from. But it is an important step. I mean, if you're not ready, you're not ready. But so luckily, luckily, luckily I was, you know, I figure I drank enough for 10 lifetimes. <laughs> and I hope uh, I never forget that. So I proceeded to step seven, which is a simple prayer. And, and I'm talking about the first time I went through this, and I haven't, you know, really done it again, I, except I do it on a continuous basis. I have to do this on a continuous basis. Remind myself who I am and who is in charge. <clears throat> but you know, I don't just, so step seven is on 76. And uh, on our program today, we have into action and then more action, but this is an amazing chapter, into action. It's not into thinking, into talking, it's not even into meditating, which seems to be a favorite activity amongst us. But, uh, and this really accelerates. We've got four steps on this, you know, four, three and a half steps on this page. 
And seven is a simple prayer. You know, my creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. You know, I can't just give the bad parts to God and then go my own way with what I think is good. Because remember, I asked, I promised in step three, that God would take what was left of me and build with me and do with me as he would, you know. Every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. So I'm asking God to remove the defects. That means I leave it up to God for whatever power there is. I just use God because it's a short, simple word. Um, it's up to this power greater than myself which defects will be removed and when. But sometimes God can use my character. You know, and that's another process of letting go. I found in a lot... This is a big process of letting go. Letting go. I had to learn how to let go. And of course, grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. I need to pray for strength a lot. Often, I mean. And then I've completed step seven. It doesn't take a long time. Once I'm ready, it doesn't take a long time. And then we're going to do eight and nine, right? Um, then I have, oh, it was pointed out to me, and it's just a way of reading this, that step seven, if you'll notice, it ends with a, the word amen. It was pointed out to me that step three plus step seven, they can be taken together as one prayer. But they have this interlude, you know, of steps four, five, and six, especially the first time through, but any time, you know, I'm asking God to remove me of the bondage of self in step three, but it doesn't have to happen overnight. Now, I've got to put in some of the footwork. I've got to see where bondage of self is causing me trouble and people around me. I started to care about the people around me and the trouble I caused them. You know, and this is the continuation now that I've done my part. So in step three, I ask God to do his part, and I do some of my part, and I come back to, come back to God. So, this really isn't as complicated as we make it. But all I know is I needed to do this, uh, with a sponsor. You know, had I done it, tried to do it on my own, I don't think it would have worked. I can't really say because I didn't try to do it that way. I tried not to do it on my own, but, uh, you know, I need AA and I need to be surrounded by people who are uh, doing the same kind of things. So thank you for being here. She's good, isn't she? Um... Steps eight and nine. I was just looking at the French edition here, and sometimes people get very hung up on particular words. Uh, and I was noticing in step eight, uh, in the French edition, it says toutes les personnes que nous avions lésé. And later on it says toutes les personnes que nous avions uh, offensé, and then que nous avions blessé. <laughs> so it uses three, it uses three different words. Um, and I tried for a long time to analyze intellectually what does harm mean and what I do when I take step eight now in any form and this is slightly heretical because it's not quite in the book so if you only want to, want to do what is in the book then get some cheese and st stuff the cheese in your ears right now for the next five minutes um, the way I do step eight is uh, I do three columns and in the first column I write what action I took and in the second column, I write what action I should have taken instead. And in the third column, I write who suffered and how. And the reason I find this helpful, um, if you grew up in a family like you, like mine, you, you'll have been told that all sorts of things were your fault, which weren't your fault. You'll grow up with all sorts of... Um, guilt and shame for things which were actually other people's stuff. And I needed to do a really clear step eight where 
Um, there were there, there been actions I've taken in my life where other people have suffered as a result, but I don't I don't own a man because it was the right thing to do. And this method of step eight clears out all of those situations, all of those situations where you do the right thing and temporarily someone else is going to be upset. I mean, a silly example, this isn't something that would end up on my step eight, but I, I have to mark exams and I, I, my job is to fail people their university degrees where necessary. And I have to make the final decision. If I make the final decision that someone gets 45%, that's the end of their degree. Uh, now, people are very upset about this and, you know, make threats and whatever. They're very, very angry. Now, just because I've upset someone doesn't mean that I've done the wrong thing. There are times I've had to let people go out of my life because I don't want to watch them die anymore. And they hate me. There are, there are times I've had to tell the truth and people hate me. So just because someone else is furious or weeping does not mean I've harmed them because the alternative may have been worse. So that's why I'm very clear in step eight. What did I do? What should I have done instead? And only if there is a gap between the two do I answer the third question, who suffered? And this is this has made things very clear for me. In step nine, um one of my difficulties over the years, and this is a big debate in AA. Uh, is what does it mean when it says we make amends to those we have harmed except when to do so would injure them or others? Because there are very different schools of thought and there are certain amends where I've gone to different people and I've got different feedback back on whether I should make amends, whether I shouldn't make, shouldn't make amends. And my first time round, as I say, wonderful people, but... They were very conservative about making amends, so there were all sorts of situations where I didn't go back to the person, I didn't go and have the conversation. And what I've done over the last few years is I've used what's in the book, and it's made things a lot clearer. And when I read pages 76 to 83, it gives lots of examples of how to make amends and when to make amends and when not to make amends. And there are three principles which are in there, which can be summarized under the heading, except when to do so would injure them or others. The first one, it talks about our, our main purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to others. And linked to this is this idea we don't want to be hasty and foolish martyrs. Um, the second one, it talks about not revealing, essentially not revealing new information. So the example is that the wife that uh, knows one has been unfaithful but doesn't know the details. And should we convey all of the gory details? And the book says, not always. <laughs> uh, and the third thing is it's very clear we don't involve other people. So those are the principles I take into making amends. Um, I don't reveal new information. I don't, and I, I've had experience of people making amends to me and they start the amend off with, I've hated you for many years. And, okay, now, I'm so pleased you've got over that and you've now forgiven me, but I really didn't need to know. I didn't need to know the depth of your feeling. And, I, and if you've done mean stuff, I don't want to know why. I don't want to know your mental backstory or all the motivations. I don't care. Just sorry, I shouldn't have done it, and then we're happy. Fine, we can go on. So, new information, be very careful. The don't involve other people. Absolutely. Uh, that should be very clear. But the, I need to fit myself to be of maximum service. Uh, there was one place uh, that I stole from when I was drinking, and my father had got me the job there. And the decision was made that, that there was no way the place could have uh, known that I was stealing tips. I was waiting. They couldn't have known I was stealing tips. Um, the last thing that would have helped anyone's relationship, it wouldn't have helped my relationship with the institution that I worked for, it wouldn't have helped their relationship with my parents, with my father was the mayor of the town in question. Um, if I'd revealed this, no, one, no one's life would have been improved. I would have undertaken a heroic act and got egg on my face. Now, the money wasn't mine and I needed to give it back and I found a way of returning the money. 
um, but I'm not one for heroic gestures. On the other hand, um, I hear an awful lot in AA, don't go back to ex-partners, you've heard them enough already, and they don't want the past being raked up. I'm afraid the whole principle behind making amends is raking up the past. Uh, it is, by nature, going back to people who've suffered. Now, the truth is, if they're over it, you can't hurt them. If they're not over it, all you can bring up is pain that is still there, working 100% of the time below the surface. When I'm not healed of something, it's a mechanism operating in me, dictating and con conditioning my behavior the whole time. When I make amends, all I am saying is I was wrong. I shouldn't have taken the action that I took. I regret the harm that it caused. I've never, and as I, as I say, people made amends to me for stuff where I was still hurting. I had never been harmed by someone saying I was wrong. And so if you're balking on an amend, ask yourself, have you ever been harmed by someone else admitting that they were wrong and regretting the pain that you're going through? And I can't think of a situation where, when the tables are turned, the book tells me to turn the tables, turn, look at it from the other person's point of view, put yourself in their shoes. And when I've suffered at someone else's hands, those are the only two things I want to hear. I shouldn't have done that, and I'm sorry you suffered, and then we can be friends. That's all. And so, I did go back to all the exes. Uh, that I was told or suggested not to go back to. And this was now years later. And the funny thing is, with every single one, um, they tell you things that no one else can tell you because no one else was there. People say the past can't be changed. That's true. But the past, in as far as it is alive in me today, is my perception of what happened. If my perception of what happened can be changed, well, the past can be changed. The past, as it lives in me, can be changed. And two stories in particular about amends. Um, there was a relationship I had when I was 14 to 18 with someone who was older. It started off as an abusive relationship with me. The other person had the power in the relationship. It started off very abusively. There was lots of mental torture, effectively. Um, in the last year of the relationship, I turned the tables and did everything I could to destroy this person. Now, what he did in that relationship was unconscionable. But that doesn't make what I did back right. Um... Almost everyone in recovery told me not to approach this person. This is someone who has form as well, who has damaged a lot of other people, that some of whom I've been close to. So this is someone that everyone agrees is not, uh, not, a, not a healthy person. But he didn't present a physical threat to me, you know, at the age of 30-something. Um, when they do, you know... Amends can be made over the phone or with someone um, watching carefully so that you can, you can be safe. But I had a conversation where I didn't mention anything that he had done wrong. I didn't wreck any of that up. I just said, look, in the last year of the relationship, I did this, this, this. I did, I did, you know what I did. But this is the thing. You're only telling them what they know. It's not like you're going to surprise them because they were there. So I talked about how um, I tried to turn other people against him, ruin his reputation, ostracize him. And I said I regretted deeply what I did. Now, I've been told my whole life, oh, Tim, we love you, and we're one of God's children, and blah, blah, blah. I never believed any of it. I mean, I believed it intellectually as an intellectual proposition, but I never believed it at gut level. And what this bloke said to me was we loved and hated each other in equal measure. 
Now, I knew he had hated me, but I hadn't realized that he had continued loving me at some level despite all the torture, emotional and mental torture. I didn't realize that everything I did in retaliation had not affected or damaged or dampened that. Now, somehow this taught me at some level that whatever I do, I, there is nothing I can do to stop you loving me. And this is why I can harm people. If, when I harm you, you stop loving me, that would be the end of the problem, but it's not. And this is the God residing in everyone. Um, I'm just going to tell a little um, diversionary story. Um, and I get this from a friend of mine in recovery. He talks about, I'm not very religious myself, he happens to be, and this is a religious story. So, again, if this bothers you, just put cheese in your ears for the next five minutes. Um, he talks about the burning bush in the Bible. So Moses is walking along, he sees this bush burning, and, you know, as you would, you start talking to the bush. Um, now, this may not be odd for any of you, I, but the odd bit is when the bush starts talking back. And he, sa- he realizes that there is something supernatural going on here, and so he asks the voice in the bush, who are you? What's your name? And what he's expecting is a name. And in religions of the time, if you knew God's name and invoked God's name and sacrificed a goat, then you could get that God to do whatever you wanted that God to do. So it was transactional. And he said to this voice, what are you? What is your name? And the voice said, well, literally in Hebrew, it's I am who am. Now, that gets translated in traditional texts as, I am that which has always been and will always be. Now, I don't connect to either the the short form or the traditional translation. There is a modern translation of this. So this is God speaking to man and saying, no matter what you do, I will never let you go. And I can relate to that as an idea of a power greater than myself. And what I understood from making amends with the people I've harmed, no matter what I did, in their hearts they never let me go. Another amend, I was unfaithful to someone and hurt him very badly. And then we broke up. And when he, when we broke up, he said to me, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And so, of course, everyone said, don't go back, don't go back, okay. Um, I found him. Uh, I've been looking for him variously over the years, but I only found a contact address. The moment I was doing my step eight, suddenly I looked again and he was there on the internet. So I found him and I wrote to him and I apologized. I was a neurotic wreck in the relationship. I was, I was manipulative and abusive and, and, I was unfaithful, and I admitted it, and we broke up. Um, So I made amends for this, and I've been taught to say in amends, uh, is there anything else I've done that has harmed you that I haven't mentioned? And he said, oh yeah. So you grab something, (laughs) wooden, um, and I said, what? He said, it took me ten years to get over you. I have no idea the harm I have done to people, not because of the harm that I did, but because they loved me and I didn't know. And this has been this has been the story all along. If you want to change your perspective of your past, go back and find everyone. And even for a twenty franc note I stole from where I was living um, at the age of eleven, tiny little things doesn't matter how big the rip in your mind is. It doesn't matter whether it's a tiny thing that happened 20 years ago. If it's still hurting, it's still hurting. If whenever they talk about honesty and integrity in a meeting, a roll call appears in your mind, it doesn't matter what it is. Go and find them. And I can't tell you, if you haven't experienced the ability to go anywhere in the world and not be frightened of who's going to pop up in front of you, uh, I wouldn't miss that experience for the world. So uh, I recommend men's 
or changing your perception of the world so that you don't have to resort to drink to do the job for you. That's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That was great. I never heard that way of doing step eight, but I think I might try it next time. But it's true, I can't, uh, I can't hold myself responsible sometimes for other people's reactions to who I am. To thy own self be true, right? So steps eight and nine. Faith without works is dead. So I saw, as I said, in step five, um, four or five, how horribly I treated other people. And I started to get an idea of how I had hurt them. And I used step eight to get a little more clear. This is the first time. Which is what Tim did to get clear on what I needed to make amends for. And to whom I needed to make amends. And where they were. Uh, one of the ideas that was presented to me was to keep a little set of index cards of every single amend on my list. But a sheet of paper, a notebook, and cross them off successively. successively. And um, you brought up an idea. The first time through, I thought I had big amends and small amends, but there's really no difference. It's only in my head. You know, each person that I've come in contact with in my life, and probably I've hurt every single person I've ever been in contact with, and I have not made amends to every single person I've been in contact with, but each person's a human being, and each person has this, you know, this intrinsic work. It doesn't matter whether I think he's a big man or a small man. They're all worth the same amount. But amends is about me getting to be right size. It's about humility. It's about a lot of prayer and willingness. Because, of course, the first time, I didn't want to go to these people. I really didn't. But it has a reminder here on page 76 at the end of the paragraph on step 8. Well, the reminder about prayer. If we have the will to do this, we ask until it comes. But, yeah. And remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. Later in the chapter, it says, we agreed that we, we remind ourselves we are willing to go to any length to find a spiritual experience. You know. And in the beginning, I thought I was doing steps to stay sober, which I am, but I'm also doing this to clear away the wreckage and all the barriers between me and a power greater than myself, which amounts to the same end result so far I've stayed sober. The one thing is I had to be, you know, they talk about willingness, and, uh, I had honestly started in step four to understand that I had hurt other people. Because throughout my drinking years, I didn't, I thought, and even in my early years in AA, I thought that I was the only one I was hurting. <laughs> I thought these people around me, especially those closest to me, you know, my, well, my father had already passed on, but my mother, who was far away, but it was my mother. My husband, my own daughter, you know, I thought they were big enough to handle my behavior. I was just so out of it. I was on planet Laura. That's how, I, that's where I was. But I had started to understand in, in uh, and of course through the meetings, how, uh, these people around me were, were human beings and I had hurt them. And, and part of that was coming from coming from trying to put myself in other people's shoes. Which I hadn't done very much in my life. You know, trying to stay out of judgment in AA, using the idea that I couldn't judge someone unless I'd walked a mile in their shoes. But I started to understand that, you know, the, the top people on my resentment list were my mother and my ex husband. 
the king and queen of my resentment. And little but slowly, I started to realize that they did what they had did, done that were on my list because of what I had done or because of their own character. I mean, my husband, you know, it was all about the way he treated me, but, I mean, he was scared shitless by my behavior and my drinking, and he was also very, very hurt. Very, very hurt. And in fact, I understand, I'm pretty sure now, uh, for a long time he took over. I was a shameless drunk. He's the one who carried all the shame. Is that fair? Hardly. Hardly. But I did start to get a little understanding about other people. And it's probably going to take me the rest of my life because I'm selfish and self-centered. But this chapter into action, it contains some very specific instructions about step nine. And uh, when step, step nine says we may direct amends to people wherever possible, you know, I, I had the great good luck in my first couple of years of recovery to be at like four big book meetings a week. <laughs> And so I got this drilled into my head, you know, there was no avoiding it. And uh, I had the gift of desperation, so I, I, try, I tried to listen the best I could. And they said, direct amends. They had invented the telephone already in Bill's day. He walked into the, the bar to telephone, right? And he said, you know, if you've heard these people, the least you can do is go down and buy some stationery and watch some post office buy a stamp and post a letter. So, you know, I got the idea. No phone calls, no emails, but, you know, these things, all I know is they need to be worked out with another person because my best thinking <laughs> is not always the best best thinking available. I needed to work it out with another person. So lots of consultation with my sponsor and or mentors, people on the same path, mostly my sponsor. But there's specific instructions in these eight pages or so. I haven't counted them recently. You know, financial amends, owning up to some criminal offense. I heard a story over in Houston when I was about three years sober about a woman who had been seven years sober in AA or something, and she was coming up for trial. There had been this horrible car accident. When she was drinking with friends, and everyone in the car died except her. But she had been in blackout that night because of drink and drugs. And after careful consultation with the people in and around her, she decided, number one, to tell the truth. <laughs> but she realized that she could have been put in jail. She said, I cannot honestly say I was not at the wheel of the car. And since there was no one else left to blame, she ended up going to prison, you know, for several years because she could not remember. And she was okay with that. But it was an amazing story. Amazing story about, you know, rigorous honesty. You know, admitting that she could not say that she did not do anything. Um, but anyway, back to my amends. My experience, um, yeah, the criminal offense, the and not involving others. So this is why I need to put, you know, my head together with another alcoholic and sort of double check whether I'm going to ca cause harm to others. You know, not to be the hasty and foolish martyr. Because my best thinking, you know, I may end up involving someone else or hurting them. And then there's a story in here about the man who made public amends. When he stood up in church, the reason, do you know why he made public amends? Because he had done public harm. This is the way it was taught to me anyway. But I saw that in action in our own intergroup some years ago. And um, some people had a problem with the way one member was operating. You know, one member was just operating, carrying the message in not his own way, but as best he could, he thought, following the book. And uh, so, some people uh, took exception to the way he was telling the truth, you know, to alcoholics, like, 
about the deadly illness, etc., etc. But they decided to gang up, up on this man at an introvert meeting. And one by one, you know, they had written testimony and da 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 da. It was like a lynch. It was like a lynching, a public lynching. I hope I'm not upsetting anyone. Put the cheese in your ears. It was horrible. And I think they realized sometime during the afternoon what they had done. And one by one, behind closed doors, you know, behind, they came and said, oh, sorry, maybe we were a little rough. But they never apologized to the people in the room in front of whom this man had been slandered, you know. But that's the whole idea of the story on page 80, you know. If I've, if I've gone around uh, slandering someone, ruining the reputation, I may mean, need to clear his name with the people I ruined it with. Did that happen to me? I don't think so. Although, I engaged in that type of behavior, but I, I tried not to do that anymore. And most of the time, I don't. But that's all, that was all about me being insecure and ego-driven. And if I have to put someone down, it's because, you know, I don't feel good about myself. It was all ego. But once God takes away my ego, I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. And this is the thing, too, you know, in amends, if you haven't done your amends, you'll probably be worried, ambivalent, diffident, scared. It's so true on page 78, you say, in nine times out of ten, the unexpected happens. And that's because I'm expecting the worst. You know, but the story, the story where the man made, the gentleman made public amends, stood up, admitted his wrong. It takes a big person to do that. It takes a big person to do that, but we get right size. That's what humility is, being right size, not too big, not too small. But um, he grows by this. But it says his action, admitting this, this horrible wrong in public, his action that widespread approval, because it was the right thing. It was the right thing to do. Right? And now, admitting that he had done this horrible thing, he is one of the most trusted citizens of his town. And it's not surprising. Because this is a very rare thing these days. And I know, myself, I tried to be a good person my whole life, and when, on my own power, I couldn't be a good person, I tried to brush my mistakes under the carpet. I tried to pretend they never happened. And that didn't help me because they, I pressed them down in here, you know, and stuff. And I realized, as I said, I had only been trying to save face of myself. I realized in the end, all the rest of the world had seen me for who I really was. Or at least they'd seen my behavior. I was the only one who didn't see it. So I needed this to own up. But it does say, and as Tim said, you know, a sincere, a sincere desire to set right them off. So I was told to knock on the door, <laughs> explain what I thought I had done wrong, ask what the other person, well, actually, ask what the other, had I left anything out? Was I un unaware of something I had done that hurt the other person? And finally, to ask what they needed from me to repair the damage. I can't fix them, but I make an offer because it does say in here, you know, amends is more, is about setting right the wrong. And it says there are some wrongs I can never fully right. You know, there are many wrongs I can never fully right. But if I make the offer, um, it's a sincere effort to set right the wrong. But I can't say, I'm the one who did it, I can't say what the other person means. You know, I have to stay away from playing God. And, uh, so many things that are written in this chapter have happened for me, but sometimes I'm, it's not satisfying. For, for instance, I was sincerely ready and willing to make amends with my ex-husband, but he's not really a touchy-feely kind of guy, and he caught me off really short. You know, sometimes a man we are uh, calling upon admits his own fault. 
you know, so he just he just sort of said it t- takes two to ruin a marriage and got up to leave almost, you know. <laughs> So that was quite unsatisfying. And uh, I wrote him a letter several years after that, before he got remarried, because I had uh, understood from various communities, infrequent, but various, every time he wrote to me, because we have a daughter in common, he, he, he was blaming himself for my alcoholism. He, and he, you know, he didn't really go to al and he didn't understand. I felt I had to try to at least try to clear the air, you know, but I can never fix him. So I did write him a letter a few years after that. But the biggest, the biggest, uh, biggest thing that happened for me through amends was that I got a totally new relationship with my own mother. Because we had been head to head almost all, at least since I went into puberty, but maybe even before that. And maybe because it is, I was an alcoholic from the very start, you know. Because but there was never, and we don't have a super, we don't have a relationship made in heaven, but it's changed, you know. It's just, it's changed, and it's changed for the better. And uh, what can I say? I have a good relationship with my daughter today, but I do realize that's not, partly it's because of the program, but it's also because, because, because of my daughter, the way she is. Uh, she's not... And she's not the way she is because of me. She is who she is. But all she ever wanted to do, like if you ever, if any of you have children and you think that your children are never going to speak to you again or anything, I realized that all my daughter ever wanted was for me to get well. That's all she ever wanted was for me to get well and be, you know, reasonably happy. That's all, you know. So that's a great thing. And yeah, today I don't think I have to worry about going anywhere and being <laughs> beat up, put on a list or anything like that. I don't think I have uh, any enemies today. And if I do, I hope they let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Tim and Laura. We're going to have a coffee break now for a half an hour, and we'll come back to our last session of the day, which is into further action. But I want to remind everybody that we have a Tradition 7 basket here. We'll pass it round at the end of the next session. Anybody leaving early would like to make a contribution because we're self-supporting through our own contribution. Um, the basket will be at the back of the room. Thank you. Okay. Before we start the last session of the day, can I just remind everybody what's happening from now on? Um, we'll close at 5.30, so this is a, an hour session. I've asked Tim and, and Laura to maybe stop five minutes before if there's a, one or two questions. Um, there is an Ask It basket at the back of the room, which will have a session tomorrow. So those of you that are coming tomorrow and have questions for Tim or Laura, please write the questions at the back of the... Um, Roshana's waving paper and pens at the back. Um, we'll be passing the Tradition 7 basket round at the end of this meeting. Um, then we have a pause... Um, if it, and then we start at 6.15 with Laura will be sharing the story and then we have dinner at 7 o'clock. So um, that's the program for today and we start tomorrow again at 9 with coffee and croissant and at 9.30 we have a meditation and at 10 o'clock we start with the session 5 which is growing along spiritual lines. So that's our program for the rest of the day and the start of tomorrow morning. I'll pass you over to Tim and Laura. You have to, it's a sort of a dream. <laughs> what are you doing, 10 and 11? Are you stop? Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Should we wait? Oh, my. Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Tell me if it's too loud.
And as I said, I spent a long time trying to come into AA, and I heard that it was a program of action, but I thought the action was how many meetings you made in a week. <laughs> but um, step 10, which starts on page 84, suggests we could continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. It says we vigorously commence this way of living as we clean up the past. And I had already learned that, you know, from the bridge between step three and step four, I, you know, once I'd done step three, immediately I was meant to start step four. You know, and the program does really acceler accelerate if you're following this book. And the people that were sponsoring me, really, I have one sponsor, but there was a group of people on this book who kept pushing me to go forward. And I was given a very helpful piece of paper once I had done a few amends. So quite soon after, I had done my step five, you know, within a couple of weeks. And the piece of paper is an A4 document, which is based on the nightly review, which is on page 86, which looks like it's in step 11. In our group, we tend to take step 10 and 11 together as continuing to live this program, you know, more action. And for me, this is part of continuing to normalize spiritual lines. Because I have to start a new way of living. We commence this new way of living, which is trust God, clean house, keep my side of the street clean. I never had known what that meant keeping my son of the street clean and trying to help others. It says in step 10, our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. That hit really hit me because I'm still in the fog. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. You know, and I, by then I knew I would be an alcoholic for life, that I would die with this illness, but I didn't want to die of it. You know, continue to walk for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And the nightly worksheet that I was given was so important. Because I had only really opened a crack in the veil that, you know, blocked me from the truth about myself. But doing this every day, I saw how subtle selfishness and self-centeredness could be. You know... Simple matters like leaving my departure time for a train to get to a meeting to the last minute. <laughs> for me, and I'd be racing down. So I lived on the fifth floor of an apartment building, no elevator, no lift, elevator, whatever you want to call it. You know, and sometimes my neighbors would be in the stairway, and I hadn't left enough time to say a decent civil hello to them. You know, or there would be a traffic jam in the car park where I parked my bicycle, but I still couldn't get out, you know. And I started to realize every day how selfish and self-centeredness, you know, it was blocking me from other people. It was blocking me from what I need, you know, where I needed to be to do God's will, but it was also blocking me from other people. But this day by day, these little things introduced me to the subtleties of the way my mind thinks. And uh, I give that to people early, early, and I have some friends who do sponsoring in AA, and sometimes they start people off with that daily inventory. Start to look for this, start to look for this. I was started after I knew what to look for, but... And the Step 10 promises... Promises we read in meetings, I, I don't know uh, how aware anyone of, is of this, just dipping back into step nine. You know, in a lot of the AA meetings in these, they used to read the promises. In fact, when I was trying to stop drinking, my husband had picked up a book at the airport. Gifts of sobriety, and there were little essays on all the promises in step nine. I didn't know that at the time. Gifts of sobriety, 
Well, he didn't know that I didn't really want to stop drinking yet. But uh, still, and I hear this, you know, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of people, and I guess I thought the same thing was that those promises that we read in the meetings would come by just not drinking. Well, that didn't happen for me. I mean, just not drinking. We talked about it in our group about the unmanageability. My unmanageability starts when I stop drinking. My internal, I had learned that my unmanageability is more internal than it, or it starts with the internal. Rest is irritable discontent. I don't know how to treat other people. But these taste step promises weren't better than anything. I could have imagined, uh, could have imagined. By the tenth step, I'm doing the tenth step, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. I've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For years I was convinced that to stop drinking would be, um, a lifelong fight against the bottle. You know, until, of course, I admitted my powerlessness. I can't fight alcohol. I can't fight alcohol. But what I did for step 10, too, was to um, get a little, a, a tiny little spiral bound notebook, and if things came up through the day, I'd just make a tiny little note to myself that I could put down on the evening inventory. I mean, I was desperate. I didn't want to relapse. You know, I had had enough of drinking. And what gave me the power to do that, I don't know. But I also had a mushy brain, so I needed to do that. Like, the time I got to the evening, I'm sorry, I might have forgotten what happened in the morning. And, and it's not only about what happened, it's mostly about what's going on in my head. You know, I certainly would have forgotten the way I was thinking in the morning or at some point during the day. But this is where I start to live the program, which is like from step three or even step one all the way to step nine. And it says, yeah, step four, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, I ask God at once to remove them, step seven. I discuss them with someone immediately. Step five. Make amends quickly if I have harmed anyone. Step nine, then, because that's all about me, 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 to get out of self, I resolutely turn my thoughts to someone I can help. And that doesn't mean I drop everything I'm doing, like if I'm driving down the highway or at a job where I'm meant to be a productive part of a team or on my own. It's, I turn my thoughts, what can I do for someone today? You know, just to get my mind off of me. Get my mind on what God's will is for me. And there's a promise. Yeah, the first promise is love and tolerance of others is our code. And then followed by a whole pro paragraph of promises. Mm -hmm. And on 85 it says, We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. <laughs> Oh, at one point in time, I could have gravely misinterpreted that sentence. I mean, I didn't have to do anything except to come to meetings and sit in a chair, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's not what it means. It means that I have not been working on my attitude towards liquor or my feelings about liquor. What happened was, by the grace of something bigger than me and lots of AA, is that my interest in alcohol got replaced by a real desire for recovery. So I was working on recovery rather than working on changing my attitude toward liquor, or even changing my attitude toward other people. That just came. You know, and it says I will be placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off well, I swore off alcohol many times, but it never worked. And as I said before, I didn't get myself so well. But there are warnings here in the big book. 
I think as we've already heard, it tells us if we do this, we'll stay sober. If we don't do this, we may not. But there's a warning here on page 85. It is easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. And this is true. We start to feel good, and then we think we don't have to keep working at it. We are headed for trouble if we do. And poor alcoholism is a subtle foe. <laughs> alcohol is not my foe, really. It's my alcoholism, which resides in my mind. And I have to remember, I am not cured of alcoholism. One thing that really helps me with this book is to put it into the first person. Because for years I read it as a story. That's what it says on the title page, right? The story of these other people. Those people who have recovered from alcoholism. I thought it was a story. I read it like a story, but until I was taught that it was a textbook. So I have to heed these warnings. What we really have is a daily creed contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So I start in the morning asking what God's will is for me today and carry God's will into my, all my activities. You know, prayer, quiet time, thinking of how I can carry the message to someone who still suffers. You know, that's in the morning, getting my thought life on a higher plane. <clears throat> Not worrying about little my own little plans and desires. That's in the morning. Then they meld into step eleven, which follows step ten. I found it re I found it really helpful to do steps in order. Prayer in the beginning was difficult for me, but I started by saying thank you, and now I can relax about it. But uh, that doesn't mean not do it. I mean, I can get uh, relaxed with a power bigger than myself, talk, but mainly leave enough room, leave enough space, leave enough time to listen. Just sit, just sit. Not figure, try not to think too much. Try to listen for some answers. I haven't heard it for a while. Uh, but they used to say when we were newcomers that we were given uh, two ears and one mouth. And what did that tell us about what we were supposed to be doing? Listening, listening, listening. So I have a little sheet. I didn't bring it with me, but if anyone wants it, I can certainly get it to them. And I think Julian may have it. But this step 11, look at the first paragraph in step 11. Okay, they mentioned that prayer and meditation. But the first paragraph on 86 is a bunch of inventory questions. <laughs> there are quite a few of them. And my sheet, it has these questions. I didn't create the sheet. It was given to me. It has these questions plus a few others. And so I'm keeping check on, you know, where I'm going wrong in the day. But also there's a place where, where I'm going right. That is, where I can see the new power flowing in, where I can see new new things happening in my life, where I can get into gratitude, and where I can, you know, it urges me to think of others. It's very useful. Very useful. But so many people that I've tried to sponsor, try to sponsor, um, try to show them what is in this book. You know, they get to this point, and I'm written, to me, I had to write it down. I think... What I've seen is people who write it down, just like in the four step. I couldn't have done a four step in my head. You know? And the same with the evening inventory, to write it down. It becomes more concrete, it becomes more real. Um, and the people I see, they say, oh, I do it in my head. I, they're not really doing it, because, because it shows. It's like we were having a discussion between the two sessions. And it, it was actually around amends. But I've realized that through amends, I've stopped doing the things 
I used to do that used to get me in a bad place. That would lead to a drink. That would lead to the bedevilments, you know? Bad relations with other people. I've stopped doing the things, more or less, <laughs> or to a large extent, that I've made amends for. If I haven't made amends for them, then I haven't understood their direct link to my drinking. And I'm, I'm probably at risk. And I've seen this happen. And it's the same thing. If I'm not taking inventory, then my, my behavior is going to change a lot more slowly, if at all. Because the whole book, it's a lovely cycle, you know. I start in the morning, I pray. I look, try to do inventory sort of on a continuously intermittent basis all through the day. And then I pray. After making my review, I ask God, that means I pray, I pray for forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. So the whole cycle for me, I can summarize it, prayer, inventory, prayer, prayer for guidance and direction for the day, inventory to keep an eye on, like, you know, myself, because God's got a lot of other things to look after. And then at the end of the day, again, prayer, prayer, inventory, prayer. So where... When I was a newcomer, I thought inventory was about beating myself up. I understand it now as a, as a tool to get me back to my director, <laughs> to that guidance that I need in my life, because I don't need to be running on self-will. So, prayer, inventory prayer. And then they jump back to the morning. So, the morning, I need to... Before I begin my day, I ask God to direct my thinking. In that morning quiet time, I never used to take it. I mean, just off on automatic pilot. And this reminds me in the morning of the set format, sort of for that too, that was given to me. And I've seen not much reason to change it. I get centered as soon as I get up. I remember who I am and where I need to be and who I need to be in contact with. I heard it really well said. I never thought of this, thought of it this way until a visitor, visitor appeared. I think she was from the state. She said, I wake up in the morning with untreated alcoholism. I thought, hey, yeah, some days I do. Some days I do. You know, but I have to, I have to remember, yeah, I, I keep to this routine. Um, because I need this good orderly direction. I need this kind of a routine. And I've been in enough sort of mental facilities to have my alcoholism, and my drinking problem too, that I know that's what they, that's what they do in mental hospitals. You follow a routine. And the thing is, I need to, uh, it says, my thought life will be put, placed on a much higher plane. And that doesn't mean, you know, my head is in the clouds. It means I'm thinking about something a little bit bigger than myself, which is specifically in AA, is can I help another person? Can I help another alcoholic? And if there's no other alcoholic, maybe I can help someone else. You know, it has, I have to get me out of me. But there are a lot of good suggestions all the way through step 11 about what to do throughout the day. Maybe, do you want to talk about that part or? Um, well, you just talk I'll, about 10 and 11 now. I'll do 10 and 11 to that. What? I'm about halfway through. Okay. But this is full of good suggestions. You know, I realized today that I used to, uh, my life used to be run on automatic pilot, and, uh, now here it says, what do I do when I'm agitated and doubtful? I learned in AA that there was a third choice, you know, do nothing. Here it says, we pause and ask for the right thought or action. So I don't need to do something right away. I don't need to get anything. You know, I ask for the right thought or action, and then I can do that in prayer, and I can do that by talking to another alcoholic or other sane person, recovered alcoholic. 
You know, thy will be done many times each day. And this is this is a this is how I can sort of live with my own illness. You know, following these instructions, starting in the morning, checking all through the day, making amends if necessary. I'm in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self pity, or foolish decisions. You know, I used to be an emo- emotional roller coaster. Running on an autopilot, making mistakes everywhere, emotional roller coaster, and that doesn't happen to me very often. And this thing about we do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. Uh, well. Yeah, when I first got sober, um, I realized how tired I was, and I thought it was all about the drinking. That's why I was so tired, you know, physically a wreck and everything. And after I started using these instructions, I got this, um, you know, when I first got sober, I was full of energy. You know, but I think that was just happiness, joy, whatever. But then again, when I started using these instructions, I got a new burst, and I realized that, yeah, the alcohol had been a physical burden and I was tired, but what I had really been doing all my life was trying to run the show myself, and it was my alcoholism that was far more tiring uh, than the drinking. You know, so this is so true for me. So true. I thought, I had thought this book was about them, but I found out it was about me. So ready to... Thank you. <sighs> My name is Tim Monopoly. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I've had a few problems in my life with relationships. Now, maybe you haven't had problems with relationships, but perhaps sometimes you'll sponsor people who do, so this may come in handy. Um, now, there are surely lots of different types of crazy relationships. Uh, I have two specialities. Speciality number one is relationships with men who are tall and confident and capable and bright and impressive and cold as ice. <laughs> and give nothing back. But they're reliable in all sorts of practical ways. You know, they can change light bulbs. And um, I would give up my life for these people. And I would commit suicide over these people. And I thought there was a problem with men. There was a problem with the men I was choosing. Um, and as a friend of mine describes these people, they're like turnip juice in a beautiful glass, and all you see is the beautiful glass, and you forget that it's like drinking turnip juice. Um, and you walk into a room, and your eyes lock, and you know immediately, here's another one. You just like all the other ones. And the trick, what you try and do, is you pick someone who is like the person with whom the relationship failed and you try to get the relationship to rerun but you want to get the ending to change and the purpose of the ending of the relationship is to mend your wounded self-esteem and there's something they do that they make you feel so special for about four minutes a day and you will live for those four minutes and uh, there's that line in the Sondheim song um, from Follies uh All afternoon, doing every little chore, the thought of you stays bright. It's the one little light in a life of dullness and monotony. Okay, this is type of relationship number one. Type of relationship number two. Again, I have to use the words of a friend of mine because um, they're better than anything I can come up with. The orphan with the big eyes and the broken wing. 
and you spot an opportunity to save, to rescue, to martyr yourself, to mother them, to manage them, to manipulate them. And when they call you eight times a day, and you just know how important you are to someone. And you don't have to look at any of your problems, do you? And you have all the power. It's just delicious. Uh, but it's also hellish. And as the same friend describes, it's like Halloween and Christmas and Valentine's Day all rolled into one beautiful relationship. Now, um, I tried for many years to... This is the phrase. You, you hear, hear this a lot in recovery world. I'm working on my relationships. Now, let's call these types of people that I would get attracted to poisonous men. Now, there is nothing poisonous about them. They're just poisonous to me because I'm allergic to these two character types. But we'll call them, we'll call them poisonous men. Let's read the Step 10 Promises with reference to this. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even poisonous men. For by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in poisonous men. If tempted, we recoil from it from them as if from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward poisonous men has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. And this has been my experience, both with poisonous uh, men in a romantic sense and the people that I'm liable to try and save. I cannot have a healthy relationship with an unhealthy person. Cannot. It, it, it's, my idea was you get two broken people and you put them together and you end up with one unbroken person. You don't. You just have two even more broken people at the end of it. I can, I'm going to repeat this one, I cannot mend my relationships. Now, I don't have these broken relationships anymore. When I see an opportunity to get into one of these two types of relationship, this promise has come true. I recoil as if from a hot flame. There are people that can help both of those categories of people. I'm not them. There are seven billion people on the planet. There is a reason for this. It means I don't have to be everywhere. Um, so the question is, how do the how do those promises come true if not by working on the relationships? They come true by steps ten, eleven, and twelve. And we're going to talk about step twelve tomorrow. So we're going to talk about steps ten and eleven now. Um, I'm going to be heretical for a moment. There's a little line that they say in almost every AA group in the world. Uh, they say. You have to get out of the driving seat, with reference to step three, to get out of the driving seat. I am firmly of the belief the problem is not that we are in the driving seat. We have been in the passenger seat, our ego has been in the driving seat. And we have been the unwitting victim of forces far bigger than us, operating within us, convincing us that we are the ones doing this. Until I recognize my powerlessness over my alcoholism, I can't start to treat my alcoholism. Until I recognize my powerlessness over my own ego, I cannot start to treat my own ego. So, this begs the question, well, what would being in the driving seat look like? It, for me, it means that uh, only I can take the actions that need to be taken in my life. It means that I don't get into your car and drive it for you or stand in the middle of the road directing traffic. My job is to drive my life, to take the actions of my life. Now, the problem has always been twofold, source of power and direction. It talks all the way through we agnostics about these are the two things we need. We need power, we need direction. If I'm driving, I need petrol in the engine, and I need a satellite navigation system. If either of those two things are not there, we ain't going anywhere. And power and direction for me come through prayer and meditation and helping others and service and fellowship and all of those things. But chiefly, it's this direction business we're interested in, step 11 in the morning. And so the first question I 
the, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is, oh, God direct my thinking. Because if God doesn't, something else will. <laughs> and you don't want to see the results when something else does. And sometimes, if all you can do in the morning is say 100 times, God, please direct my thinking, God, please direct my thinking, at least you're not saying what you would otherwise be saying. Uh, I think it's not a bad prayer, God, please divorce my thinking from self-pity, from self-seeking, from dishonest motives. Again, repeat a hundred times if necessary. Nothing wrong with repetition. It doesn't mean it's less spiritual. Uh, my job in the morning is to get a list of things to do today as guided by a power greater than myself. And I ask also for a spirit in which to do them. So I go back to this fear. How do you solve fear? You ask God to remove the fear, direct your attention to what he would have you be. Three adjectives for each activity. And this I just find immensely useful. Whenever my mind goes elsewhere, I can have those three qualities to ask God to infuse my action with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation in a moment, but that's really what the step 11 in the morning is about it's getting a plan for the day, getting my attitudes, my head on straight, as it were. And then at night, the step eleven review um, is the debrief at the end of the day. What did, what went well? What went badly? Name one thing. One thing will do that I'm going to do differently tomorrow. And you know, <laughs> I'd love to be more spiritual, but sometimes my corrective measures are. Don't go on Facebook until you finish work. Don't go on Facebook until you finish. And if I can do that one day out of three, it, it's a sensational success. Uh, you know, I'm not advanced, but I'm still working on some basic things like working whilst I'm at work. Um, but it's the middle bit that I find so interesting. Um, I get a lot of phone calls which are or texts or emails which start off with something like this, I'm full of resentment, or I'm full of fear, I'm full, I, as though you have been filled by something else, as, as though you are a vessel, and, some, and you've just been a victim and it's poured into you. And I've been taught not to talk about myself in those terms, but to tell the truth. And the truth when I am full of resentment is I have been permitting negative thoughts minute in, minute out, hour in, hour out, the whole day. And, then, and now I'm complaining that I don't like how I feel when I have been thinking resentful thoughts for 12 hours. And I want you somehow to say something spiritual to make it go away because I don't want to do the work. I don't want to actually change. And in a prayer, in another book, it says, lead us not into temptation. The temptation is to think a negative thought in, in Al-Anon, in some parts of Al-Anon, some very hardline, offensive parts of Al-Anon. They'll say the wonderful line, a slip is any negative thought. So step 10 during the day, my job is to make sure that, as I'm driving my little car of sobriety, um, that the steering wheel is straight which means that my mind is supposed to be, when I'm doing the washing up, I'm supposed to be thinking about the washing up. I'm not even supposed to be thinking anything spiritual. I'm supposed to be thinking about, that's the most spiritual thing I can do, is to be thinking about the washing up. When someone is talking to me, to actually be listening to the words that they're saying, not working out what I'm going to say next. Or is there someone more interesting over there? Or what's wrong with this person? You know, the other kind of narrative that goes on when you're talking to people. To be present is the only purpose. It says on page 59 about God, may you find him now. And I think it means that. It, it, it meant it in a different context, but it does work in this context. I will find a power greater than myself right here. Ask yourself right here, right now, is anything bad happening to you? What is your experience of the actual universe around you right now? And it's almost invariably benevolent. There is nothing bad happening. And it's that present that I need to come back into contact with. Whenever my mind goes elsewhere, and the four places it can go chiefly is, is selfishness and dishonesty and resentment and fear, I would add two more, again, not in the big book, fantasy, nostalgia. 
Those are the two other ways I will escape reality. So my job in step 10 is, uh, my mind is like an untrained puppy on a leash. I just, you just need to keep tugging. Gently, you don't yank. Don't yank a puppy, just gently and persistently, you're going to carry on. Uh, so I gently and persistently need to bring my mind back, and as it says, we ask God at once to remove them. We don't analyze them first, because whilst you're analyzing those thoughts, that's your ego's way of, of tricking you into continuing to think about them. Now it says, lead us not into temptation, because the temptation is, there's something delicious about either thinking resentful thoughts or fearful thoughts or whatever they are guilt or shame. And there's something equally delicious about thinking about the fact you are thinking about them and trying to work, what am I going to do about thinking these? You need to stop doing it. There's nothing to analyze because you can't see the truth from within the situation. I can't tell you how many times I have been obsessed with this or that or him or her or them trying to work out why I'm so obsessed and why, why does this particularly bother me? I just, oh, I need to work it out. Stop. I wish the phone would stop ringing so I can concentrate more heavily on me. <laughs> Whereas the truth is I need distance from it and then I will glance back at this thing which obsessed me and go, what was that about? That's weird. That's strange. So step 10 is adjusting the steering wheel as I'm going through the day. Now, if I'm particularly distressed, I, I, I do admit I will have to call someone, or I will have to, sometimes I have to make amends. But what I'll do, I'll call a friend of mine who's in the room, and I'll say, my head's all wrong, make it right. <laughs> By which I mean, you tell me, I, I know that my thinking is not straight and I want, I want to be proven wrong. You, you tell me how I'm wrong because I can't see why I'm wrong. If I'm disturbed, I've made the wrong choice. If I'm not at peace, I've made the wrong choice. I've, I've valued something that shouldn't be valued. Show me how I am wrong because I want to be wrong today. If you're unhappy and you want to be right, God help you. So we talk until I say, I can see, ah, oh, that's why I'm wrong. And then I'm all right. So that's how I use other people um, in this. With um, step 11 in the morning, um, I mentioned earlier my utter failure with Eastern forms of meditation for the first 15 years of recovery, which a former sponsor of, of mine referred to as the early years. <laughs> So if you're in your first 15 years and struggling, don't forget you are in some ways an early recovery. Um, and he meant this not to put me down, but as a comfort, so that I wouldn't say, I wouldn't think there was something wrong with me just because I was still struggling um, with things that I thought I ought to, ought to have gotten over by now. Well, if you ought to have gotten over it, why haven't you? Clearly there's a reason. You know, nothing happens for nothing, so it's fine. Um, and I fully expect things to happen in the future. I don't think I'm, uh, I'm still cookie dough in some ways. I'm not cookies all the way through. Um, so I need a form of meditation which is going to work for someone who, whose mind, uh, was very damaged when I got to AA. Um, I need a form of meditation which is going to meet me where I am as opposed to starting from somewhere which is too far ahead for me to get to. Meditation as, I tried meditation classes in my first 10 years, and it was like going to advanced algebra when you can't do arithmetic. Um, now, fortunately, when the big book was written, meditation had a slightly different sense than it has now. Um, so meditation didn't appear in, on, they didn't have television, it didn't appear on films. It, and, you know, the, the, the word was written in the 1930s, and although Bill W. was instrumental in writing it, the concept of it came uh, from middle America. 
And uh, when you look up in a 1930s American dictionary, it, it talks about things like concentrated thought, directed thought. And uh, Buddhists, God bless them, don't have a monopoly on meditation. And if you can't do Buddhist meditation, it's fine. You can still be a good AA. <laughs> I've been told by people in AA, because I don't do mindfulness, that I'm not meditating properly. Don't let anyone tell you you're not doing step that and coffee because you won't do it that way. Um, what I do is um, informed by what Benedictines apparently do, which is something called Lectio Divina. Right? You take text and you read it through very slowly. And the first time you read it through, you just sort of when you get to something which makes sense, you pause and then you think about it. And then you go through it, you go back to the beginning, and you go line by line. And you read the first line, and perhaps it will do nothing for you. And you read the next line, you think about it. You read the third line, ding, 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 ding. And it makes you, it, it, it puts things in your everyday life into a new light you suddenly realize what you're doing in wrong in your relationship with Jennifer. That tomorrow when you see Jennifer, you're going to need to just shut up and let her talk, for instance. And you don't know why that has occurred to you in relation to... Because the text is not about Jennifer. But you read this stuff and it changes your perception. Um, and I have shelves full of books... And I'm, I'm like a magpie with these things. I, I've been taught, go, don't feel, if you've started a particular spiritual reading, book to use for your spiritual reading, you don't have to finish it all the way through. You don't have to do all 365 exercises because you said you would start. If it's not working for you, if you're just getting, go and find something which speaks to you, which is at your level where you are today. And sometimes I can read fancy stuff, sometimes I need very simple stuff, sometimes I'll use the big book this way, I'll just go through a page line by line, say, what does this say to me? What does this say about my relationship with other people? What does this say about my relationship with God? How could I apply this to my problems with work? How could I apply this to my problems with my partner? How could I do today better on the basis of what I'm reading here? And um, something that Dr. Bob said was that the most important, the most important hour, time of the day, and actually the most important element of the program, someone said to him, apparently, uh, what do you think of AA meetings? And he said they're wonderful, they're necessary, but they're not vital. What is vital is spending uh, quiet time, as it was originally called, with your higher power every day. And um, there are times I do less, there are times I do more. I'm probably averaging about 45 minutes to an hour a day at night. And I do a little review. I pray a few little prayers. I might read a little bit of a big book. It's all very relaxed. It's all very unstructured. And I go to the books that help me right now. I go to the books that feed me right now. Sometimes I can't bear written words. And I go and listen to an AA tape or an hour long tape or some other spiritual tape because I can't take anything in otherwise. I'm just built like that. And I think the reason why God seems to have furnished the earth with so many modes of communication and spiritual thought is because all of them are necessary. And a power grace in myself communicates to me through you, through other people in recovery, through nature, through animals. You sit and watch an animal, you think, could I, you sit and watch puppies or dogs, and you think, could I be a bit more like that? Could I be a bit more curious and inquisitive rather than jaded and cynical? I'd rather see I'd rather see someone I work with go for a walk with their dog for half an hour a day and watch the dog and look at the wonder of trees rather than faking it with some meditation technique that they can't get their head around. So I have this, I'm a stickler for facts and results. I want to do what works, and what I, what I, all the stuff that I have done, and I've done all sorts of different things, and I occasionally do do little bits of mindfulness occasionally now, but it works, and how I know that it works is when I've spent that time 
and I look at what is in front of me during the day. I think, I can do that. It's all right. It's not frightening anymore. And the reason it's not frightening anymore is because it talks here about a higher plane. And what it reminds me is that there is a greater reality than all of the awful details of my life. I can get stuck in all of the awful details of my life, the, all the work I have to do and deadlines and little disputes with clients. And I can get mired in that and think that that is the real world. I can watch the television and look at the news and think that is the real world. I can get lost. I can forget the greater reality. The city I live in, a lot of people complain that it's, oh, London, it's so aggressive. Chris. And I remember thinking about that one day, and I was going on a 10-15 minute walk, and I looked around me, and I thought, let's see if I can see any aggression. <laughs> For 10-15 minutes, I might have seen three or four hundred people walking, you know, just going about their business, people in cafes. Everybody, the sunny day, albeit, uh, Everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves, getting on well. No one was hurting anyone. No one was harming anyone. People just quietly, beautifully, peacefully going about their business. That's the reality. And prayer and meditation in the forms that I've used it. And this, how does this link with God? When I've got a problem, I treat God like I would another person say, God, hello. What? He says, no formality. You're allowed to talk to God like you would have a little problem here. Uh, what, would you, what would you like me to do? And you listen, get a pen, get a piece of paper, write down what comes to you. And then measure it against spiritual principles of selfishness and of selflessness and love and tolerance and patience and kindness. Usefulness. Cheerfulness. Check it out with someone else. Communicate, two-way communication. It's not complicated. You're allowed to talk to God. You're allowed to listen and believe that what comes to you when you have addressed God and said, give me something here, you're allowed to believe that might come from God. May or may not, but it might. You don't have to go through special channels. And it's 25 past. We've been asked to ask if you have any questions about steps 10 and 11. Thank you very, thank you very much. Have we got? Um, yeah, we've got five minutes. If anybody's got um, one or two questions, um, the tradition seven basket will be going round. For those of you that can and would like to and haven't, um, <laughs> it, contributions will be nice. Um, at, when we finish the session now, I'd ask everybody just to take their chair and move it to the side of the room before you leave because we will um, be setting up tables for dinner. Um, so when we finish now, we'll have the serenity prayer. Let, let me pass the tradition seven bar. Going round. If you have this fine, it's no obligation. It's just passing round. Um, Laura will be sharing her story at quarter past six, and dinner is at seven. So as many of you can, please stay for dinner. And um, the, uh, the draw for the lottery will be at 7.30. So there's still more tickets to sell if you wish. To buy, rather, not to sell, to buy. They want to sell them, you buy them. Um, but just the last few minutes, anybody got a couple of questions? And Can you shut up? Because we can't get the mic to you, I don't think. Um. Forgive and forget? Yes. Well, on resentments? Um, just for the tape as well, the question is, um, 
uh, one of the ladies uses the forgiveness prayer uh, in one of the stories in the book where you pray for someone else's well-being for two weeks. Oh, um, but the difficulty that one can't necessarily get, even though one can give it. Well, what happened, I'm Laura, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, what happened to me was that, um, you know, starting with step four, it talks about me looking for my own mistakes. This is kind of one of the step ten promises. And anyway, starting in step four, I look for my own mistakes. I forget about the other person's mistakes. Seen in step nine, I don't criticize the person that may have done me more harm than good. I think it's just an experience that happened to me. I didn't necessarily do anything, but when I realized, when I real, when I understood the harms I had done to other people, um, sometimes there's hailed in comparison. Once in a while, I suppose, I must have been, I mean, I'm not a saint, I don't claim to be. Once in a while, something that hurt me in the past comes back to me, especially when I'm working with a newcomer that can't get over these things because they haven't gone through the set. But uh, it will come back to me, but I don't, I don't labor on it and I ask God to, you know, remove that thought because it's very often a... I don't really know what you mean by forget. Um, I know my thinking about those hearts has changed. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what you mean by forget. But these things don't often um, come back to haunt me. But what I find is, and it says in one of the night, one of the nights that promises, is that we shall not close, we shall not wish to close the door on them. Or we shall not regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. So, to me, and uh, I find that when God reminds me of these things, it's for a reason. When life reminds me of these things, it's for a reason. Maybe I really haven't cleared the resentment, but I thought I had. Or maybe it needs to be fresh in my mind so I can help another person with what they're do, doing, trying to get past in their life. So maybe Tim has a different, different take. Um, well, everything that's ever happened to me, I still retain in my memory because sometimes the information is useful and there may be places you don't want to go back to and people you swerve. So that's just self-preservation. Um, but when I find myself dwelling on someone else's wrong, even if I think I've forgiven them, oh, I'm not sure I have. So you can feel like you've forgiven more when you're dwelling on it then. And um, the first reason why I will dwell is because I actually owe them an amend, and I feel guilty. The way my, the ego gets rid of guilt is it turns it into blame. Because that justifies the thing that you did to them. Fascinating. I love the way the ego works. Almost as fascinating as God. Um, the second thing is this um, dwelling when you know you think you've forgiven. The trouble is with prayer. This is one of the difficulties of praying for someone that you resent. Is you're still thinking about them, but you've just cast it in a new light. And so one of the things that I have to do. Is, that, this is Dr. Paul O's story. He would say um, he'd phone up his sponsor and say, oh, my wife. And he said all the terrible things that his wife was doing. And his sponsor said, why not try not thinking about it for a couple of days? And he said, not think about it, then I'll forget all about it. <laughs> and there's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, and just one last thing on forgiveness. There are two types of forgiveness. There's forgiveness where you retain the perception that the other person is just an awful human being, but you're going to be so spiritually elevated, you're going to overlook it in a benign fashion. Now, this passes for forgiveness in some circles and is surely better than pushing them downstairs. However, um, 
I think real forgiveness is when you remove the perception that you have been harmed and replace it with the perception that this is someone who may be operating out of fear. And you happen to have been in the way. There's a line from Friends where Jennifer Aniston is teaching Matt LeBlanc how to sail, and he can't sail, and she's an expert, and, and she's getting, she's furious, and he's getting everything wrong. And he says, don't be angry with me. Don't yell at me. She says, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling near you. And all of the harm that's ever been done is harm that's been done in my presence. It's not been done to me. The thing that hurt was my egoic interpretation of it. And if I can get to that, there is nothing to forgive. I just happen to have witnessed something. But that's taken a lot of work. And the footnotes, if anyone's interested in further investigation along those lines, Anthony DeMello really helps. A Course in Miracles really helps. This Buddhist writer, I think it's amazing, called Yoko Beck, J-O-K-O Beck, B-E-C-K, um, and Emmett Fox. Those, those are the ones who have um, saved my faith. Thank you. Well, thank you both Laura and Tim. We're going to finish uh, this session with the uh, Serenity Prayer, the Wii version, and then when you're standing, we go in a circle, please move your chairs back so we can set up the tables. We start again at 6.15 with Laura's story. Thank you, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back. Sunday morning, second, second day of our annual event, Copy 2014, I like to keep calling it. Um, so... Just to say what the program is for the rest of the morning, we've just some of us have just started off with a meditation, so thank you, Paul. He's I think he's gone, but oh, <coughs> excuse me. So now we're going to have session five, which is growing along spiritual lines, and Tim and Laura are going to speak from um, their experience and from the big book. We'll have a fifteen-minute coffee break at quarter to eleven, and then we have the ask it basket. So, as we said yesterday, at the back of the room, there's an ask it basket if you want to ask questions and you don't want to say them in front or you think of them as, as, as they're speaking. Write it there and um, that will be a session on um, just everybody's questions. And then we'll finish uh, the morning with an open meeting. So, we'll all have an open meeting and we'll close about one o'clock. And uh, please eat the massive food there is after one o'clock because... Uh, Otherwise, we we don't we don't like waste. So, um, with that, I'll start. Um, Roshan is going to start with a prayer. Morning, everyone. So, as yesterday, I we're going to start with the set aside prayer. God, please set aside anything I think I know about myself, about my disease, about the Big Book, the Twelve Steps, the program, the fellowship and especially you, God, so that I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me see the truth. Amen. Ten, 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 ten. Ten, 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 ten. No, I know that. Um, So this morning we're going to talk about growing a lot of spiritual lines. My name is Laura. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Laura. And, uh, and how it works, it tells us we are not saints. What we are is willing to grow a lot of spiritual lines. Of course, I didn't know what that meant. When I came into into AA, I didn't understand that the twelve steps were the spiritual path. But there's a line in Bill's story at the bottom of page um, fourteen, I think, or is it thirteen to fourteen? Bottom of page fourteen. This tells me exactly how I need to grow along spiritual lines. It tells me how not to. <laughs> so it's written in the negative. It says, for 
It says, faith without works is dead, which they reminded us of in step eight. And it says, this is appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic fails to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, we're going to church? <laughs> Repair and meditation? Well, that might be part of it. But it says, through work and self-sacrifice for others, he cannot survive the certain trials and those thoughts ahead. You know, I came into this program a very selfish person. <laughs> I thought it was all about me and my sobriety and my recovery and in the beginning. Well, it is. It is. But, you know, this is how I grow spiritually. And it reminds me of an experience I had in 2002, three years before I got sober. And my family sent me back to Canada to that rehab. And there were um, the four weekly workshops. One was on anger management, one was on da da one was on spirituality. So I went to this one, and we were all sitting in a circle in a big common room, and cushy chairs, and da-da-da. And the counselor came out to the, into the center of the room, and she was holding a ball of yarn. And she gave me the end of the yarn, and she said, hold this. And then she went across the room, I should have brought a ball of yarn. <laughs> Across the room to, and asked someone to hold the yarn at that point. And then she crisscrossed and made this kind of web that joined everyone in the room to this one piece of red yarn. And then she asked a simple question, what is spirituality? And the answer was obvious. It was being connected. You know? And uh, our disease can sometimes be a moment of isolation. And I tell I'm quite happy on my own. <laughs> So I needed to learn to reach out to other people. And so step 12 reads, having had a spiritual awakening as, a, as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. To carry this message. This is that you can get well from alcoholism by having a spiritual experience. You can find the power that you're lacking in your life that they mentioned on now. Page 45. Because lack of power, we're powerless over alcohol, so lack of power is our real problem. Yeah. Lack of power to live with it, obviously, but Especially lack of power to live without it. That's why I fell into a, the trap. <laughs> For me, you know, I look at alcohol as not some big evil demon, but it was a trap that I just fell into naturally. Partly because of my physical allergy, but also because of the way I made it up here and here. <laughs> So carrying the message to other alcoholics. Now, I thought I had a lot of old ideas, erroneous ideas. And I thought you had to have like 10 or 20 years as a sober alcoholic to become a sponsor or help someone else. But uh, as I said, I got into a group with strong sponsorship and and I was told that you know, once I had started my amends and started practicing step 10, 11, that the next newcomer woman that walked into the room, I was to go over and, you know, introduce myself and make contact. It was pretty hard because the men were usually all over the women, but that's okay. You know, little by little. And quite soon, quite soon, God, life, sent me three newcomers. They were all French-speaking, and I speak French, but I'm not French, so... But, you know, working with those first three, I'm not sure any of them got anything out of it, but I stayed sober. That wasn't really my intention, but. <laughs> and, of course, you know, it says in uh, Vision for You, I'm alone, jittery, and afraid. I don't know what to do. And it reminds us that, we, you know, we've just been in contact with a power greater than ourselves. And so I went out there and did what I was supposed to do. But first, I must, I must admit that I had begun to have a spiritual experience. 
and that, you know, at step five, I did see what my real problem was. <laughs> you know, it wasn't really about the drinking. It was more about selfishness and self-centeredness. And, you know, I had been freed of, well, the drinking problem, temporarily, anyway. I had been freed. I had this huge monkey off my back, but all that baggage I had been carrying around with me all my life, you know, I had been freed of that, too. And I just, I felt like bursting. I felt like I'd finally been initiated into the real Alcoholics Anonymous. Only because it wasn't their fault. It was, you know, I had been in complete delusion, illusion. But I was bursting to carry this message. You know, I did want to help others. So that helped too. You know, and it gives us, um, so as far as helping others, it gives us specific instructions. This book is so amazing on actually how to do this. You know? And uh, my, my sponsor said, okay, you know, you've got, I, I think we went on our first 12-step call the day before my first birthday. He did all the talking. I was, I was meant to observe, but it was great. It was great. And... Uh, it talks about getting the identification first by telling a little bit of our story in a general way. I try not to be so wordy as I was yesterday <laughs> because I find that if I'm too specific about some of my big drama and, and that the other person may, um, may use that to, to convince themselves they're not an alcoholic, but I talk about the emotional state, and as it says in this book, you know, the unsuccessful attempts I need to stop, but it depends. I try to get them talking, and very often um, I find that prospects want to talk more about themselves. You know, in this book it, talk, it talks about finding out all you can about the alcoholic before um, before you meet them. Sometimes, most of the time, in my experience, that's very difficult. You know, they were often approached by families of alcoholics. Um, that hasn't happened to me too long, too often. You know, the alcoholic walks into the room, or I meet them uh, through hospital, um, we do hospital presentation. And so it's difficult to get to know them by the back door, so you just, Listening, I just sometimes I do as much listening in a twelve step call as as talking, you know. But the whole idea of a twelve step call, and it's repeated several times here in the book, is to get the message across about what this illness really is. Um, and that it is an illness. It took me so long to be convinced about that, that I really do have an illness. First of all, the physical side, the allergy, the reason why we drink so much. And then the second side, the mental side, why we pick up that first drink. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed at this book because it's got clear cut instructions to do every single one of these steps. And as I said, I'm amazed that people with loads of years of experience, they often share in meetings that when they're called on a 12-step call, the first thing they do is pick up this book and go to chapter 7 and reread the instructions. Reread the instructions on how to talk to a person. See your man alone if possible, you know, without the family, without any more outside pressure. That means the man is alone. Sometimes it's good if, we're, if we are too... doing the 12-step call. But the whole, uh, the whole thing, too, is, uh, is listening. Because it tells me I need, I need to find out if I, I need to find out if this person is a real alcoholic or is maybe looking for something else. I remember one 12-step call I did with a Polish woman who was through a doctor, through one of the AAs, and Polish background. 
So I went, and it turned out that she was really just looking for a man. <laughs> I do believe she was probably an alcoholic, but she hadn't really reached the end. She, she needed to find something that would fix her. She believed it was man. But all I can do really in a 12-step call is um, share my experience with the illness, try to get that identification. It's so easy to be tempted to present the solution. <laughs> I remember going um, with someone on a 12-step call, and he called me out of the blue. And he really didn't know anything about his prospect, except that her life was in a real mess. And being that alcoholic himself, he thought it was due to drinking. <laughs> and uh, so I went along with him. And, and he just barreled in with a solution, you know. And I was quite shocked at that, but I couldn't really stop him. But basically, he was sort of accusing her of being an alcoholic and that she should come to AA without really uh, <clears throat> getting that identification as it explains to you. Uh, continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Yeah. How blind I had been, how I really wouldn't admit that I had a problem. But I also tried to take away the shame because. If it is an illness, it's not my fault. And I think that comes through when I'm speaking. You know, I'm not ashamed to say I'm an alcoholic. But with people who might be resistant to that word, I'd say I've had severe problems with, you know, severe drinking problems for years. I could not let go of alcohol. <coughs> So until they pop the question, I don't talk about the solution. Not really. If they ask, I might be able to talk about the solution. Very often they don't ask. I remember one of my first 12-step calls and this woman was in the hospital. <coughs> she was an American woman, and I think she had possibly dabbled in AA in the past, but I didn't know that at the beginning. She was there in the hospital, and her ankles were swollen because of drinking and this, that, and everything. She was convinced that she didn't need us. It was very unfortunate. But she was relating. I could see she was relating. I went with a gentleman, and she was relating to our drinking stories, nodding her head. Uh, but she would not ask the question, the question, what do I have to do to get well? <laughs> so I encouraged her to ask the question. <laughs> but she was not interested in uh, joining, the, joining the program. I hope she's still alive. <clears throat> but I have to remember, it's, this isn't really about me. I don't go out to um, help another alcoholic. Not consciously to, to stay sober. You know, I don't get myself into a place where I have to jump on someone to stay sober. Uh, Dr. Bob says in his story, this is, this program is for people who need it and want it. And I was like, I was like, I was that person for five years. I needed it, but I didn't want it yet. And you know, the AAs, they left me alone. In my, in my first couple of years of sobriety, because I had found a group of strong sponsorship, sometimes I complained that no one ever came to the hospital, no one ever phoned me, no, no one really 12-stepped me after a meeting. But, you know, I think they, they could see, they could see that I just wasn't ready. You know, I try not to make that judgment, because I know I'm always... Even though I don't see the immediate re results, it's up to God or that person's higher power, let's say. <laughs> that person's d level of desperation and their higher power. But all I can do is try to plant a seed. Remember, 
a gentleman in Canada three years before I got serious about AA. He planted two seeds. He mentioned this book. I'm going through a line by line. And when I relapsed immediately after that rehab, he said, you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And everybody has a different path. I needed those meetings <laughs> to help me calm down. An hour a day or two hours a day, just like the meditation session we had. To sit there, calm down, learn to listen, get out of my own head. And, you know, identify. It took me that long to really, or half that time to identify. And to become one of you. <laughs> to admit I was one of you. One of us now. One of us. They also give some warnings about what not to do. This tells me exactly what to do and what not to do. It certainly says, uh, if he is not interested, don't pester him. <laughs> don't pester him. And I've probably been guilty of that in the past. Uh, trying to be helpful. My very first friend in France, as I said, uh, she was a drinker. She's still drinking, but she got sober before I did, and not through AA. She got thrown in a psychiatric unit. They gave her a pill. That became her higher power. She stayed sober for about three and a half years. But, uh, and she wouldn't talk to me during most of it because I was still drinking, which is fine. But, uh, I know I did, she did see a change in me. She was interested in AA. She did come to a few meetings. Uh, but now every time I go see her, she brings the subject up, but I almost feel like it's something standing in between us, you know, so I, I should introduce her to another AA that, uh, if she really wants help, but I don't think, I, I think she wants to continue on her own way. You know, but if they're sincerely interested, you will know it. <laughs> you will know it. We have a friend, Julie and I. Over in Dallas, he said, "If they if they want this thing, you won't be able to beat them off with a stick. <laughs> and if they don't want it, you won't be able to force me to feed them." He says it in a slightly more uh, aggressive way, but that's okay. Yeah. And here it is about planting the seed on page ninety-six. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. And that's what Bill had to do, if you know Bill's story. He tried for six months before he was presented with an opportunity to talk to Bob. So, it says, you are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. And I can't judge that lo level of desperation from the outside or what they look like, you know, because the desperation, to me, it's inside. It's inside. I think... Somebody mentioned yesterday, you know, all those bottoms, those bottoms. I bumped along the bottom, but I never surrendered. And uh, it was only until I surrendered that I got that level of desperation that they're talking about in here. But I can't judge that from the inside. I'm not super sensitive. Yeah. And then it tells us what to do with the second visit. You know, but this is this is always good to um, talk with, talk over with your sponsor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And of course, according to this book, very often if you close up someone and they come back, come come with you right away, or come back to you later, they'll often end up. Uh, taking them through the set. And that's not such a scary prospect, you know, because you just completed them. Especially if you start reaching out the hand of that AA as soon as you, as soon as you've had your, uh, your wake up, your spiritual awakening. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Yeah, it's fresh in your mind. You can take these people. And you know, I've worked with people who are a lot quicker at getting this than I ever was. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic. But the main thing is, it gets me out of me, and, uh, all right, I'm going back to the first years, too. As I said, my brain was in a fog. But going through these steps every time with someone else, I learn something new. We learn together. We may learn different things, but I always learn something new. So I would encourage you to engage in this work, because as it says at the beginning of Chapter 7, it says nothing. Will so much ensure immunity from drinking as working with another alcoholic. I mean, wouldn't you like immunity from drinking? Immunity, immunity from relapse? That's what I wanted. I actually only wanted two things when I got to AA. Was serenity. I wanted the noise to stop in my head. Serenity, peace, and not to not to have to drink again. Those are the only two things I want, and that's that's about it. Um, that's what I received. Maybe I should start setting my sights a little higher. Uh, but for the moment, that's enough for me. Oh yes, one last thing. It says on page one thirty thirty two. Um, in the family afterwards, it talks about he talks about there's a line in there. We are sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. That's what this program is all about. Because nobody wants to get sober and live a life just as miserable as they lived before. <laughs> you know. We are sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. And so the steps liberate me. I get freedom. I get, I get happiness for almost no reason. But uh, one of my mentors says, you know, the joy comes in helping others. The joy comes in caring others. Joy comes when we see someone else wake up and the light go on in their eyes. And it's very true. It's very true. You know, and having been a very selfish person all of my life, I'm just amazed that uh, at the time I I spent in doing this and um, and I enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy. That's the joy. So I'll pass it over to Tim now. My name is Tim. I'm not Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, sometimes old timers are the people I need to listen to the most, and sometimes there are newcomers who I need to listen to. And there's a girl that came to AA a few years ago. And you know the way in some meetings they have uniforms, everyone, you know, all the men wear a tie and all the girls wear a skirt and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Well, this girl would not have fitted in to one of those meetings. She wore a pink velour tracksuit to every meeting for the first three months. I loved her. And... Someone said, and she threw herself into AA, and someone said to her, um, you ought to be careful, you're putting all of your eggs into one basket. Now, she was always ready uh, with a rapid response, and she said, I only have one egg. <laughs> and I think that's very good. You see, my, um, I went to see a psychiatrist, uh, Rather, one of the psychiatrists I went to see um, when I was around 20, she said, describe your, can you describe your friends, your social life? And I said, I have five categories of friends, and I, <laughs> and I had these different compartments, and I genuinely thought I could keep them all separate. And uh, that's not true. There's only, I only have one mind. There's only one me. And as someone uh, I, I heard say a few years ago, he said it in rather a cruder fashion than this, but he said you can't pee on one side of the glass and hope to drink out of the other. And in a lot of my life, I've discovered myself, um, uh, I've discovered um, a nasty taste in my mouth, as it were, <laughs> in one part of my life, and I see no connection 
with other parts of my life. And a funny thing about making amends is that you make amends in one area and other areas clear up and you had no idea there was a connection. When I made all sorts of financial amends that I had missed or brushed under the carpet at around 15 years, weirdly, my earning capacity went up because I, I, I get paid based on how much I produce and I track how much I produce per hour and I, I suddenly started producing 50% more per hour because my brain wasn't clogged up with all sorts of layers of guilt and so on. Um, and my financial problems <laughs> seemed to improve very rapidly. I had the same when I was around 9 or 10 years sober. I left a career that I, I didn't like. It was killing me and was I wasn't very useful in it because it was I was in it for all the wrong reasons and I I had a terrible spending problem. I leave this career and give up and say to a power greater than myself, you do with me what you want to do with me. I'm done. I'm done with my own plan. As soon as that happened, my spending problem disappeared. And I had worked for years on my spending problem, and the problem was something else. Um, and it's been like that with pretty much everything. Now, what this has to do with step 12 is... If I'm obsessed with work and how much I'm earning and how much I'm producing and what my clients think about me, then you'd think you have to work on that. And what my sponsor would suggest is go and find another alcoholic to work with, go and do some service. And it appears to me that he's not listening. He's not understanding what I'm saying. Uh, but then I go and do it. And I just, I go back to my job and suddenly it seems a joy. And it, I, it, I feel carefree in it and I'm just sort of getting on with it and enjoying it and I can't understand why I was so obsessed and weighed down with it a day earlier. So this is this idea of having one egg or there's only one glass of water. What I pour in one side, I will taste on the other side. And <clears throat> the reason this is so difficult to get one's head around initially in AA I think, is that what operates, what runs the spiritual world, all the rules that run the spiritual world, are opposite than the rules which run the material world. So when something is empty in the material world, you need to pour something into it for it to be full. If something is empty spiritually, and I am empty spiritually, I need to pour something out. I need to pour all the rubbish out first. <laughs> there is no room for anything. Uh, until the rubbish is poured out. And the more rubbish you pour out, the less empty you feel, which is a very peculiar observation. And then I need to carry on giving. Now, this is not a, a, a recipe for... It's not a charter for neglecting uh, the basics of one's life. So I still need to, obviously, look after myself and sleep and eat and... <laughs> Uh, make sure that, I, that I'm, I'm looked after spiritually as well. But there's a wonderful line where it says, much of our free time must be spent uh, engaged in the sort of work we're going to describe. It's around page um, um, 19, I think, of the big book. And my job when I'm asked for help or I observe an opportunity for service, because often that's the way, you will notice, you'll be sitting in AA and you'll notice that something needs doing. And they will, you look round and everyone's looking the other way. Everyone's pretending it's not there. And, ever, and everyone's waiting for someone else to do it. And as soon as you notice it, you're stuffed. You have, you have, you have, if you notice it, you have to go and do it. And my job is not to say no. Again, this sounds like it's going to be a charter for self-sacrifice to the point of suicide but it's not because what I what I say yes to is engaging with the matter that needs addressing sometimes the way I engage with it is to uh, find other people to help with the service sometimes people come to me and I've got sponsees that don't have any sponsees themselves and I will point people in the direction of, of those sponsees so the point of saying yes to service, yes to opportunities, is not for me to grab everything from myself, but to make sure that the common welfare is looked after there in my group and in, the, in my sort of AA family. But also, one thing that I've observed is that whenever I'm given the opportunity to say yes to some form of service, 
There's a little voice that says, but there's no time. Your time is already taken up. Your schedule is already full. How is this going to work? What I've discovered is if I do it on God's strength rather than my own strength, amazingly, the schedule seems to look after itself. When I'm tired after doing service, um, when I feel drained, when I feel drained after spending time with sponsees, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I'm trying to do it on my own strength. I'm seeing myself as the source. I'm just the channel. Now, alcoholics are very sticky people. They will stick to you. I would, I would, I would stick to other people. I was sort of vampiric when I was new. I would suck the energy out of people, cast them aside, and go on to the next one. And part of learning how to sponsor is learning how to be effective without getting entangled. And the first thing I have to remember is, um, uh, I'm not the food, I'm the dinner lady. So I, I get, I've got my tray of mashed potatoes and I get a scoop and plonk it on your plate. Now, when people are new in AA, or even sometimes people who've been around a while and are in great spiritual need, they will mistake you for the food or they'll mistake you for the sauce. And this is, uh, this is very dangerous. Now, sometimes um, you can work with people on this. But sometimes you have to let them go and let them find someone in AA who they find boring and tiresome to take through the steps because they've developed a problem with you in that they think that you are the source of something, they think you're special in some way. And this will happen uh, not because you are special, but because I, I would do this with people. I saw people as delivery systems for love and respect and support and validation. And I did the same when I got to AA. You, uh, if, if you said something which made me feel better, suddenly you were on a pedestal and I, need, I needed to own you. I needed to make sure that you were always going to be there. And my job as a sponsor is to make sure that people's reliance is on the fellowship, as a, on God acting through the fellowship as a whole. And Maureen, who I quote a lot, she said that she wouldn't sponsor anyone unless they are talking to two other people with more than 10 years sobriety on a daily basis. If you're not doing that, I won't talk to you, she'd say. Which is absolutely right. Because it stops me, that would stop me becoming dependent on any one person. I need to make sure that no one becomes dependent on me. Uh, my friend Tom says the best thing he does for his sponsees is go away a lot. <laughs> And I think this is right. My job is to give people tools not to be a source of anything. Um, what else do I have to say? Uh, practicing these principles in all our affairs. The steps are wonderful. They really are. But if I'm going to live with other people in AA, I need the traditions. If I'm going to function in a group, I need the traditions. And how I've learned to function in the outside world is to use the traditions in all of my relationships. And in particular, you know, my relationship with my partner, my relationship with, with colleagues. And there's a wonderful passage here which really uh, gets echoed in the traditions. Uh, it's on page 117. And the two chapters which get, uh, two of the chapters which get ignored the most are, are the chapter to wives and the family afterward. And the chapter to wives, I, I think, is absolute gold dust. And page 117. Some of the snags you will encounter are irritation, hurt feelings, and resentments. Your husband will sometimes be unreasonable and you will want to criticize. Have you ever wanted to criticize? Have you ever observed someone doing something wrong? Um, for instance, they're not doing the washing up the way I was taught to do the washing up. They're not tidying in a logical fashion. They're, why are you so late for everything? I'm never late for anything. Starting from a speck on the domestic horizon, great thunderclouds of dispute may gather. These family dissensions are very dangerous, especially to a husband. Often you must carry the burden of avoiding them or keeping them under control. Never forget that resentment is a deadly hazard to an alcoholic. We, we do not mean that you have to agree, agree with your husband whenever there is an honest difference of opinion. Just be careful not to 
uh, disagree in a resentful or critical spirit. And what I've been taught to do, if I observe something in my relationship with my other half, where things that I, I, I believe something is going wrong, if I feel any kind of animus against him, if I feel any kind of resentment, if it's burning inside me, I'm not allowed to say anything. I have to wait till I'm at peace. Then I might be allowed to say something, but the funny thing is as soon as you're at peace, you're like, what would be the point? Um, I've been in a position in a relationship where I was 100% convinced I was with the wrong person because I wasn't being made to feel special enough. Basically, that was the problem. And I was convinced someone else would be right for me. And I went to my sponsor and I said, look, that I, the relationship has been dead for years. I've only just really realized it at gut level and I'm sure this is the right thing and I know God is leading me towards something new and I feel this great sense of hope I have no plans for the future I just I see this this blank sheet of paper on which God is going to write my future I've dropped my own plans and I've seen through I stayed in this relationship out of fear and luckily I had a sponsor who knew me very well and he suggested something very simple he said you seem a little troubled by this whole situation. It seems very rash. This has come up very quickly. Why don't you give it a year? Give it a year. And again, wait till you're at a point of peace with the other person. And then you can make a decision. Whilst you still have some resentment, some criticism in your mind, whilst you're still blaming the other person for how you feel in this relationship, you won't necessarily be making the right decision. You may be right, who knows? And he was being a little disingenuous there. He knew there was something up. And over the coming year, I, I, I gave it a go. He'd never been wrong on anything else before. Uh, footnote, sometimes they are wrong. My sponsor happens not to be. Um, I gave it a year, and over the course of the year, I looked back with horror at the point I'd got to at how I had built a case against the other person. When I achieved a position of peace, I realized the wealth of what I was being given in this relationship. I was utterly blinded to it by my own wall of fear and resentment and bitterness and greed. With this criticism business, um, I know it's, it's a banal example, but it's... Lots of my examples are banal, so why stop now? Um, I was doing the washing up very loudly. You know when you do the washing up loudly, just to indicate to the other person it wasn't actually your turn, it was their turn? Now, my other half is, is very sound spiritually. He doesn't say, he says he doesn't believe in God, he's in recovery, blah, blah, blah. But he's <laughs> light years ahead of me spiritually. He didn't respond to the loud washing up. He knew it was going on, but he didn't respond. He didn't react to it. And I noticed that he wasn't reacting, so I thought, I need to escalate. <laughs> We're taking it to DEFCON 2. So I said something to the effect of, it's always me that does the washing up. It wouldn't hurt if you did it once a month. And he left the room. And when he leaves the room without saying anything in a situation like that, I know I'm in deep, deep trouble. And immediately, have you ever immediately regretted something? I immediately regretted what I'd said. And he left the room and he came back in around 10 minutes later. Again, without an Al-Anon program, he knew to respond, not to react. He didn't say the first 87 things that came into his mind. He rejected all of those and waited. And he came back in and he said two things. The first thing he said was, I have never criticized you. And I looked back and I thought, you know what, that's right. We've been together for years. And he'd never criticized me. He'd accepted everything at face time. And the second thing he said to Kenneth, he said, I could make a list too. <laughs> so he'd observed everything. But, decide, but made a policy decision not to pick me up on anything. 
And then he left the room again. And he also made the decision that he was going to spend some time on his own. He wasn't going to talk to me for a few few hours. He was done for a while. And I said, are you angry with me? And he said, no, I'm just reading. Um, I learned a lot from that. Um, there's a line on the next page. It says, patience, tolerance, understanding, and love are the watchword. Show him these things in yourself, and they will be reflected back to you from him. Live and let live is the rule. If you both show a willingness to remedy your own defects, there will be little need to criticize each other. And in Tradition 10, I'm told to have no opinion on outside issues, and an outside issue is what you do, how you live your life, your internal world. That whole area is an outside issue to me. If you invite me in, it becomes my issue. If you don't, it, it's not. And Tradition 1, unity. If I'm going to remain unified in a relationship with someone else, that I'm, the blocks must be removed from inside me. And I've spent a lot of my life trying to make dysfunctional relationships functional. And what I've learned is that although I can transact with people that aren't very healthy, um, I can have formal relationships or formal interactions which are possible. Unity is not possible with someone beyond a particular point of unhealthiness. Uh, but what I've discovered, both... Jonathan and I have the skill of observing how we affect the other person. So this is tradition for we're autonomous, except in as far as we affect other groups or AI as a whole. I can do what I want, except in as far as it affects him. Then I have to consider the impact it has on him. And if I'm observing that and adjusting accordingly, and he is observing how he is affecting me and adjusting accordingly, as it says, there is no need to criticize if someone doesn't have that skill, criticizing won't help. It will make the barrier stronger. And life has become a lot easier for me since I decided to uh, go with the people who are already there, go to build relationships with people who have already developed the skill of having relationships. Um, it means my life, in, in some ways, there are fewer people in my life than there otherwise would be. Um, in terms of very close relationships, but it means that my energy isn't being spent on relationships which don't work, and my energy can then be spent on trying to carry this message to others, to be able to show other people what works in my life, and I can be much more useful that way than trying to shape people into it. Um, and just one last thing, show him these things in yourself and they will be reflected back to you from him. I spent a lot of my life trying to change people by pointing it out one more time. And the only way change ever happens in people around me is if I demonstrate myself, if I become that uh, corny old line of, of, of be the change you want to see. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I can be at peace now. That's what I've got. That's <laughs> Okay, thank you both Laura and Tim. Thank you very much. We've got a 10 minute coffee break now. 15 minutes maybe. No, 10 minutes, that's enough. And we come back for the Ask It Basket. Hi everybody, welcome back. And um, the last session for the day, except for dinner and drawing the lottery, is Laura's story. Um, yeah, I've known Laura for years actually, but I've never heard her story. I think she's heard mine, so that's good. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful she came up to be with us. It's awesome. So I pass you over to Laura. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name's Laura, and I am an alcoholic. I'm fully conceited. And thank you for inviting me here, Julia, and the committee. And especially thank you for all your hard work in putting this event on. Because I know it's hard work, but, you know, hard work and commitment yeah, helps keep us sober. Yeah, give yourself a hand. <laughs> Today has been great, and I'm looking forward to more tom tomorrow. So, yeah, the first time I introduced myself, I said I'm a real alcoholic. And some people in AA get their backs up when I say that. But I just use the term as it's used in the big book. You know, I have an allergy to alcohol, but... I started drinking as an experiment. 
Oh, maybe even before that. I, can't, I come from an alcoholic family. My father got sober in AA, and he died sober. I don't know if he ever really found recovery, but that's none of my business. <laughs> um, in my opinion, my mother is an alcohol-dependent Al-Anon. <laughs> Uh, that's none of my business either. Um, my one brother got sober in AA. He was in his early 20s. Well, he got sober in rehab and then did AA for two years. Stayed sober for eight years, then decided he could drink like a normal person. And he spent about 25, 30 years trying to, on page 30, trying to prove he could drink like a normal person. But me, my story starts with before my first drink, but with my first drink. And for some reason, the kids at high school were starting to drink, the older ones. I'm the eldest in my family, so I didn't have any any older siblings, but a lot of my friends did. And one of them got this great idea that her brother was going to buy three of us a six-pack of beer to share. And I guess we knew it was wrong because we decided to do this experiment at night in a cemetery where no one would find us. <laughs> so, but we didn't have anywhere to drink anyway. And I went into that experiment. I really wasn't too sure. I hadn't seen, like I said, my parents were drinkers, but I had never really seen either of them get out of control. To me, it was a thing from a child's eyes. That's what adults did. They went to work or they did their work at home during the day and in the evening before the meal, they had a drink or maybe two. And nothing ever really got out of hand in our house, except it was full of tension and a anger. But I was totally unaware of that because that was the normal situation, tension and anger. But my first, back to my first drink in the cemetery in a small town near Niagara Falls in Canada. And uh, I was with my best friend and this other girl in our class, and we had this illegal, we were underage, you know, and I was very conscious of that. And I was quite apprehensive of what, you know, drinking this stuff was going to do. It was only beer, but. So I was of two minds about it. The beer was warm, it wasn't cold, it wasn't pleasant, it didn't, it didn't smell nice. <laughs> But I drank it dutifully, you know, and halfway through that first beer, my world changed. <laughs> you know, I started to smile for no reason. You know, I started to feel more uncom uh, less uncomfortable about the whole experiment. I, I, you know, I got giggly, of course, but the whole world changed. You know, and they say in recovery we have to get a new pair of glasses. Well, when I took that drink, <sighs> you know, I had no idea I was uptight. I didn't know, I don't know if I even knew the word at that time, but I was with my own friends, and yet I was on such an edge. And after that first beer, the, the evening went a lot better. We only each had two, you know, but so I, I couldn't, you know, I didn't drink to blackout or anything like that the first time. But it changed my life. Because after that, every time we got an opportunity to have someone's older brother pro procure a bit of beer or whatever for us, I was there. I was there. <laughs> you know, and in the beginning, it's a progressive illness. It was once a month, perhaps, for the school dance. And I can't believe now when I look back that I did this show up to do coat check. I was in the school band. I was a good student. I thought I was trying to be a good person, you know, do all the right things. And I was in the school band, so we used to do the coat check to raise money for the uniforms and the instruments and things like this. And I would show up, you know, drunk to work on the coat check. And maybe it was because I was a good student, but no teachers ever called me out. You know, no teachers. I wasn't falling over drunk, but, you know, you can tell when, when someone's like, super smiley the whole evening when they're kind of usually kind of a serious bookworm <laughs> during the day. So yeah, alcohol changed the way I thought and felt 
you know, and uh, I don't know, it was a completely Dr. M. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at that time, but I felt I, I could be uh, more sociable with other people because I was fairly shy. I had a hard time speaking with other people. You know, I felt I could dance. Of course, I was in that teenage adolescent thing where I thought all eyes were on alcoholic. All eyes were on me. All eyes were on Laura, <laughs> you know. I didn't realize that everyone else was too busy thinking about themselves to worry about Laura. But So my egocentrism was there from the very start. And um, so I progressed through high school, did well. Of course, university was definitely on the cards, so I went to university in Toronto. Funny thing happened there. Um, I got more serious, and... I lived in residence the first year, so there wasn't too much drinking going on. Uh, just enough to get through, I guess. But uh, the summer I came home, I guess all this pent up not drinking, <laughs> you know, a pen no, the first thing that happened was we had our first set of exams at Christmas time, first year of university, so I'm 19 years old or 18. Right, and I, I'd been drinking for a couple of years, but not like I didn't think I was an alcoholic. And just prior to exams, I started getting these real pains in my stomach, and I didn't know what they were. And I, I thought I could fix it myself. Now, not by drinking, but I, ne I never thought of going to the student health service. I thought I could fix it myself. And I had all kinds of weird ideas, you know. I, I thought I could fix it with warm, comfort, hot food. I didn't know I had a bad case of nervous indigestion, like acid stomach and a couple of Tums and Rolaids and fix it. And I was drinking coffee, you know, because I felt cold and lots of uh, Italian dishes, you know, spaghetti and meatballs and veal parmesan, you know, with a cooked tomato, so it just made it worse. Anyway, I got through the exams, went home for Christmas, went to the family doctor, who uh, turned out was an alcoholic drug addict, gambling addict, was stealing from the government and uh, eventually shot himself in the head. Sad story. But he was one of us. I went to him and he said, well, I can give you this prescription for Valium or I can, you can go out and buy a packet of these, these stomach tablets, you know, these stomach Rolaids, antacid candies. And when he f showed me that prescription, it just scared me. It just scared me. And I said, no thanks, you know. But uh, whether he knew I was an alcoholic or not, I don't know. But, yeah, the, the result of that first year of not drinking enough, not drinking, you know, I was a nervous wreck by, by December. And then the following year I ran into some people who preferred to smoke marijuana than drink. So that's what I did pretty much for the next three years. And I didn't realize I was actually tr treating my internal discomfort which is alcoholism, with the marijuana instead of the alcohol. Anyway, fast forward, I moved to the west of Canada for my first job. I lost my contacts um, for buying dope. I didn't really like dope as much as alcohol anyway. It didn't do the same thing for me. You know, sometimes it made me paranoid, but alcohol, I knew exactly what it would do for me. And it made me right inside. It made me right you know, it took away the fear, it took away the shyness, gave me courage. I had a lot of fun with alcohol, and slowly but surely it became my best friend. And uh, so when I started working, <clears throat> I got a flat, uh, I rented an apartment, and within two months I was feeling really lonely. <laughs> so I got a dog, which helped a bit, but... Also within two months, I was drinking every night because I thought that's what grown-ups did <laughs> because that's what I had grown up with, you know. And uh, I didn't get in trouble. I guess I was young. I bounced back, you know. An alcoholic like me, I think, with my drinking, I, either I already had it or I developed a large tolerance for alcohol, you know. And uh, somehow I made it through that first job. Then I met a man, 
And I did a very alcoholic thing, you know. I was kind of off to a good start in this career. Um, but I had only done two years in the first company and got my professional certification. Which you needed two years of work after the degree to get a professional certification. And I quit my job for a guy. <laughs> and... uh I think that was a pretty spur-of-the-moment alcoholic decision, you know. I didn't even discuss it with him first. You know, I just decided I was going to quit my job. There was a recession coming. Someone had sort of promised me an interview for another job, but, you know, in my head, I had it in the bag, and and uh, I would get a job down there. So I just phoned him and said I was coming. Anyway, we ended up getting married a couple of years later. But slowly, you know... My drinking was progressing. Um, he had a lot of friends in that town. That was in Calgary, Alberta. And it was, you know, sort of boom days, kind of like Bill Wilson and Wall Street. Boom days for the oil industry and a lot of partying. And, you know, I fit in with other people who drank, you know. So I didn't think my drinking was any different. And I hadn't remembered that in the last year of university, when the first time I ever lived alone without roommates, I found myself drinking alone at home. So I wasn't a social drinker already at, at about age 22, age 23. But I had no idea. You know, even though my father had, was probably in AA by then, he never spoke of it. He never spoke of it. And then, be that as me, I don't have a resentment against that, about that at all, at all. And in fact, so by the time I was 25, I had read the big book. I think, I believe on a visit home, it was my father's big book. But as I said earlier, I was reading it about them, a story about them, those people. And that big book did wonders for me because it took away any shame I might have had about my father being a sick person. It gave me a lot of hope that, you know, he would find a way out. But, of course, I read it as a story. It was about them. I never applied anything in there to my own drinking. And yet, I had already had blackouts. I had a gift for drinking at exactly the wrong moment, in addition to all the other moments. <laughs> but exactly the wrong moment. I said... You know, when I was 17, I was in the second last year of high school. I was in two classes that were a year ahead of the normal. And the English class, we went to, we were bused to a, a theater in a place in Ontario <laughs> named after the original called Stratford upon Avon. And we went to the Shakespearean Theater and we watched Othello for the afternoon. I'm with these older kids that I don't really know because I'm a shy person. I, you know. And after this long excruciating, which I quite enjoyed, the, the play, we had half an hour to go grab something to eat, you know? I don't know, but the prettiest girl in, in the school, <laughs> by reputation, asked me if I wanted to go for a beer and a hot dog at the local hotel. Uh, there are any Canadians here, you know what a hotel is, but... Anyway, hot dog, hot dog. And I thought I was really going for a, you know, a hot dog. And at that time, they served little five-ounce beer, five-ounce draft. And I thought, well, and, and so you ordered them in two, so I already knew that. So two, and then two, and then two. And I don't know. I don't know how many pairs of beer. We had half an hour to get food and get back on the bus. I sort of had a brownout. I knew we were late. I knew I'd had too much to drink. We got on the bus. I knew I got sick on this school bus. Amongst my, you know, my class, classmates, my teachers. When I felt myself getting sick, I kind of tried to do it in my handbag. All the way home, all I could smell was the smell. But no one said a thing. No one said a thing, least of all me. I mean, I didn't go back the next day and say, sorry, everybody. No amends there, but all I could think of was someone would tell my parents, someone, and nothing ever happened. 
You know, nothing ever happened, but that haunted me for a long time. That was standing. The, next, the first summer after university, I came home, and that was the first time I tried to control my drinking. I found out that I found that I was coming home. If I wasn't blacked out, you know, the ceiling was spinning, as you know how it goes. I decided to. T- I decided I was drinking too much beer because it was so hot. It was summer, right? You know, the rationalization was there. You know, I didn't really have any moral judgment about my drinking. But I did that time think about it, and it was so hot. I was drinking too much beer, so I had got this great idea how to control my beer or my drinking beer. I decided I would go to these parties with a bottle of tequila and the salt and the lemon and the little shot glass to measure it and drink water in between the tequilas and pace myself that way. Well, needless to say, like, it didn't work. It didn't work. But already I was thinking about how to control it. And uh, on and off through the years, um, I was thrilled. So I got married in about 19, at the end of 1983, and right away we moved to the UK for work. And we ended up in London, and of course I was alone and no friends. Well, I had this husband, but he got work right away, and I didn't. Um, I loved uh, I loved London because there were pubs everywhere. Not that I spent a lot of time in them, but when I started to work, I found out that first I worked in an American company, so there wasn't a problem. Then I got into a British company. Um, with some oil people uh, right right near Oxford Circus. And what would some of them do at lunchtime? They'd go to the pub. And I thought this is a fantastic idea. Now, I didn't normally do it during the week except Friday. But then Christmas time would roll around, and Christmas in that office started around mid-November. It was crazy. We were crazy. I don't know how they didn't fire us. But I understand that the owners of that company were pretty big drinkers, too. But it was nuts, you know. And, uh, you know, I didn't really choose alcohol. Alcohol chose me, you know. But uh, we spent about a few years in the U.K., like four years, and then my husband got itchy feet. We did a few geographics back and forth between the U.K., Australia, Canada, but it was never my decision. I was kind of a follower but I was happy wherever, you know, if I could drink when I got there, I would be happy. Um, nobody ever really told me that maybe I was drinking too much for a very long time, and yet they could have, you know, even in high school. And thinking, I got the name Laura Lush. <laughs> which is kind of yeah, not very nice, but I think that's because I must have had a few blackouts already, you know. I was aware that I'd had blackouts once or twice, but would I ask anybody, would I admit to anybody that I couldn't remember what happened the night before? No, i just fake it and laugh along with them. I never asked. I never asked, do you get drunk when you drink <laughs> That happens to me all the time. No, no, no. I just withdrew, withdrew into myself, but not really asking the hard questions. I didn't, I didn't know what to ask. Um, so then, do, 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 we moved back to Canada. This time to Vancouver, and I ended up doing this. Master's of Business Administration degree. This was not my idea. The idea was my husband missed Canada. He wanted to go back. Okay, dear, we'll go back. Um, He said, I think it's a good idea if we both do our MBAs. Okay, dear, we'll both do our MBAs. The thing is, he didn't get accepted. But in the move, he had a great idea. He wanted to take me to visit Africa. He said, we're quitting our jobs. We're moving back. Let's take three months off and go across Africa. And uh, we both wrote journals, you know, like we thought backpackers were supposed to do. We went across from west to east, backpacking. And uh, I found his journal some years later. And he's, it's, uh, most of it is written uh, 
Most of it, most of his entries were when he was upset with me because I was hot and cold and up and down, you know, because for a lot of that journey, and it was three months long, there just wasn't enough booze and there wasn't enough cigarettes either. You know, I mean, I love being there. I love the people, but internally there was something wrong, especially when we were amongst other, uh, other tourists. But I know now it was, you know, untreated alcoholism. I was on holiday and yet I couldn't party. You know, to me being on holiday was equivalent to party and party was equivalent to alcohol. So, you know, there was no, I mean, we spent two, three weeks on this collection of barges going up the Congo River, which is called the Zaire River at that time. And, uh, there wasn't any booze. Uh, we were in first class, which didn't mean much, but, you know, it was livable and there was food prepared for us. But it was very basic, which I didn't mind, but there was no wine. There was no beer. There was nothing except water to drink. But I quickly found that if I went down to third class or second class, it was basically a, a merchant, a merchant barge floating up and down the river. It was a trading center, you know? But they had a bar and a disco way down in the depths of this thing, unbearably hot. But I would generally find my way down there a couple times a week just to get through that trip, you know? They talk about us going sordid places. I don't know if it was sordid, but had I been, not been an alcoholic, I probably not, would have not found myself down there. But uh, we got to Vancouver. I did my MBA. Uh, I wasn't so serious about my studies by then, and I was drinking. Well, the other thing happened. My husband couldn't find work there, so he found work in Australia or New Zealand or wherever which is okay, I thought it was pretty cool at that, but with that, but I did find myself trying to do my studies with a bottle of wine by my side. Already, you know, I'm under 30. I, could, I should have been an Alcoholics Anonymous back then. And then I got sober for a little while when I found out I was pregnant. And it wasn't by trying. I knew, I knew that, I knew that, you know, you're not supposed to drink when you're carrying a child. I think it was a God job. I didn't even have to try to not drink. I did the, I did, uh, not too hard anyway. I think it was either hormones or God. But I do remember, um, in the hot summer, I did get an idea that maybe I'd like to try a non-alcoholic beer or something. I don't know if it's non-alcoholic or low alcoholic. And this is the story of my life, except for those couple of times with the drink in high school. Every time I do something that, that, you know, God doesn't want, I get caught. So I'm sitting on my front stoop way out, stoop, way out in the country, uh, drinking this non-alcoholic beer on a hot summer's day, and one of my husband's best friends, well, she was a friend of mine, one of my friends who, uh, da, 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 she had just had her first baby, came along for a visit. And the very, that very night, I, I was, it was reported to me that I was caught drinking beer, <laughs> you know. So that stopped that. But I didn't like it anyway because I didn't get, I couldn't get a buzz off it, you know. It just gave me a headache. So that was the only time that God helped me get sober. And little by slowly, I went back to the drink. And... When she was about two, we moved to Scotland, and then eventually London, and then eventually down to France, and all the way through my drinking was progressing. Already in Scotland, you know, within a year, I found another alcoholic mother <laughs> at the mothers and toddlers, you know, who would drink sometimes in the... She didn't look alcoholic, but she would drink sometimes in the afternoon, and that was okay with me. I remember uh, a couple... You know, once or twice having a, you know, some afternoons in the back garden where it was definitely out of control. Um, I don't know why anyone didn't report me, but they didn't. You know, people around us, they just kind of live with us and hope that maybe something happens, you know. And very often, I mean, my husband knew nothing about alcoholism, although I believe there was some in his part of his family, but uh, he didn't know anything, and he was very patient. And I think he hoped, just 
lived in hope that the bad stuff would stop happen, stop, stop happening. So from Aberdeen, we went to London. My drinking got, yeah, I, I almost not, even, yeah, kind of immediately I found an alcoholic family. Heather went to nursery, and there was this, the dad was bringing the children to nursery school. And I knew there was something wrong. I thought they were just social cases, but then I found out they drank. But they were just those chronic types. And I couldn't see it because of my own drinking. They were just chronic types. And uh, I thought, you know, they had this story about themselves and how they had lost their business and all the poor me, and they were victims of circumstance. But I tried to be non-judgmental, and I tried to help them out, and I tried to invite their little girls when Heather and I would go swimming or whatever activities, because obviously they didn't have the luxury of this. I even took the gentleman shopping, and I should have known then, not that it would have made a difference. I used to take him shopping to the discount supermarket because he need, didn't have a car. And me, the Good Samaritan, I'm not trying to paint myself as a saint. But this was, you know, full-blown alcoholism right in front of my eyes, and I didn't even recognize it, you know. But that's uh, what have you. So then we moved down to... I was already in trouble in in, in London. Um, one day I got a call from a friend of mine who I'd gone to high school with, and she had heard through the grapevine that I was in living in that part of London. And then she told me she was living just up the road. And it was even weirder because we went to high school together in Canada, but she was from Australia. And she had gone back to Australia. And here we were in the same neck of the woods of London. So it was great to catch up with her and, you know, have a girlfriend and da-da-da. Um, but I know that when she would come over, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be nipping extra, extra in the kitchen. You know, I'd have my own stash in the kitchen. And I remember she caught me once, but she didn't say a word. I knew she had caught, seen me, you know, a few extra swigs from the bottle when I went to refill the glasses, and she never said a word. So that's not her fault. I mean, what do you say? What would, you know, what would you say? So, and I was already hiding bottles in London. This is prior to 1998. I remember what, uh, the plumber had to come and look at the boiler once, and he found a few hidden there. I thought I would have been very careful to get rid of the bottles, the empties. And he just looked at me. I, 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 I played innocent. You know, and then I moved to France, and things just, you know, steadily got worse. I mean, steadily got worse. I've been out of, out of control for a long time. And I cannot tell you where I crossed the line because, well, first of all, as I've said earlier, I always overdrink. And that's because I'm allergic to alcohol. Uh, but I also had a very high tolerance for it. And I moved to France, 1998, already in a lot of trouble. Some things happened in the first six months that you would have thought would have made me wake up, but not really. My husband would go on business trips and uh, forget his house keys and try to wake me up. But I was, you know, it was in that drunken sleep that nothing could wake me up. Which is a scary thing when you got a seven year old that could possibly just walk out the front door or whatever, but that didn't wake me up, didn't wake him up. And things got steadily worse and worse. And I suppose the first time, uh, oh, the very first friend I made in France was an alcoholic too. <laughs> My daughter came home raving about some kid in her class that did these great cartwheels. She thought he was a boy, but he was a girl. And it turns out they lived two doors down. So I introduced to my, myself to this person because it was a classmate of Heather's. And, you know, we'd go and collect the kids from school at 4.30 and give the kids their snack, and we'd start drinking. You know, we had a lot of fun. But it's not really the way, you know, the ideal mother behaves. And uh, after a couple of years of that, I had actually moved to a different vi village, so by then I was drinking alone, but the other mothers could see. The other mothers could see. And uh, 
Heather had befriended this newcomer to her class, and that mother was rather, I don't know, aware or whatever. And she eventually, she knew I had a drinking problem. She eventually reported me to the school. I got fo followed by the social assistance, which made me more afraid. <laughs> uh, the social assistants that were working with me, supposedly, they didn't really have any solution. They didn't know anything about alcoholism. It was basically, you know you have to stop drinking. And at the same time, same time, yeah, the social assistants were there. I was so afraid of them, I had to have a drink before they came. They had prearranged with the doctor to come and visit. And they basically sent me to the, uh, they were going to send me to alcohol detox that day, but there was no room until the following day, so I had to pa pass this night in this uh, high-security psych ward at the adult emergency hospital. And they had, after me, they wheeled in a patient who was handcuffed to the stretcher, which should have scared me. All I could think about was me and what a rough time I was having and how I had promised I would go into the other place the next day, you know. Poor me, poor me, poor me. So I was angry, and uh, I went in to get dried out for seven days, and nothing happened apart from the, the staff psychologist came around and asked me if I was feeling better, at, you know, progressively every day. Are you feeling better now? Are you feeling better now? You know, and uh, so there was no recovery in there. And as soon as I got out, because I was so angry that I'd been, you know, wasn't allowed to go in on my terms, I drank again. And that started the round of sanitariums and hospitals, like Dr. Bob and Bill talk about, you know. And uh, in the end, I went to nine of those things. I started around year 2000. Actually, after that first one, I, I'm not sure. I got out on a Friday, went in on a Thursday, got out on a Friday. I don't know if I drank on a Saturday, but Sunday night probably I had one or two, and I had to meet with a social assistant on Monday. And, of course, I was so afraid of them, I had to have a glass of wine with my lunch at home. Well, I think I probably finished off about two bottles because after the car accident... The, the reading of my blood was pretty high, pretty high. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, I was not hurt in this accident. There was no one else on the road. The car was totaled. The king tugged me, cleaned up the mess, but no one else was hurt. No one was in the car with me. It was so fantastic. I spent a, a, what seemed like an interminable amount of time at the hospital waiting for someone to check me over. And... Uh, I just got fed up waiting, and I knew I had to get my, I had to collect my daughter from school, so somehow I got myself out of there, got into a taxi. I actually looked a mess because I did have some, a bottle of tomato juice in the car to mask the, the smell of the alcohol on my breath, right? And that had smashed in the ac accident. I was, it was summer, I was wearing white, white trousers. And so I had this tomato juice all the way down my leg. And I left the hospital with my belongings in that hospital bag that you have. But I got home and I kept drinking. And, and uh, let me see. The year 2002, I spent three times one month in a hospital facility trying to dry out. Trying to dry out, trying to dry out. I thought I wanted to quit drinking. Three times, a quarter of a whole year. You know, February, August, November. And after that, it was like before and after. I spent about three, four consecutive Novembers in the Monaco Hospital trying to stop drinking. But I don't think, and I had start, I had, my first AA meeting was around the beginning of year 2000. It's kind of very foggy, obviously. But I only went there because um, my husband was nagging me, and I thought if I went to AA meetings, I'd learn how to control my drinking. How, you know, my brain knew that if you, you know, AA is about stopping drinking, but my alcoholic mind told me, well, actually someone said it last night, get sober and still continue to drink. You know, that was my plan. How insane is that, you know, but I just didn't know. I, 
I had no other way to live. You know, I was going to start this off with a reading, but as I couldn't, I didn't ask anyone to do it. But there's that, there's that uh, paragraph in the doctor's opinion, you know, where our alcoholic life becomes the only normal one. And to me, that means just my drinking life. I could not see a life without drinking. I could, and why should I be able to imagine it? You know, I've been drinking already for, well, 27 years. That's when I started trying to stop. And of course, I had all these preconceived notions about AA. All these happy, clean, you know, well, people with well-being. I thought you all walked into AA looking just like you do today. <laughs> all right? I thought it had been easy for you, and my case was different. I thought all those things, all those things. And so I kept trying, I, you know, I'd give up trying to stop drinking, and then I'd go back into hospital for a week or a month. What, at one point in there, my family sent me to Canada, aided by someone they hardly knew, but through friends of friends. And this guy had been a drinker and was about three years sober in AA. And he recommended a particular mental health facility. And so my family decided the French didn't know what they were doing and got me over there. And this gentleman in AA, who was a businessman, he actually arranged himself a business trip over to London and then flew down to Nice because he knew that nobody, I wouldn't make it home if I, if I went on my own. But that man planted two seeds. He said, after this treatment, you stay here, you get an apartment, three months, I'll book you. I said, book me? He said, I'll take you through this book, line by line, like the old timers did. And of course, I couldn't do that, because I was a mother, and I had my daughter waiting for me back in France, and I was the only one that could take care of her as well as was necessary. So I stayed sober for dry for two, year, two weeks until my flight. Stayed through the flight, stayed through the, through the train ride back to France, all the way to my house. And then, uh, I don't know, I think my, my husband, well, anyway, he looked at me with disgust. And as soon as he left the room, I shot off to the store and bought a bottle of vodka and started the whole thing rolling again, you know. And of course, this man in Canada, AA man, was quickly informed and asked if I could get back to the rehab center quick as possible, and he checked it out, and they said yes, but I wasn't going to go. And he said, you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You need to go to AA. Well, I didn't, I'd lost my license. I lived out of town. There were no buses, da, 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 da. And, of course, I wrote an email, whiny, I wow, the reason I couldn't go, I couldn't go, no one would take me, no one would come get me, no, 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 no. He'd heard it all before. He sent me one word, capital letters, move. It took me 18 months to make that move. I was such a mess. Nobody wanted to let an apartment to me. My husband was so disgusted, he wasn't going to write it in my behalf. But anyway, eventually I found my way, way to these. And... Uh, yeah, 18, well, I'm not sure if it took me 18 months to move, but it took me 18 months sort of to get to AA and to move and to get to AA. And it, it just happened by chance, kind of. I mean, I knew AA was there, and, and now I was in this city where AA was, but somehow I couldn't get to meetings, really. Or I, I haven't mentioned, every time I went to a meeting before I got sober, well, before I started AA for real, I had always had a drink in me, so obviously I couldn't hear very much. I went in frequently over those five years, and so I did that a little bit when I moved to Nice. But then one day, uh, it wasn't a special day. By then I was living only to drink. There was nothing else in my life. I woke up in the morning, I thought, I have a cup of tea, I couldn't drink coffee anymore by then. Get dressed, get washed, make yourself like kind of presentable and go out and replenish the supply because every night I finished off what I had in the house. I was a daily drinker and I replenished and that was the excessive thinking and I didn't even realize that it was sick. 
But that was that was my life at that point. There was no, nothing else. Uh, I had, there was a man living in my apartment that I met in a detox place, and he had nowhere else to live, and we were ba basically hanging on to each other for dear life, I guess. But, uh, and I was seeing, oh, I forgot to mention, I was seeing a psychiatrist for for a few years by then. Because I thought the psychiatrist could fix me. It wasn't a clear idea, but I thought if I knew why I drank, then, you know, which the psychiatrist was going to tell me, that would fix me. If I knew what my the psychiatrist I chose didn't really know too much about alcoholism, but I think along the way I taught him a lot <laughs> about alcoholism and alcoholism. But uh, on one of those Friday afternoons, I was at the bus stop going to see my psychiatrist, and lo and behold, this Swedish lady that I'd known from AA sh showed was that standing at the bus stop too. And she had come from an AA funeral or whatever, and we sat together on the bus. And we weren't, weren't all that chummy. I felt kind of guilty that I wasn't going to meetings and, I, you know, still obviously not doing too well. And she just, you know, she put her hand on my knee or my hand or whatever, and she said, why don't you come back? We miss you. Simplest 12-step call in the world. <laughs> And I thought, you can't miss me. I always show up drunk, you know, people kind of shy away. And I thought, maybe I will, you know, because the AA meeting was not far from where my psychiatrist was. So I showed up that night. It was a week before Christmas 2004. I didn't go during the Christmas period. I don't know why. We didn't do anything but drink. It wasn't very much fun. But I started again on January 5th because I knew they had a meeting on Wednesday. And that Wednesday, not that it really matters, we weren't in the normal meeting room. We were in the back of the church. Not that it really matters. Um, I don't know what happened to me, but... And it didn't exactly happen that day, but I decided to keep coming back, you know. I decided to keep up coming back. I, maybe it was because there were a lot of newcomers at that time. Or I was awake enough to realize there were other people that were having as hard a time getting sober as me because one of the girls had relapsed over the Christmas holidays going back to Ireland, you know. Previous to that, I thought I had thought you were all sober for like a hundred years. And then it was easy, you know. But something happened this time where we were a bunch of newcomers and I realized I had to do something about my drinking. And uh, since then, like, you know, Tim shared this morning, I finally got the idea that I had to do something. You know, this friend, this friend of mine that reported me to the school some years before, she, she said to me, she watched me bouncing in and out of hospital, she said, you know what your problem is? You haven't invested anything in your recovery. You know, and I knew at the time she was, well, I didn't know at the time she was right, but because I thought we were investing a lot. I was investing a lot of time going to the hospital. But now I know in my head I thought someone else could fix me. And now I know no human power could have fixed me. No human power could have fixed me, but I just stuck. And AA, uh, my alcoholic buddy living in my flat with me, was actually an angel in disguise, you know, just like this woman who was at the bus stop. Even though I tried, you know, I fought tooth and nail to get him out of my apartment, go find your own place, I don't need you here, I need my space to get sober, all this. He was an angel in disguise because... He was verbal. He was an alcoholic, verbally abusive. It was because of him that I got to a meet all the meetings in Nice, twice, you know, twice a day, mostly twice a day. I think it was because of him. Maybe that was God's message to me. But like Tim said this morning, you know, I I start I learned that I had to do what the sober people did, you know, starting with going to meetings, and uh, I started to hear things. And I started to become willing, and I started to understand that I was a lot sicker than I had ever thought. Because for years I thought my only problem, I was a pretty good person, and my only problem was this drinking problem. Until by sitting in those meetings I understood that my problem was between my ears, you know, in this head of mine. And that all the stuff about triggers that they taught me in rehab and all the human power I things I could do to not drink never worked. 
and uh, that the problem really was me. You know, and that that was the dose of I call it humility, but that doesn't sound very humble. But I knew I needed to be in AA. I knew I needed to uh, do what the winners did, and luckily I got led to a big book group who were hard enough on me that I realized I'll just finish with you. They told me two things. They could. T they told me I could die of this illness, drunk or sober. And at that time, we were having, there was a suicide of a person, a woman who was 22 years not drinking, but whatever, for whatever reason was using medication. And that scared me. But they also offered sponsorship. We will take you through the steps. We will take you through the steps. They have to be men so that you can sponsor other women, you know. And a lot of things have happened on my path, but... You know, finally I understood that there was a solid, I need structure, I needed structure. I couldn't just sit in meetings and figure it out myself. I finally realized. I tried to do that for five years and it didn't work. You know, now that I work a program, now that I've been taught to use the steps and teach it to other people, now I can understand the shares in AA. So thank you for being here for me and carrying the message to me. Yeah, wish Thank you all a good evening. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.